Tyler, and assisting her today is Margie Argel and Meredith Thompson. This is a hybrid meeting, and so those of you uh, that are watching uh, via webcast uh, or remotely, you are either watching through our webcast and or on the Zoom platform. If you intend on commenting on any of the items on today's agenda, you need to be on the Zoom platform with us. There are instructions on how to do so at the top of our uh, agenda. If you're having any challenges uh, with that or the web form, uh, please do email our clerk of the board at board dot clerk at waterboards.ca.gov and she can help uh, get you onto the platform. Uh, once you are on the platform, uh, your camera will be off. Uh, you, you will be on mute until it is your opportunity to speak on the item you've indicated to do so. Um, and uh, with that, good morning uh, for those of you who are here with us physically in Sacramento. We're here in the California Environmental Protection Agency building. Uh, quick uh, uh, review of a, a few items. One, please do note uh, the emergency exits of something were to happen and we do have an emergency. We'll calmly file out to Cesar Chavez Plaza and then await further direction there. Uh, additionally, if you intend on commenting on any item today before the board, uh, you can sign up uh, here at the side of the room. There uh, should be a uh, tablet or computer and additionally, uh, there is a QR code that will take you uh, to the form uh, once uh, you are here, please do uh, state your name and any affiliation you might have. Uh, importantly as well, please uh, do set your phones and any noise-making devices to silent so that uh, we don't interrupt uh, proceedings and discussions. With all of that out of the way, uh, we can now move on to our agenda. And at the top of today's agenda is actually a presentation of the Sustained Superior Accomplishment Award. And we'd like to welcome up Megan Tonsony to uh, present the award. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and morning. members of the board. My name is Megan Tosney, and I'm an Assistant Deputy Director in the Division of Financial Assistance. I'm here to recognize two members of my team who are receiving awards for their sustained superior accomplishments. Um, I'm gonna start first with Lucio Oriana. Um, Lucio's been in his position as a senior engineer, as a specialist since 2018, and he worked as an engineer in the division for several years prior. As a specialist, he's helped us in managing and compiling data from multiple sources to inform a variety of the work in the division, primarily related to implementation of the Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resilience, or SAFER, program, which is geared toward providing sustainable solutions to Californians who lack safe and affordable drinking water. One of the key programmatic efforts for SAFER is developing the fund expenditure plan that we prepare annually to outline our approach to administer funds from the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. And Lucia has been instrumental in extensive data compilation and analysis to support development of the first three fund expenditure plans, including leading recent efforts to incorporate demographic information related to racial equity and environmental justice. In the past year, he's also played a lead role for the division in developing an online funding dashboard to visualize and share out information about the board's funding more broadly, um, including compiling not only drinking water related data, but also tying in information related to wastewater, water recycling, stormwater, groundwater, and other types of projects, which has enabled us to better share these funding accomplishments with the public. Um, to be frank, we do often face challenges with our data systems, and we're continuously working to improve them. And in these past years, Lucio has faced those challenges head on, and his work has been consistently thoughtful and thorough and often delivered on very tight timelines. So in addition, um, and generally with little oversight, he consistently represents us well as a liaison on behalf of the division, coordinating with other organizations around improved data management and he's also been relied upon in addressing the needs of external parties, including auditors. I can attest that I consistently receive um, unsolicited but very welcome positive feedback from diverse partners and stakeholders regarding their experience working with Lucio, um, and his ongoing efforts continue to directly improve transparency around the funding that's provided by the board, and we just really wanted to acknowledge all of his hard work. So, um, and then next up, I have Pete Stamus. Uh, Pete is a sanitary engineer. He came over to the division with the transfer of the drinking water program in 2013. 
And like Lucio, Pete is a great representative on behalf of the division and the board. He manages planning and construction funding for drinking water projects, primarily for small disadvantaged communities. He is a constant go-to for my management team when we need to assign either challenging or high-profile projects. Uh, one specific recent example I wanted to highlight is his work with the City of Needles. Uh, the city did not have sufficient water delivery capacity to meet demand. After funding an initial project to replace a key pump station, uh, Pete piloted a new process to incorporate additional urgent projects through a series of amendments to the city's initial agreement. Um, and this saved months of internal processing time and allowed the city to address deficiencies very quickly, um, which was obviously a big win for both the city and the board. Aside from his project management skills, Pete has very extensive, um, almost encyclopedic knowledge of our drinking water funding programs. Um, he actually had a lead role in developing the initial drinking water state revolving fund policy that was first adopted in 2014, shortly after the transition of the drinking water program. And most recently, Pete has taken the lead on drafting guidelines for a proposed new expedited drinking water funding program. And um, this new process is still in draft form, but as proposed would enable eligible small community projects to receive construction grant agreements significantly more quickly compared to our existing process. This concept initially took shape in the fall of last year and Pete deserves immense credit for getting the draft guidelines out for public comment in a remarkably short time frame. Um, Pete's work on these types of effort has had a direct impact on improving our program performance, but ultimately what really sets Pete apart is his extremely patient and helpful nature. He is very committed to mentoring his peers, not only within his own unit, but really across my whole branch, which is, you know, certainly invaluable to my team. So um, ultimately I anticipate we'll continue to see great work from both Pete and Lucio, but we wanted to take this time to acknowledge their past contributions. Um, and we're very grateful to have them as part of the division. So um, thank you both and congrats. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank you, Lucio and Pete. Um, as Megan, you said, uh, particularly to Lucio, the data work is, is foundational to so much, all the decision making that this board does and the work that we've been able to do, yes, with um, sometimes not the most resourced um, systems, but with incredible leadership from you and your colleagues to be able to, to actually make real what are so much of the challenges and lived experiences of communities that have really struggled under conditions for decades. And through the data, we're better seeing. And so between the continuum of that and to Pete, where it's about the implementation then of, of those projects and engagement and connecting to the, the programs uh, that the data helps then us better see and support uh, just thank you. We're incredibly fortunate for a lot of passion and, and leadership in our, in our organization. I really appreciate this opportunity and for Megan elevating uh, the work because um, we can't elevate it enough. So thank you. I just want to add thanks and um, just recognize how much uh, communities that haven't had safe drinking water really need our partnership and your work and the work in the um, you know, Division of Financial Assistance, among others, but particularly the leadership and commitment and um, dedication and innovation that you all have been doing, it means that we can really be partners um, and really help ultimately achieve the human right to water. So thank you all so much and, and thanks for um, bringing folks up that we can recognize and, and sort of see the, some of the faces that are really the hard work behind the scenes. It's an, it's an awkward tradition, but it's still one of our, our favorite, which is the, the photo as well.
thanks everyone for the time uh, and importance to do that. Uh, now we can move on to our public forum and we do have a number of public uh, forum commenters and so we can begin to get to our list. Um, I believe here our first commenter will be Chris Schutz. Good morning, Mr. Schutz. Good morning, I'm Chris Schutz, the new executive director of the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. I'm here today with some colleagues to remember Bill Jennings, CSPA's executive director and leader since uh, 2005, who died on December 27, 2022. Over the past three decades, Bill appeared hundreds of times before the state water board and regional water quality control boards. He advocated before those boards regarding water quality and water rights, drought management, and all manner of additional issues. One of his first appearances before the state board was in the early 90s regarding Penn Mine, in which he eventually prevailed over a young Tom Howard and leveraged the cleanup of the mine and large flow increases in the lower McCallum River. Bill's last appearance before the state board was in April 2021 regarding drought variances. Today, we have several people to remember Bill and what he meant to them, California's fish and aquatic ecosystems, and to the Bay Delta Estuary and the people who live in and near it. Those people are Gary Bobker, who has only a few minutes and I'd like to have go first, Sejal Chokshi Chu, uh, Mike Jackson, Barbara Berrigan Perea, John Herrick, then I'd like to stay, make a few closing remarks. I'll let each person introduce himself or herself in turn. Thank you, Mr. Schutz, and appreciate uh, everyone gathering to commemorate and uh, here honor uh, Mr. Jennings. Mr. Bobker. Great, thank you, Chair. And thanks for the introduction, Chris, Gary Bobker with the Bay Institute. Um, you know, for me, um, it's very fitting to note Bill's passing before the board because um, Bill, I think more than any other individual kind of personified the Delta. Uh, his, his knowledge of the Delta's history and ecology was encyclopedic. Uh, his commitment to protecting the, the health and the future of the Delta was total and tireless. Uh, his engagement on just about every aspect of the Delta's health and future was comprehensive. Uh, you know, Bill was involved from the very, from the very local to the largest landscape level, for, you know, in all kinds of state, federal, local venues. He crossed boundary issue boundaries from uh, fisheries and water quality to uh, environmental justice. And I think in particular, you know, his vision of the Delta uh, included both its incredible natural treasures and the people who lived in it. Uh, and, you know, he, he was a lifelong civil rights activist. And I think he pioneered the marriage of uh, environmental and environmental justice issues in a way that um, has inspired a lot of people. Um, you know, indeed, his very appearance kind of um, personified the Delta. I mean, the Delta is a kind of unique go at your own way place. And, you know, Bill had his own rather unique, quirky appearance and manner. Um, you know, I think it's also important to note that Bill was, could be extremely hard hitting in his criticism of anyone who he felt was harming the Delta's interests. But he always conveyed that criticism in a way that was uh, gentlemanly, uh, thoughtful, courteous, and, uh, you know, as a result, I think he got along with a lot of people and got a lot accomplished because he was able to not personalize these issues. Um, you know, to, to quote a cliche, he's, he leaves a big hole that I think no single person is going to fill, but I think he's also uh, going to be an ongoing inspiration for a whole generation of Delta activists um, that he helped create. So um, let me leave you with this final thought. I think, you know, Bill had special um, concern uh, for um, regulators who uh, didn't do their job regulating uh, the whole issue of regulatory capture. So um, 
as members of the state water board, I, I, I counsel you that if you waver in your, uh, in your duty to regulate uh, and protect the Delta, that there's probably going to be a puff of pipe smoke that comes your way just to remind you and stiffen your resolves. Um, so with that, um, you know, it's, uh, we'll all miss Bill and, uh, but be inspired by his example. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bobker. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sejal Choksi Chu, and I'm the executive director of San Francisco Baykeeper. Thank you so much for making time today for this tribute to Bill Jennings. Bill was a longtime friend and mentor, and it's my honor to be saying a few words in his memory today. When I graduated law school in 2002 and joined the team of Baykeeper, my main job for two years was to work for Bill on our Delta Keeper project to reduce pesticide pollution in the Central Valley. And I still remember that day when I met my first boss. I walked into his home office and was immediately overwhelmed with the sight of papers and open books everywhere, the aroma of pipe tobacco, and a big, big hearty laugh. He was talking to someone in a soft Southern drawl and it actually took me a second to understand what he was saying because of all the acronyms he was using. Uh, he looked at me skeptically as if he were going to interview me for the job that I had already started. But after a nice long chat during which we learned we were both Southern transplants that had deep rooted passions for clean water, he thoughtfully puffed on his pipe and a twinkle came to his eye as he said, mostly to himself, well, I think we're gonna work together just fine. I soon learned that when his number popped up on my caller ID, it meant he had a big new idea to protect the estuary and tough questions that required long hours of intense legal research on my part. And I realized that for Bill, meaning by extension for me, work was life. And there was really no need to balance anything more than that. Bill lived and breathed the Delta, so much so that even when Baykeeper had to consolidate our Delta work into one office and downsize, our board let him continue using the Delta Keeper email address because that identity was so personal for Bill. He inspired me to turn what I love into my life's work. And that's why even though he lived a life doing what he loved, his passing reminds me of all the irreplaceable things that we're losing. Bill always spoke truth to power, and so I'd like to speak up for him now. Our fish and water quality are declining, and as he would tell us, the only way to restore them is to reduce harmful water diversions so that our estuary can thrive. In memory of Bill and all that he worked for, the most fitting tribute we could pay him would be for the board to quickly develop and implement long overdue water quality standards before we lose species like the Delta smelt and salmon that Bill devoted his life to protecting. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we don't appear to have uh, Mr. Jackson in the Zoom platform. There is a Ruth Jackson that has joined, but we don't see an audio associated with that particular account. So Chris, we're gonna move on if that's okay, unless you know that uh, Michael's gonna be joining. Um, I believe Ruth Jackson would be Michael Jackson. And if they can sort out the um, audio, uh, he would be wishing to speak. Perhaps you can move ahead with Barbara and uh, the Jacksons can try to figure out their audio. Okay. Um, good morning, chair and board members. Uh, Barbara Berrigan Priya with Restore the Delta. Today we remember Bill Jennings, who was a mentor and a friend uh, to me and the senior team at Restore the Delta. Bill was 20 years my senior and was truly an older brother. He was caring and bossy, hilarious and impatient, but he always did it with heart all at the same time. 
He frequently checked in to make sure I was doing okay during my long days of organizing throughout California. We always worked on opposite schedules. Bill was a night owl and I'm a morning riser. So we joked that we were like Britain in America with one of us always up protecting the greater good of the Delta. He was a true friend. Bill served on the hiring committee to form Restore the Delta. And after I began to build our organization, my preschool daughter wanted to join every water meeting because she really knew that Bill was Santa Claus. It didn't help that Bill confirmed her belief by always winking at her in silence, just like Santa winks at children in the movies. By the time she was a first grader, she had a doll named after Bill, who in her world of play was busy with water quality meetings and preparing for court. He captured her imagination. A few years later, they became buddies when he lent her pipes from his collection to use in a summer theater program. And he even kept an eye on her one long afternoon for me with complete glee as she rolled down a grassy hill for hours, ruining a party dress at a Restore the Delta event at the Grand Island Mansion while I was preoccupied with other guests. Bill had the best laugh the next day, telling me what a marvelous time she had rolling for hours in the grass and dirt, ruining her clothes. I wanted to share these personal memories about Bill because we all know about the brilliance of his work his advocacy and his abilities as a deep thinker. But what a lot of people don't recognize is that behind this brilliance was a man with a full heart and the best of old school American values. Insisting on a world where fish and frogs thrived was essential to Bill because it meant that kids like my daughter would grow up in a world healthy enough to roll around green hills and enjoy getting into outdoor mischief rather than playing endless video games. Bill was also a friend and mentor to Tim Strohshane and Brian Smith, our other senior staff members, as well as to countless other environmental advocates throughout California. Losing him feels heavy for all of us. Our board members at Restore the Delta, a most diverse group politically, all respected and cared for Bill. As our organization's interests and team evolved in its advocacy for the Delta, Bill would simply say to me, keep at it, good for you. During an extended visit I had with Bill on Boxing Day 2021, we were both recovering from serious illnesses. I was lucky enough to have hours of a fascinating conversation with him about how our, nature's cult, our nation's culture changed during his lifetime, a most memorable day I will carry with me forever. To understand Bill's work, what fisheries, rivers, and the Delta meant to him, um, I'd like to share this video with you. It's short, two and a half minutes, and it's from our 2012 documentary. And um, all of it still rings true for today. Bill Jennings, executive director of the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, has spent many years fighting for decent water quality for fish and habitat, which is also decent water for people and farming. You look at this this, this estuary and it, you know, on the surface, it, uh, it looks fine. You've got water, uh, you don't see pollution. This really is one of the great natural estuaries uh, uh, in the world. Um, it's certainly the largest estuary on the west coast of the West Hemis Hemisphere. It's certainly um, uh, the uh, crossroads of, uh, of uh, Samanid migration uh, up to the great rivers of, of, uh, of the Central Valley. And, and, you know, we're not talking about a delta smelt or, or, or a salmon. I mean, we're talking about the hemorrhaging of a, of a biological tapestry of an entire ecosystem, multiple species. The issue is whether we can continue to grow uh, subsidized crops in the desert, uh, and whether we're going to grow cotton and, and uh, uh, almonds for export. Uh, and, and at, at the expense of this marvelous estuary. And um, then the expense of Delta farming, the half million acres of, of, of Delta farmers uh, who are fighting the intrusion of salt. And we all recognize that uh, we're gonna survive together 
or we're going to perish together. I mean, our fates are intertwined, and we can't, we can't ignore that. And that's why, uh, in the efforts to protect this estuary, uh, there's been the oddest coalition of, of, of farmers and environmentalists and fishermen and, and small businessmen and, and, and industrial tycoons, I mean, you know, coming together to fight for this estuary because it's worth fighting for. It's a special place. It's a place called home. I mean, it is our home. Fighting for fisheries, waterways, and wild places was Bill's way of protecting our community, the Delta, our home. I hope that we all can carry the legacy of Bill's work forward for the health of California, water future for our state. There's no better way to honor his memory for the people who worked with him or for this board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Berrigan and Peria. I believe our next speaker is Mr. Jackson, and it looks like he's got his video, or I should give credit to uh, perhaps Ms. Jackson for getting the video connected There's for There's no him. better way to honor his memory for the people who worked with him or for this board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Berrigan. Period. I believe our next speaker is Mr. Jackson, and it looks like he's got his video, or I should give credit to uh, perhaps Ms. Jackson for getting the video connected. There's no better way to honor his memory for the people who work with him or for the sport. There's no question who got this thing fixed. And the, uh, I first met Bill Jennings in a pipe shop in... Uh, so Mr. Jackson, it sounds like you have the Cal EPA webcast going in the background, so you might want to close that window. Otherwise, you'll it'll, it'll hear it delayed. No question. We've got this thing fixed. The, uh, I first met Bill Jennings in a pipe shop in, uh, in, in Stockton. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Uh, if you can uh, hear me well here, I believe the issue is you have the Zoom platform open and also multiple webcasts, and those are catching up, and you are then hearing those um, here afterwards. So if you can close those webcasts, um, it should work well. And unfortunately, it looks like what got closed was the Zoom platform. So perhaps we can move on to Mr. Herrick. And if Mr. Uh, Jackson can call back in, there we come. Uh, we can pick him up after Mr. Herrick. Thank you, everyone. Hello, this is John Herrick, South Delta Water Agency. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and board members for allowing us to give these little few words about uh, our fellow uh, friend, Bill Jennings. What can you say about Bill? Well, of course, he was an incredible environmental advocate. And as Barbara mentioned, he either was or pretended to be Santa Claus on various occasions. Um, I'd just like to note, and I hope Bill can hear this, that uh, now that I've grown older and expanded, I come to appreciate the benefits and sheer genius of suspenders, uh, making my life much easier. I knew Bill was a good guy when he first met my wife, and in the same sentence, he complimented her and insulted me, and so I knew he was a man after my own heart. Bill was a true believer, calmly and diligently fighting for what he thought was right. He was never afraid to confront power, but he was never mean. He was never insulting. He was always polite when doing it. Bill was that very rare person nowadays who could discuss politics with people with the opposing view without thinking them evil or disassociating themselves. He and I found much common ground on various issues, even though we seldom, if ever, voted for the same person. And uh, coincident or, uh, we did vote for the same person once in a while. <laughs> when Bill spoke, everybody listened. 
his familiarity with the facts was remarkable. His uh, knowledge was incredible. His presentations were very cogent and, and effective. And I recall many an opposing counsel declining to cross-examine him so they wouldn't ruin their own case by mistake. My Delta farmers regularly responded with concerns that once some new program was going to get started, that Bill Jennings would start suing them. And I'd tell him that. And he'd kind of look a little hurt and say, I've, I've never gone after a Delta farmer. And we'd laugh a little bit. And Bill wasn't out to get people. Bill was out to preserve the Delta. And he did a remarkable job in doing that. At this time, I'd like to give a shout out to Mr. Uh, Tom Keeling and his wife, close friends of his here in Stockton. And uh, Bill used to spend about every Friday night for at least a decade at their house. And uh, we all appreciate their companionship with him. And they gave him good food, you know, good time, good conversation. And there may have been a little wine or, or stiffer spirits involved in those, in those uh, rendezvous. As part of a fraternal organization, I've given about 40 funerals over the past 20 years. And this either does or doesn't give me some little perspective on life and death because of the, the numerous times I've been involved with the families of somebody who's passed. So what does it all mean? We don't know. The ultimate questions remain unanswered. But if I may, I'd like to give a brief quote from one of the funeral services I give. And that is, when we near our final days, all of the pomp and pleasure of this fleeting world palls upon the senses. And the recollection of a virtuous and well-spent life yields the only comfort and consolation. Bill, our recollection of you is of one who's led a virtuous and well-spent life. And it gives us some little comfort now that you've left us. Bill was a true friend and we will miss him. And I appreciate the opportunity to give these words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eric. And we have uh, Mr. Jackson's uh, been invited to speak again, and we have uh, extended him an opportunity to unmute as well. Mr. Jackson, it looks like you're unmuted. So if you'd like to try to speak, you can. You don't need to turn on your camera unless you'd like to. Thank you very much. Uh, I met Bill Jennings in a pipe shop in Stockton uh, in 1985, when CSBA was looking for someone who, in the Delta, who had the appropriate uh, views on this importance of the Delta and the need um, to save it. Uh, it was the luckiest uh, day of my life, other than meeting the woman who just tried to fix all of this mess that I created with my uh, Zoom. The, the three things that I that Bill Jennings lived for were the Delta, the people of the Delta, and the University of Kentucky basketball team. About a year and a half ago, he was involved in an automobile accident. And I really re expected that he would be back right away. Um, it turned out that he lost interest even in the University of Kentucky basketball team. So I think what he would like me to say is that in that 35 years, um, we did some good. We also failed um, on numerous occasions on very big issues. But Bill was one who believed that if you were actually going to get to the bottom of things, actually save things in California's aquatic ecosystems, you were going to have to be brave enough to take on the biggest people in their most important area. And he did that his whole life. When Bill was a young man, um, he developed a, a, an interest in riding on buses in the South. Um, he was usually the only Caucasian person there, and he could be recognized easily by the bright red hair, the pipe, and the smile. 
He never got to write the book that he had intended to write, which was uh, had a working title of Mississippi Jails I Have Known. But he did understand that things had to change, that things would change if you would continually push. And he, he brought that civil rights experience into the environmental rights um, that have been carried on so well by Barbara Berrigan Perea and others. The hope is that in the future, this board will exercise its full authority to save the rivers of California. Bill, Bill has known and worked with board members since the 1980s. They've all been well-meaning. They've all understood by the end of their term that things had to change, but the political route that changes fairly regularly in, in a long-term project like saving the Delta has people restarting and, and trying to recreate what you already know. So his message to this board would be, please use your heart as well as your brains to actually begin to solve the problem. And it can't be done by pleasing everyone, CSPA included, Bill included. But please start, we're, reach, we're, we're reaching the point where everything is beginning to fail at once on all of the rivers leading into the Delta. So while he very much liked and admired State Water Board staff, the political part has got to be fixed in order that we can then begin to use your staff to fix the problems. So we love Bill, we honor Bill, and we hope that there are replacements for Bill in the future. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Really appreciate your participation and words and acknowledgement here. Thank you, sir. And I think at this point, Mr. Schutz had indicated he wanted to say a few words to close us out. I do, and thank you very much. One of the great lessons that Bill Jennings learned from his years in the civil rights movement is that you can motivate some people by confronting them with actions that don't match up with values. Another thing Bill learned is that indulgence has its limits. Often as not, you need a lawyer. In an interview with Alex Breitler in the, of the Stockton Record in 2012, Bill said, I value the law deeply. If you don't agree with the law, you work to change it. That's why I believe in regulation and why I have no sympathy for state agencies that can't bring themselves to enforce the law. If we don't have that, society disintegrates. It's fair to say that no organization has been more consistent in defending the State Water Board's authority than CSPA. It's probably also fair to say that no organization has been more consistently critical of the board's exercise of that authority than CSPA. That's part of the legacy of Bill Jennings and it's likely to continue. But it would be a great disservice to consider Bill a contrarian who lived to fight. Bill was incredibly thorough. He demanded rigor from those he worked with. This was because he understood the value and importance of evidence. But for Bill, the value of process was as a clear path to outcomes. He showed there is great dignity in fighting for his beloved Delta and everything that depends on it. But he fought out of reverence for the Delta and the natural world and to make them better not for the sake of fighting. 
Bill had no time for purists who substitute grand visions for hard work and aspirations for solutions. Any more than Bill had time for those agencies and organizations that will settle for two fish when there's a need for a hundred. Bill understood that how you do business is often as important as the business you do. Serious people take serious people seriously. Fights over our collective natural heritage are bigger than the people who fight them. Personalizing those fights trivializes the fights and the resources at stake. Bill respected some of his adversaries more than some of his erstwhile, erstwhile allies. Many of Bill's adversaries respected Bill. Following Bill's death, one of Bill's longtime adversaries wrote to me, he took a small organization and built it into a powerhouse environmental protection advocate. In my view, his perspective was necessary, important, and productive. Many people recognize Bill's moral gravitas, but those of us who knew Bill well remember his overarching generous spirit. He basically devoted and donated the last 35 years of his life to California's fish. He asked for very little in return. He was self-taught. He learned regulatory process by doing it. He understood it as hard. He didn't understand why more people don't persevere in mastering what is hard, because what at stake is at stake is so foundational. CSPA will continue the initiatives Bill guided for the past two decades. We'll be looking for a couple of people to continue Bill's work, but none of them will ever replace Bill Jennings. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and remember our friend and colleague. Thank you, Mr. Schutz. I really appreciate you organizing this and for the speakers who have uh, spoken today to honor the memory and work of Bill Jennings. Um, I am, am always incredibly humbled to serve on, on this board and, and be in this position at this time because I know that there's an incredible legacy of not just Bill, but uh, many folks that have uh, spent their lives working on the challenges that are before this board. And so I just incredibly um, am appreciative of, of being able to acknowledge his work and here all collectively continue to commit to figuring out how we best balance what are, I know, compounding challenges here, uh, both in the Delta and uh, throughout the state. So just really appreciate um, you taking the time and doing this this morning. Vice Chair, is there anything you wanted to say? Or Ms. Oh, I just wanted to add, you know, Bill Jennings was uh, one of the first people I met um, when I started working in the San Joaquin Valley. He was the one that introduced us to the Central Valley um, Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, really mentored us around um, advocacy with the board, and um, uh, we worked together on the Irrigated Lands Program. Um, you know, he, I think every everything that folks said um, really resonates with my experience. Um, he, there was incredible respect from him for um, community representatives' uh, participation in the decision-making processes that affect them, and really that um, value and fundamental belief, frankly, in the regulatory agencies and the missions that they have um, and the importance of participating directly. Um, he never tried to uh, use community members for um, for other uh, campaigns in which they, um, you know, weren't involved. There was really an incredible respect for um, just listening to their voices and making sure that there was really space for people to talk about their lived experience. Um, just incredible respect and, and also affection uh, for you know uh, who we who we all referred to as Santa Claus and um, remember well. I love the like um, glasses on the forehead. It was just uh, you know just hugely um, just huge affection um, and gratitude for kind of the mentorship in in uh, regulatory advocacy from uh, the beginning of my career. So thank you. Board member, vice chair. 
I just want to thank you all that participated today um, in taking your time uh, to choose this, um, the Water Board as a forum um, to honor Bill. Um, just really appreciate everything that was said and the video especially, actually um, giving us a chance to see Bill once again and be reminded of just so many unique things about him. Um, I especially uh, appreciated that when he did appear before us, the room was pretty quiet. Everyone stopped and wanted to hear what Bill had to say and uh, appreciate also how he said it. And I think that many uh, people spoke about this, um, how thoughtful, how articulate, but how respectful, respectful of different views, but made his views very clear, but um, uh, didn't do so you know, in an aggressive way. Uh, way, which I actually think uh, helped to better deliver the message. So thank you all again uh, for appearing before us. Thank you, Vice Chair. And again, uh, thanks to every everyone uh, that spoke. I don't know if Mr. McGuire, uh, Board Member McGuire, thank you. Okay, we can continue on. We do have additional public uh, comment speakers. Uh, I'd like to next call up Carlin, and it will be followed by James Comstock and then Nick Jocelyn. And Carlin has not yet joined us on the platform and may in fact be uh, intending to testify tomorrow on the voluntary agreements. Uh, so I'll ask Mr. Comstock to uh, unmute and address the board. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Esquivel, members of the board. My, my name is James Comstock. I'm speaking today representing the Comstock Ranch near Middletown in Lake County, California. Our ranch is a family operation, and my father, who's also named James Comstock, served two terms as a District 1 supervisor for Lake County. He would appear today, but for some health issues, and so I am appearing in his stead. On October 30th, 2020, we enrolled in a cannabis general order enrollment in anticipation of leasing land to a cannabis grower, pending approval of our permit application with the state and county. Our WDID is 5S17CC. 429360. At the time of enrollment, the Water Board staff advised us that we should enroll for a maximum size for the potential project so that we'd have sufficient coverage and we followed their advice. At that time, we anticipated paying fees of approximately $1,000 per year based on the policy in place. On February 4th, 2022, we received an invoice for $13,522. We later learned that during the summer of 2021, policy was changed, greatly increasing the fees. Adequate notice was not given regarding this change, and we were very surprised and concerned at this new unexpected amount. We consulted with the Water Board staff and were told to submit a no development site management plan, which we submitted on February 15, 2022, 11 days after receiving the invoice. At that time and to date, no cannabis or other farming has occurred as permits with Lake County remain pending. Because of that, we have been unable to farm from enrollment to present date and the land remains undisturbed. On April 15, 2022, after inquiring further, we submitted a formal request for invoice evaluation at the instruction of Water Board staff. On April 20th, 2022, just five days after, we received a notice of violation for non-payment. On December 22nd, 2022, we received an invoice evaluation response this stated that the Water Board had received our April 22 request for an adjustment to the fiscal year 2021-2022 invoice, and that after reviewing the facts of the case, staff determined that they were unable to grant our request. The letter stated that it appeared that there was land disturbance and or cultivation at our site, which required permit coverage under the cannabis general order. I do not know what that assertion was based on, but it's entirely mistaken. It's important for me to reiterate here, from initial application to date, there has been zero cannabis cultivation or any other farming on the land in question, and no land disturbance other than the drilling of a well, which has not been used for any water discharge or irrigation other than the required well test. On January 6, 2022, at the request of Water Board staff, we submitted a site recharacterization request. We've acted in good faith in working with staff, and we've done every single thing that they have asked or suggested and we've done so virtually immediately after hearing from them. Due to permitting delays in Lake County and significant processing backlog, we are unable to farm or lease to a grower at this time. 
Once again, other than the installation of the well, the entirety of the ground submitted for the permit has been undisturbed and no cannabis related work has occurred. Staff asked us to include existing ranch roads as disturbed ground because the well dr drilling truck drove in and out on those roads, which, is a, which have existed unchanged for more than 100 years. There was no actual disturbance to the ground, but we included that as requested. I'm coming to you today to ask for a waiver of past fees. And when and if our cannabis project is approved and if our potential tenant does proceed with the proposed project, we'll gladly pay the required fees. But until then, the fees imposed by the water board are burdensome on an economically modest family ranch, which does not even make enough money annually to cover the cost of taxes and insurance. We're able to keep the ranch only by working in our personal jobs unrelated to the ranch and paying the cost of maintaining the ranch from our own pockets. We're struggling to survive and to conserve our family's heritage and open land in California. Attempting to navigate the permitting system in a way that ensures compliance with the law while staying financially above water has proven nearly impossible. My family and I are coming to humbly ask you as the board to exercise your discretion and to have staff waive these fees pending actual commencement of cannabis farming operations on our property. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you, Mr. Comstock. Appreciate your time and elevating here to the board. Nothing to comment on initially here. I'll look to uh, Mr. Laufer and our folks um, around follow-up with you. Um, Sure, Chair Escobar. And uh, we'll be happy to look into it further. I mean, what Mr. Comstock is describing is a little bit unfortunate, but of course the permit coverage and the, the work that the boards do is based on anticipated work. Um, and there are a lot of circumstances that affect um, operations like Mr. Comstock's ranch, as well as um, other growers around the state. So we'll take a closer look into it. I don't have direct familiarity of the issues and then we will circle back and make sure the board's aware of our findings and then reach back out to Mr. Comstock. Thank you, I really appreciate that Mr. Laufer. And thank you, Mr. Comstock. Thank you, much appreciated. Next, I'd like to uh, call up Nick Jocelyn who will be followed by Mary Kate Lowry. Hello, Nick Joslin, Mount Shasta Bioregional Ecology Center and Friends of the Shasta River. Happy New Year to the board. I hope you and your family families are safe and well. Only recently learned about Bill Jennings, but I realize after today what a force he has been in the state. So I thank you all for sharing your stories about him with us today. I'm from a fifth generation ranching family. I'm a geologist and now an activist. I currently have the privilege of raising a sixth generation in the county of Siskiyou. This is a rough and tumble county, often dismissive of, state and of the state and regulations. And I find myself frequently dismayed by the lack of progress with respect to natural resources. In the five relatively short generations that my family has been in the Shasta Valley, the beneficial use of cold spring water to grow cattle food has driven numerous aquatic populations to extirpation. Spring Chinook, lamprey, freshwater mussels are all basically gone. Now hanging by a thread are coho, and next will be the fall chinook. Results of the emergency regulations to protect these animals during the last couple of years will need to be analyzed to ascertain whether enough was done to protect them through the historic drought. But I would suggest that we've taken a wrong turn when it comes to deciding how successful we are at any given protective action in the Shasta. If we simply look at the durability of the regulations, only minor legal challenges were waged against the state's emergency regulations it appears the authority to regulate water rights holders has been validated again. Some will say this is a victory for regulatory agencies who are regularly tasked with wading into deep legal waters. If we simply look at the money spent, already 80 plus million dollars of taxpayer money has been spent in the Shasta. Now an additional 20 plus million dollars of taxpayer money is loaded and ready to be hurriedly spent. Some will tout this as a grand success while the funding cannon is re reloaded again and again. But with respect to spending, no one is looking backward and asking, what did the taxpayer money buy for the taxpayers, for the public trust, for the tribes, for the coastal commercial fisheries? Actually, most grantors believe their only role is to spend the money, not to wonder if it actually bought taxpayers what they thought they were getting. I would argue much of this spending has not benefited the taxpayers to the extent that it should have. It is also not a good way to measure success in river restoration. 
If we instead look for fish and use that as a metric for success, we would realize that we have failed the taxpayers and worse, we have failed the fish. There aren't more fish as a result of any of this spending. But there's a bunch of fancy new ranching infrastructure and some of that infrastructure gets used to violate regulations with almost no ramifications. A gentle financial slap on the wrist is not a deterrent from future violations and that has been widely known and has now been broadly proven. We are now in a cycle of spending where the returns on investment are negative if we are using fish as the metric. Returns on investment are negative if we use cubic feet of water per second as a metric. More ranching infrastructure means cheaper water to divert, more water to divert, and the ability to divert water at even lower river levels. It's time to stop, use, stop the wasteful use of taxpayer funding on ranch, rancher infrastructure and look at other ways to give benefit to the public. It's time to give the Shasta and the Scott for that matter, what they have needed for the last two decades since they were identified as critical habitat, in-stream flow recommendations that are protective year round for all species and every water year type. We can start by simply continuing the emergency recommendations and build off them using adaptive management strategies. As a state, we owe it to our sixth generation of residents. As a state, we owe it to the tribes and river dependent communities but we need to start immediately because the fish don't have much time left. I don't wanna tell my son that I simply tried to undo some of the harms that my family were part of. I want him to see wild free swimming salmon thriving in the Shasta River. I need the board's help to make that possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jocelyn, appreciate you addressing this board and your time this morning. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Mary-Kate Lowry, who will be followed by Regina Chigazola and our last public commenter, I believe, here on our list is David Webb. So uh, we have not seen Ms. Lowry join the Zoom platform this morning, so we will give Ms. Chipazola an opportunity to speak at this point. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Regina Chikazola um, with Save California Salmon. A lot of you know me. Um, and first of all, I wanted to say yay for this crazy weather, because I know we're all excited to have a little more water in our rivers and estuaries at this point. Um, and we're far from getting beyond the drought, but it's a good start. Um, I'm here today because there are um, a lot of things on the agenda that are critically important to me, including the priorities of the Water Board in the year ahead. Um, and I just really um, wanted to um, bring a few things to your attention. Um, first of all, I am again going to, going to ask that the um, Scott and Shasta rivers in stream flows, whether or not there, this is a drought year or not, or curtailments or not, be a high priority of this board and that in-stream flows are set for these rivers because as you know, there are man-made created droughts within these systems any year. That's not an extremely high water year. Um, and there are very little regulations to make sure that there are flows in these rivers. Um, so that is the first thing I wanted to bring up. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up that has not, that I don't think I've brought to the attention of the board yet, is that there are some temperature management plans happening on the Trinity River um, in relation to warming from the Lewiston Reservoir. And there is also a process ongoing um, to do a new biological opinion in the Trinity River. Um, as you know, the Trinity River has been relied on to keep salmon alive in the Klamath River pending dam removal, but it, it truthfully is going to be important for a really long time. And even with these storms, the Trinity River, River res, um, reservoirs are the lowest in the state. And I'm not sure if that's because water is being transferred to Whiskey Town to help uh, fill other reservoirs or not. I will look into that. Um, but I just wanted to bring the Trini River situation to the board's attention because this is the first time that temperature management and a biological opinion are being addressed on the federal level in about 20 years. Um, and so I do think it's critically important for the board to comment on that process and to engage in that process. Um, there is talk about having carryover storage requirements, which will involve um, water rights actions ultimately. So I think that um, 
the board should engage in that process. It's critical to keeping the Klamath salmon alive, which the state has made a big commitment to. Of course, so is the Scott and Shasta, but the Trinity River, this is the first time in a while that we can engage on the federal biological opinion process. Um, I also would love to see the board deal with the Trinity River as far as temperature management in the year ahead. Um, we have had a proposal that's gone forward um, and been brought to the board, but I'll address that later on when we're actually talking temperature management. Um, anyway, so those are two of the things I wanted to bring to the board's attention. Um, and then another one is I just think in-stream flows in general are going to need to be um, a high priority for this board ahead, as do I think looking at ways that we can deal um, with both estuary and floodplain restoration both for the safety of the community, but also to really deal with our very serious groundwater recharge issues that are happening. Um, I know that there's been a lot of pressure for the board to support things such as sites reservoir or the Delta tunnels, but ultimately science um, climate scientists are saying the number one things that we can do for climate change and making sure that our water supply is protected during climate change is to restore our floodplains and estuaries in a way that both protects our community and allows groundwater recharge and that our dam system and building more dams will never keep up with climate change. And as we know, aquifers are critically important to our water supply, but also these floodplains and estuaries are critically important to making sure that our salmon do survive climate change. And I know that's a priority of this board. And then um, just to finish up real quickly, um, I will be commenting on the racial equity plan later on, but I also would again like to ask this board to start thinking about racial equity now when you're considering your decisions. I will be here tomorrow for the voluntary agreement discussion, but obviously racial equity has not been considered at all in that discussion at, so far. Um, you know, no, there is no <laughs> diversity or tribal representation in this proposal at this point, whereas phase two did have some of that engagement. So, um, and that's not the only situation where I think a racial equity lens should be used in these flow related and water quality related decisions moving forward. Um, so th those are the things I would like to bring to the board's attention. Obviously there won't be immediate action. and I will plan to be here as much as I can over the next two days. And thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you, Ms. Chikazula. I appreciate your participation and addressing the board this morning. Thank you. And look forward to your further comments on the items. Uh, Mr. Webb. Thank you very much. This is David Webb, Friends of the Shasta River. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you and thank you for the time and dedication you're all putting in. The recent storms have gotten everyone kind of rubbing their hands together and think it's maybe time to get ready to return to business as usual. And that's certainly understandable, but uh, maybe not something we can afford. I think all of you as board members got to see and understand that unlike most small rivers and streams in California, the Shasta River doesn't dry up naturally every summer, not in a normal year and not in a thousand year drought. The, the glaciers on Mount Shasta continue to feed the groundwater table, which feeds the river. And that makes it very different from rivers where you simply expect them to dry up and they do and don't think too much of it. Your efforts to institute the curtailment of irrigation diversions have given us the healthiest summertime river since 1916. And we simply can't fall back to business as usual where the Shasta in a normal year or a wet year or a drought year is drawn down to four to 10 cubic feet per second of slimy flows at low dissolved oxygen levels and conditions that are just not suitable for aquatic organisms. And it's not just about a pretty river for a few turtles or some frogs. Fishing for salmon, whether tribal or coastal communities, is managed based on the number of wild salmon produced. And the number of wild salmon coming out of the Klamath River system is dependent more on the Shasta River, which is recognized by the Pacific Fishery Management Council as the most important salmon producing tributary in the Klamath Basin. And to continue to produce those wild salmon, which in turn is what allows tribal fishermen to catch fish for subsistence, 
tribal fishermen to catch fish commercially and coastal communities to catch fish commercially is entirely dependent upon those rivers in the Klamath that are producing the wild salmon. And the most important of those by all people's agreement is the Shasta. But please initiate whatever steps need to be taken not to let us fall back to the pre-drought levels of in-stream flows of whatever trickle no one else could capture. And instead, at, at bare minimum, continue the drought in-stream flows whilst working on something more permanent, more broadly based, and more water year based. And, and thank you very much for that. And I really appreciate the efforts you put into this. Thank you, Mr. Webb. I appreciate your comments and work here before the board. I know, and, and thank you everyone, uh, today's uh, public uh, commenters. I know public forum here has stretched us along with our, our challenges nearly to 11, but the forum is really important and glad that uh, folks are, are bringing things to the board's attention. Uh, hearing, and I know um, there's already thought about what, what do we do, what does this water mean? Or do we still continue uh, some of the board's efforts? I think right now the water year is still going on and I'll just flag as now we get into our actual meeting agenda that uh, we don't have a hydrology update explicitly on here, but what we will do as part of item number three, uh, which is our update on monthly water production is have a gloss on hydrology. Um, so just wanted to make that note. And again, thanks to all the commenters that we've had. Let's go ahead and move into our board business. And the first item before us is board consideration of adoption of uh, the January 4th board meeting minutes. Do we have any changes uh, or otherwise a motion? Move adoption of the January 4th minutes. Second. Thank you both. Uh, Ms. Tyler, can you please call a roll call vote? Here. Okay. <clears throat> Vice Chair Diodamo? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tyler. Uh, next, we'll go to item number two, which is on our uncontested items. Uh, is it still uncontested at this point, Ms. Tyler? Okay. And if there's no board members looking to pull it off, just want to thank uh, the division for the good work. Uh, the fact that it is uncontested means we can get to it quickly. So I'd entertain a motion. I'll move to adopt item two. Second. Thank you. And Ms. Tyler, can you please call roll call vote? Board Member Firestone? Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Chair Escobel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well, Ms. Tyler. The vote's unanimous and the item is adopted. Thanks again to everyone on the, the good work on it. Uh, that now brings us to our first informational item, uh, which, you know, it is 11, so why don't we take a 10 minute break and go ahead then come back here um, at 11 and, and we'll start in on uh, item number three. Push to talk.
Okay, everyone, thank you for uh, the break and the patience. We got uh, the second projector for those here in the room working again, so uh, thanks. Now we're on to item number three. And as I said, um, we'll start uh, at the top of this with a, a gloss on our hydrology. And for that, we have Mr. Ekdahl. Good to see you. Good morning, Chair Esquel, members of the board. I think we can jump right to the slides. Charlotte, what is, I don't know if you have any intro or kickoff slides. Um, no kickoff slides. I just wanted to um, say hi and good morning. Charlotte Italy supervised the conservation um, program here, and that today is a not just a, a twofer, but a threefer. Um, so Eric Ekdahl is joining to provide the hydrologic update. Marielle and I will provide the conservation update. And then we're also joined by Bill McDonnell and Joe Berg with Metropolitan Water District in Orange County uh, Metropolitan Water District to provide an overview of um, the conservation programs that they, they offer. Um, these um, presentations, and thank you both for being here, are sort of a direct response to various asks that board members have made. Um, specifically, uh, board member Morgan um, had requested um, to hear more about the conservation programs that are offered by, by urban retail water suppliers. And Chair Escavel, you had sort of asked for some, some, some insights on how regional programs, of which both um, these agencies are, can support smaller um, suppliers that might not have really robust water conservation programs themselves. Um, so these, these presentations today are just sort of a, a small part of a laundry list of requests that um, board members have made to us. And I just wanted to, our team wanted to let you guys know that we are um, responding to many of those asks. Board member McGuire, um, we're, we're working on some of the requests you've made, including arranging a presentation on the annual supply and demand assessments. Um, so that will be forthcoming. And then um, board member um, Diamano and um, board member Firestone, you both have requested um, that in evaluating the prospective impacts of the proposed uh, making conservation a California way of life regulation that we analyze um, whether and to the extent that bike park communities are disproportionately impacted by the proposed reg. So we are actively engaged on carrying out that analysis and we'll share um, information with you guys as soon as we can. Um, and that analysis will also include a request that you had made, Chair Esquivel, um, that we look at the Cal Enviro screen scores of all of the um, suppliers. So um, we are working on that. So you all ask a lot of very good questions um, and make some very good requests. And so thank you for keeping us busy. Um. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Ely, for, for that follow-up and for, for here um, inviting. And I appreciate uh, the participation of uh, the Metropolitan Water District and Municipal Water District of Orange County. So thank you both for being here. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to the presentations. Great, thank you. Let's jump to the next slide. So I'm only going to show a very few short number of slides. I'm not going to show the typical curves that we've seen. We'll do another thorough update in early February. I did want to highlight just changes in reservoir storage. Uh, this is in really the last two weeks or so, the little bullets at the bottom. So the, the uh, colored boxes are where things were as of midnight, January 16th, and then kind of an increase over the last two weeks or so. So this doesn't include even the storms we saw in December. I'll show a slide or two in a minute that shows what that kind of looks like visually. But Oroville stands at about 2.027 million acre feet. That's 57% of capacity, 104% of historic average. That's a very significant improvement. 
uh, it has increased approximately 7 in 11, 711,000 acre feet since January 1st. In Shasta, we're at 2.358 million acre feet. That's 52% of capacity, 83% of historical average. So a very significant change even since the January 4th update, increased by about 818,000 acre feet since January 1st. In Folsom, we're at 524,000 acre feet, 123% uh, of historical average. The bullet there says in flood control operations. So they're actively dumping water to make capacity and more room for snow melt and other precipitation that's anticipated later in the year. New Malones is at 903,000 acre feet, still relatively low in terms of overall capacity, but New Malones does tend to be a, a snow melt dominated reservoir. So we do anticipate that number to continue to increase, especially as we get closer to the spring. Uh, increase of 203,000 acre feet since January 1st. San Luis is at 924,000, 45% of capacity, 66% of historic average, increased about 224,000 since January 1st. And Kachuma, I don't have a, a bullet at the bottom. There are also in active flood control operations. That's typically one of the other reservoirs we cover in the hydrologic update and has been kind of below capacity and well below average for a long time. Uh, they are pretty much at full capacity and are in flood storage conditions right now. So very welcome changes in all of our reservoirs. Even in the last two weeks, we anticipate these numbers will continue to go up, uh, although we are forecasting that our parade of atmospheric rivers and storms will come to an end later tonight. There's one more small system that's moving through this evening until the early hours of Thursday. But then after that, uh, dry conditions through the end of the month are forecasted with maybe a a slight suggestion that there's additional storms starting in early February, although it's still very early to tell. Uh, next slide, please. So highlighting the change in storage in, this is Lake Oroville over the last couple of weeks. You can see uh, downward trending, downward trending through about the middle of December and then really upticking January 1st to uh, conditions that now are actually above the long-term average. Next slide, please. And in Shasta, you can see a similar uptick. We're not quite to that long-term average, but uh, you know, both reservoirs are gaining several tens of thousands of acre feet of storage per day. I think over 50,000 acre feet per day in both right now. And it goes up and down depending on conditions and precipitation. But again, very welcome changes relative to where we've been the last couple of years. Next slide, please. I think the other welcome uh, news is in snowpack. So this is the California snow water equivalent. It's pulled from the Department of Water Resources website. Percent of April 1st average, you can see in Northern California, we're at 100% of the April 1st average. Uh, in Central California, we're at 125%. And in Southern California, 147% of our April 1st average. So again, very welcome changes uh, relative to where we've been the last few years. That all being said, I uh, don't wanna be a, a naysayer or a, a pessimistic voice, but we do have the recollection of just last year, uh, something that we're actively considering where, you know, again, we had a very, very wet December and early January, and then it didn't rain again for three consecutive months, the driest period on record. Uh, so we don't know if that's going to happen again. We have to kind of wait and see a little bit and still plan and operate like we're in a fourth year of drought. And so at this point, the division is still anticipating moving forward with readopting or bringing to the board for your consideration, readopting the drought curtailment regulations. Just because we have a drought curtailment regulation in place doesn't mean we're going to be curtailing people. Uh, like we've seen over the last couple of months, when there's water available, we run the models and we suspend or we don't have those curtailments active, but it's a tool that we can't easily run up and start again if they do lapse. And so again, for now, anticipating moving forward. That being said, there's a lot of time left in the water here. And if it continues to rain, we'll come back to the board and receive your input and uh, make additional considerations as the hydrologic year develops. One last note is uh, the division has been kind of working in the, the newer hydrology of the last couple of weeks and pivoting a little bit to work on recharge. Uh, the division has focused a lot on recharge since 2017. We've set up a streamlined permitting pathway. We've developed a five-year temporary permit along with some legislative uh, 
modification is made in 2019 under AB 658 with uh, Assembly Member Arambula. And we work rapidly and do prioritize 180 day temporary permits as well. I think we've issued three so far with two more anticipated this week and potentially one even today. Uh, so we do encourage if people are interested in recharge projects to please reach out to the division. Again, we you know caution, we, we typically don't do these overnight. It does take some requirements up front. There are requirements for accounting and making sure that there are fish and wildlife and environmental concerns and downstream water users that still do you know, count on some of this water, particularly as we're exporting from the Delta. So it's not something that we can just flip a switch and, and grant at this point, but starting earlier is better than starting later. And please reach out and contact us. We're happy to consult further. And I think that's it. Really appreciate uh, that, Mr. Ekdahl. And, and I, you know, I think what I, we all, I would want to caution here um, is that we're certainly experiencing weather whiplash and we can't whiplash ourselves on these policies. And I think that whether it's the, the drought work and, and continuing to understand um, how we administer rights in a more thorough way, even outside of drought context, um, is really important, just as the flood work and the work that on streamlining groundwater recharge permits that have been done during the drought years are here really helping us now um, as we have these conditions. So Mother Nature is providing this whiplash between the policies, and I think that we have to caution ourselves to not then fall for a sense that drought policies are only for the drought times and, and vice versa around flood. And so, and, and especially as you've noted, we're seeing this inter-year play between the extremes as well. So um, we'll keep watching the water year. We still have uh, a lot to go. We'll have a more thorough deep dive, certainly as even we get into February and things start to shape up a bit. But I think importantly, either way, the policy issues and the challenges before us are, are significant enough that we have to keep understanding these policies and not, again, feel that uh, we whiplash on the policy as much as Mother Nature is whiplashing on the amount of uh, that's available to us. On the recharge point, I know there has been a lot of discussion, um, a lot of interest, um, maybe some finger pointing. I think it's important to remember that um, we're, we're only limited by the number of applications that are actually at our door and, and are successfully being um, uh, pursued. And I think what I want to acknowledge is a lot of assistance the Department of Water Resources has brought so that applicants are sticking with it a bit more. And I think that we're seeing the results of that and some of what we're seeing come to for the board. We're going to do our part to make sure our decision making is as thorough and quick as it can be. And I think important to remind folks when it comes to recharge, uh, flood flows and flood water, if you're, you're, you're in a flood stage and you're fighting that, don't require permits. Uh, and there's a lot of activity that goes on across the landscape. Uh, that isn't this subset of permits that are before the board that are largely you know, post-1914 type right permits, new demands on the system that I think we all have to uh, do well. And I'm excited that there's a lot more applica applications in. We're seeing that drumbeat. And I think what, um, to your point, what we need is for people to not, in the middle of the storm, think now is you know, the time to prepare. We do need that application period prior to even when the winter season is upon us so that we can just go into action mode as opposed to decision making, which makes it a lot harder. No, that, that's a, a great point and you know, some additional metrics to maybe add on to that. We, we've done an analysis and look back, say the wet period between 2017 and 2019 and using some numbers from some uh, researchers using NASA satellites, they've estimated over 4 million acre feet of recharge in just the Central Valley most of that occurs naturally. When you see just a puddle on the ground, it's recharging through some you know, slower process. This managed process where you do intentionally add water to a surface uh, can result in additional recharge. And a lot of that also occurs under existing rights. So there's pre-14 rights where a lot of recharge occurs. There's post-14 rights that already have recharge as part of that permit. And so there's a ton of recharge that, that does go on. This year, we've received applications for eight temporary permits for recharge. Uh, we've processed three, two more are likely to come out this week. One or two more are, are still kind of in development in the early phase. One of them doesn't even have a diversion structure built yet. And the other one has received a fair amount of protests. So there are you know, protests that do occur and we do have to consider those and kind of work through them. So 
we're in a good spot, I think, with what we've received. We do process our temporary permits in about three to four months. Uh, that's a relatively quick timeline f compared to how long some permanent water rights do take. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, and yes, and I want to acknowledge, uh, you know, Vice Chair, you have been intimately involved and in, in really helping to better connect folks with what are the facts, you know, what's before the board, what are some of the sticking points, and uh, engagement with our sister agencies. So I want to really acknowledge that and please um, welcome you to, to add to this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm just um, glad that we have this additional opportunity uh, to educate because I know folks are tuning in, um, whether it's for this item or other items, and I think the more it gets said, um, what I have noticed is that um, even those that um, are involved in these issues, um, you know, more than the average uh, person, uh, it, it's complex. There's three different permits. There's a lot that's required, even though there are opportunities uh, for streamlining. And um, my takeaway in the, the one permit that I was, um, a couple of permits that I was involved in, is uh, the openness um, on the part of our staff, um, executive management, I know the chair and our sister agencies to kind of look at lessons learned. And so I'm excited about um, the opportunity for that dialogue. Um, but in the meantime, it's important to get that information out there, what's allowed, what's not allowed, what is streamlined, and importantly, the you know length of time that it takes. And so I know we're going to include this on the partnership for the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, on an upcoming agenda, and I'm just thinking maybe CDFA's board, just any opportunity uh, we can. It was, uh, it came up um, at Aqua in December, and so just any opportunity we can to get the information out. And I also want to take this um, time to compliment the staff that um, spent a lot of time after hours, Amanda Montgomery in particular, and others. Um, I shouldn't even mention a name because I know there's a whole team of people that worked on this to get uh, these permits across the finish line. So thank you. Thank you for that acknowledgement, Vice Chair. I know uh, a number because we received a number of these applications kind of later uh, than we expected. Even um, folks worked over the holiday to make sure that these were in place. So thank you for that acknowledgement and thanks for the highlight. I think with that, we can transition to the conservation component of, of the update. And good to see you, Ms. Healy, and thanks again for the participation of everyone today. All right. So with the uh, massive downpours that we've experienced over New Year's Eve and the subsequent um, next couple of weeks, um, it might be hard to remember that the water year actually got off to a slightly drier start than the average. Although, if there's one thing that the last few years has taught us, there's really no such thing as an average year. So November 2022 had slightly below average statewide precipitation, but was also cooler and wetter than uh, November in the past couple of years. Um, so in combination with that and existing conservation efforts, um, we see residential per capita use at 74 gallons per capita per day. Um, which is the lowest number that we have seen since we began collecting this data um, in 2014 for November. Next slide, please. In terms of overall statewide savings numbers, um, November 2022 saw 14.2% savings relative to November of 2020, with 5.4% cumulative savings from July 2021 to November 2022. Um, for context, that is about 240,000 acre feet of water saved statewide from January to, to November when comparing the total urban production in 2022 versus 2020 for those same year uh, months, or 469,000 acre feet of water if we are considering the total savings accumulated since the gover governor's July 2021 emergency declaration. Um, now, we do have some good news from the preliminary December data that we have been receiving from suppliers. 60% um, of agencies have reported, and we are seeing so far um, an estimated 16.1% savings for December of 2022 relative to 2020. Next slide, please. As mentioned previously, um, November's statewide precipitation was slightly below average 
but temperatures were cooler. And then there's also some regional variations. Um, in some parts of SoCal, there was actually slightly above average precipitation. Um, and then slightly below average precipitation in the north and about normal in the center of the state. Um, but sort of across the board, savings are nonetheless impressive with most of the state posting double digit savings. Next slide. Right. So <laughs> as Marielle, Dr. Odero, and um, Mr. Eck all have just described, and as we have all recently experienced, um, the state of California was just walloped by a parade of atmospheric rivers. The rains have been torrential and in some places traumatic. Trees have fallen, homes are flooded, and 20 people, maybe more, have died. Um, whether whiplash is the phrase that, that used um, Chair Esquivel um, to, to describe some of these challenges that are being posed by, by climate change. The dries are getting drier and the wets are getting wetter. We're gonna need all the tools in our toolbox, the big and the small. The best of them are gonna be those that help us adapt to multiple fronts at once. So planting a rain garden is a small and beautiful example of such a strategy. Rainwater running off impervious surfaces like driveways and roofs and pavements can be collected in a shallow basin as shown here in the slide. The rain garden holds the water for a limited amount of time and filters it before slowly releasing it into the groundwater. Absorption can be aided with the addition of compost and mulch and the planting of deep-rooted um, native California plants. So happily, rain gardens not only help control wet weather events, but also help to drought-proof our landscapes. A recently published paper describes a seven-year study that took place in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, comparing a flat landscape to one with a one foot deep basin, much like the one shown here on the slide, researchers found that the rain garden retained enough soil moisture to maximize plant growth across all seasons and even during periods of drought. So results like these explain why um, urban retail water suppliers across the state are incentivizing customers to convert their lawns into climate ready landscapes. So the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency, another regional partnership program, offers a rain garden rebate through its Lawn Be Gone program. So that's our conservation tip um, for the month. And we are very pleased to be joined um, by the Metropolitan Water District and Orange County Metropolitan Water District and like to turn to their presentations now. Thank you. Thanks again, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Berg. Barring any questions you guys might have. <laughs> yeah, any, any questions on the conservation side? Just again, thanks again for the tip. I really do appreciate the actionable items that you're also bringing to the informational items. So thank you. And good to see you this morning. Thank you. Is it to, is the order? I don't know if you pull up this. Um, why don't you bring up Bill McDonald's presentation first? Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, board chair and members of the board for inviting uh, Joe and myself here today to talk to you about our conservation programs. As you heard, even though it has been raining, um, there, we've been doing, Joe and I have been doing water efficiency in Southern California for over 25 years. It, it doesn't end whether it's rain, whether it's dry. And some of the key topics um, that we talk about today will be regional, and I heard you talking about that, and also what Charlotte was talking about as far as uh, rainwater capture. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about the regional programs we're doing in Southern California at Metropolitan, and they're really our partnerships. They're partnerships with our retailers and wholesalers because we are a wholesaler. We don't technically have any customers. So next slide, please. So there's a lot of programs in Southern California. Time is of the essence here, so I won't go over all of them, but just to let you know, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Not one size fits all, as you know, whether it's commercial, residential, industrial, institutional. And we try to cover all of those aspects. Um, the first thing I'm gonna concentrate on, though, is the piece of the pie or the piece of the puzzle, regional. When I 
began my career at Metropolitan over 27 years ago, there was no regional program. We were a wholesaler, and if a retailer wanted to do a conservation program, they could. If they didn't, they didn't. So with hundreds of program of you know cities out there, um, it was a mess. And I career before Metropolitan was in the energy business. I worked at Southern California Edison and uh, Southern California Gas. Regional huge programs, but they're retailers. So long story short, I brought that whole regional concept to Metropolitan. So next slide. So fast forward 25 plus years. And so in Southern California, we have regional rebates from San Diego to Santa Monica and Inland, covering all 19 million people. Doesn't matter whether your city has staff or doesn't have staff or has money or doesn't have money. All of the customers, commercial, industrial, residential, can have an incentive. So that's what we provide. And then our agencies, and Joe will talk about that later, can add on to that. So what we created was a regional program, but you have to create regional programs with flexibility. So we created a lot of flexibility so we could have partnerships with our member agencies. So customers now in Southern California can go to this website, whether you're a residential customer or commercial customer, and get rebates for everything, whether it's as technical as a cooling tower to something as basic as a toilet. And I don't want, I could list them all, there would be many slides, but I don't. So just to let you know that there's all of those rebates are available. And then what happens is, city of Los Angeles or some other city can co-fund and add to that rebate. And so then what we do is we provide a one-stop shop for customers. So that customer comes to the website, gets the metropolitan rebate, gets the Orange County rebate or the LADWP rebate, stacked incentives, and then at the end of the month, we go and invoice everybody. So the customer doesn't have to go to different cities and different water utilities. They do if they want to do some local programs, which, which Joe will talk about later, is local programs. So next slide. So the board and most folks in the water industry are talking about turf replacement programs. And as Charlotte showed, it's a really great way to take your lawn out and put in a California-friendly rain garden. That type of picture that, she, that Charlotte showed is a requirement in our program. You have to have a stormwater feature to get an incentive. If you don't have a stormwater feature, you don't get an incentive. So we have a $2 per square foot incentive, but the incentive varies all over Southern California. It can be up to five or $6 a square foot, depending on where you are. Like I explained before, the whole co-funding aspect. But the base level is, if your city doesn't have staff or funding, you still are eligible for your $2. So it covers everybody. Next slide. And I wanted to give you some idea on size and scope. So we've been doing this for a few years. We've done over 200 million square feet of turf in Southern California. And I think that number is actually a lot larger, and I'm gonna get into that in a little couple slides away with a study that we've done. But as you can see, the amount of square feet that we've been taking out every year is gradually going up. The last year, almost five million square feet. And as you can see, it was probably a little over two um, prior to that. Same thing with our, obviously, to get that uh, square feet removed. Our applications have gone from about 400 a month to over 1,200 a month. And then you can see the breakup there between residential and CII, because this program covers both. So, and then to, I, I will, at the end of the presentation, show you if we've taken out 200 million square feet, how much turf is that in Southern California? Because that was a question I knew I would be asked. So, next slide. And then, even though there's a regional aspect, so all of these rebates, all of these incentives are regional, there's some things that don't work regionally. They just don't. We're just too big. We cover 19 million people, 5,200 square miles. Things have to be done at a local level. So we created local programs, and we fund those local programs, and Joe will go into that. In fact, you'll see there a picture of, um, that's MODOC leak detection going on there, which we help co-fund, but they do. We can't really do leak detection at that type of level. Same thing, um, on the other side, you'll see um, a plant giveaway. A lot of local cities and water agencies want to have um, rain barrel distributions, plant giveaways, which is great. So we fund those for the local agency, but they implement them. So you need to have regional programs and local programs, and we help fund both of those. Next. 
But then besides the partnerships with our member and retail agencies, one of the, another partnership we have is with the energy utilities. So we've had for years a partnership with Southern California Gas. These are some photos here of doing a direct installation of high efficiency washing machines in underserved communities. But besides just putting in washing machines, we also put in weather-based irrigation controllers, toilets, shower heads, faucet aerators, all for free. Being a water wholesaler, I don't know where the underserved community customer is. Southern California Gas as a retailer and a large entity knows where they are. It's a nice marriage. So we work with them. They help implement the program and we co-fund it. Next slide. Continuing on that whole partnership theme, as you can see, once you're a wholesaler, you got to partner with a lot of people. So one of the new partnerships that we're doing is public-private, and you hear a lot about that. So this was a partnership that we did last year with LADWP, one of our customers, also Pacific Institute and NGO, but then private institutions like Procter & Gamble, Google and Coca-Cola and Target to go after underserved communities and put in leak detection equipment. This is one particular project you'll see at MacArthur Park, but we've done about 10 of these to date. And so this public-private partnership is able to provide these services to these multifamily buildings free of charge because of that we wouldn't be able to do it just with dwp or just with pacific institute but you bring in all of these players and now we're able to do this again a lot of partnerships next so besides money and incentives and rebates and partnerships there also has to be a lot of education and training so like a lot of water utilities we have a lot of classes that are online and in person, they obviously went online, multilingual for residents. Everything from rainwater capture, as you can see, which is very popular right now, how to use your irrigation controller. A lot of people get rebates for weather-based irrigation controllers, don't know how to use them. They can come to these classes for free. And these, again, are in partnership with our member and retail agencies, these residential classes. Next. But then there's also a commercial piece. Years ago, people said, you're changing out all these landscapes, and my contractor is a mow and blow contractor, doesn't know how to maintain this new landscape I spent a lot of money on. So a lot of folks and you'll, um, in Northern California, Southern California too, do what's called QUEL, Qualified Water Efficient Landscaping. And that's training contractors to maintain and take care of and even plant these California-friendly landscapes. So we went another step further because there's also California Landscape Contractors Association, and they also have a similar type of training class. And so that's an established organization, so we partnered with them to combine their training and quell training so that when you take our one training class, which again is free, you get certified in both of them. So that's why we call it this dual certification. And then we put these contractors on our website so customers now, if they choose to keep their original contractor, that's fine, but they have a place now to go to to find a contractor that can either install or maintain these landscapes. Obviously during COVID, because a lot of these, you have to go out and be in the field um, to take some of the, uh, take the test and, take, and do some of the exams and during COVID, um, that was tough. So just started up again, and as you can see, we've certified quite a few and we'll be certifying more. So next. And the last, one of the last things I wanna talk about is research. So 20 more years, 20 or so years ago when I started at Metropolitan, and the first, one of the first droughts I worked on, we started getting calls. I'm assuming your staff gets calls, and they would say, Bill, I've got a great idea, I'm gonna save the drought, Here's my widget, here's my gadget, give me money. Public agency can't do that. We had no means of addressing people that had good ideas. So 20 plus years ago, we created the Innovative Conservation Program. One of the reasons I met Charlotte when she was at EPA was through this program. And it's the only one of its kind, I think, in the United States that is a grant program just for water efficiency. You don't have to be in metropolitan service area, you don't have to be in California. You can be state, you can be anywhere. And this is another partnership with Southern California Gas. And so when we, we do this every two years, 
and we have a cycle of funding that just actually ended um, in December, and we, allow, we issue grants upwards of $50,000 to test new technology and new ideas. And the good thing about this type of program, whether it's us or the state, is that I like to tell people they, um, the folks out there get an at bat because you're a public agency and they have a great idea and if you have nothing for them, it's really hard. So now, all during the year, Joe and other agencies will say to me, Bill, somebody called me with this great idea, put them on your mailing list when you do the ICP and we do and we end up with 30, 40, 50, 100 applications depending on the year and we have outside panel of experts pick them and select them. And some of the technologies we rebate on in our conservation program came from this particular, tech, came from this thing, this research. So next slide. And then the last couple of slides, and then I'll be done, is more research. This question has flown out there in the water conservation community, the multiplier effect. If the board chair redoes his front yard, the neighbor sees it, we've always heard that maybe they would then change their yard because landscaping is the water efficiency I tell people that you can see. You can't see a new cooling tower, you can't see a new washing machine, but you see your yard. So we took this question and we did, some, we did a study and we had Dr. Andrew Marks actually look into this and do a very good study on it. So next slide, I'll just go right to the results. And what we found was that for every 100 participants that we have an incentive for, there's an additional 132, so you can basically say two to one, that converted their landscapes, but then did not participate in our rebate program. They did it on their own. So when I say we did 200 million square feet, I can, I guess, kind of confidently say we did 400 million square feet probably, because it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. And then, to be, um, we also looked at, for everybody that's doing this, I bet there's somebody who sold their house or whatever, or at some point in time went, I don't really like what you did to the front yard and changed it. So we wanted to look at both sides of the fence. I just didn't want to look at the plus side. So we looked at the negative side of all of those 200 million square feet of customers that took out their turf, how many put turf back in? And so that number is 4% a lot smaller, so when you add the two up, I'm not a mathematician, but it's still over 100% that we are getting a two to one ratio on, on our turf removal. And so next slide. The last slide I have here is again on turf. A little hard to see here, but what this is, the state and the water utilities for years have been talking about turf removal and then now non-functional turf. So we knew at some point in time, somebody was gonna ask me how much non-functional turf or how much turf is in Southern California? It's a big ask. So we went back to Dr. Andrew Marks and he created a dashboard for all of our member agencies and it's a turf dashboard. What you can do is you go in there and you click the categories, these are SCAG categories, whether it's residential, if you wanna see how much residential is in your service area for turf, it'll tell you. If you wanna look at what you would consider non-functional, you could click commercial or government or things like that, and it will tell you, and then it will dive into where they are and where are the biggest projects. So we've created this dashboard for Southern California on how much turf is in Southern California because you need to figure out how much turf is there before you figure out how much non-functional turf you have. And the number's pretty big. It's over nine billion square feet of turf in our service area. How much of that would be considered non-functional or commercial or whatever would depend on a city or a water agency. We're not determining that. Each agency can click their boxes and figure out what they want. But if you think of nine billion square feet and we're at 400 million square feet, there's a lot, there's a, there's a big lift there. And we do about 5 million square feet a year. So I just, this is what I wanted to end with, that this is our latest piece of research on, uh, on turf. And the next, in this upcoming year, one of the things that we're going to do, because right now Joe can get on this and look at MODOC, but he can't look at each individual city. 
So we're diving down now in 2023 to where Dr. Marks will be able to do each individual city in each one of our member agency service area. So whether you're Newport Beach or Lagoon or whatever, you can click on your tab and dive in. Right now, it's at a member agent, what we call a member agency level. And I think I just had one more slide with my contact information and that's it and I appreciate your time. Just incredible thanks, Mr. McDonald, for your career. And it must be pretty rewarding across that time to see so much of a shift happen. And especially uh, given your background in the energy side, which I think even still to my mind, many of us in the water sector, and you know, it's apples and oranges. I know, you know, a, a few large utilities here, thousands, right. um, but, but nonetheless, uh, to, to be able to better export some of the thinking around how we look at the resource, how we see conservation and efficiency as really a bedrock foundation to the usage of such a scarce resource on energy or water anyway. anyway and so just thank you. I, I, wanted, I, I just wanted to note a couple of things, um, especially um, that I feel um, education, information, and the innovation and sort of change space that this is really representing um, really stood out in a lot of what you highlighted. And so just thanks, I really appreciate I know I feel like we could talk all day about a lot of this. Uh, and actually we will have a chance as the board adopts these long-term budgets on efficiency. So all this data, all this work will help us really kind of refine how do we get that right balance. Right. Um, and uh, the issues of the Colorado haven't been resolved with this rain. So this conservation discussion I know for Matt is still front of mind. So your leadership is really appreciated. So thank you. Mr. Berg. Um, to uh, share with you some of our efforts in Orange County. Um, in sh next slide, please. Uh, this is ugly, I apologize for it, but it, do it does kind of convey an important um, evolution of our programs. And you'll see that in roughly the 2004 timeframe, there was a big shift uh, uh, where we really focused early on what I call the cheap and easies, the residential indoor plumbing fixtures. Um, and uh, really didn't have a quantifiable and reliable water savings opportunity for the landscape. So in 2004 with smart timers that began that transition over to the landscape. And we, we uh, have always felt that, that the savings opportunity in the landscape is just massive. And so uh, we did pioneer the opportunity for smart timers in Orange County. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, next slide please. Uh, focusing on landscape programs, you can see on the left side is, is all of our various rebate or incentive programs, uh, and we really try to have as comprehensive a program as possible. Uh, like Bill, uh, Orange MODOC um, offers programs on a regional basis. So you've got Metropolitan that provides what I call the foundational program, foundational incentives. MODOC then applies for grants, and we also take supplemental funding from our member agencies and supplement the grants. Um, we also see that with higher uh, rebate incentives, we get higher levels of participation. So the goal is to maximize the rebate amount to, to maximize participation. And then on the right side, you can see some of the support programs. One of the biggest barrier for turf removal participation is the design. We require a design. We're, we're rebating on average about $3,800 per residential project. And so the design is the biggest hurdle we actually have designers on board that provide a free design to the customer. It includes a home visit, uh, development of a site plan and the design. It includes an irrigation plan as well. Um, that then makes them eligible to participate in the, in the rebate program. Um, and then conversely, we need to maintain those landscapes uh, over time. So we, we built into it a, a maintenance assistance program and we, we know that a, a really good aesthetically pleasing landscape is gonna be a landscape that gets that other neighbor to participate as well. So design assistance, maintenance assistance is, is key. We've got classes that teach people how to remove their turf properly without having to use chemicals um, and not have that grass grow back, especially if it's in a kind of an invasive grass. But that's an array of our landscape focused programs and. And these are implemented countywide throughout MODOC, by MODOC and by Metropolitan, uh, directly to the consumers. MODOC prints about five to 600,000 bill inserts every quarter 
and the retail agencies then stuff those in their water bills to get the word out to the consumers uh, just this morning our board approved uh, a pilot project with the motor vehicle network which is a organization that works with the dmvs in 25 different states but that will allow us to get over 10 million impressions of those captive in the DMVs uh, to promote all of these programs. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to, to piloting that. Um, and we're gonna compare the effectiveness of that to social media or bill inserts. Uh, bill inserts by far are our most effective marketing mechanism, uh, but we wanted to try that out. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm gonna get real focused on our turf removal program. And, and with Bill's foundational incentives, we've been able to remove over 25 million square feet of turf in Orange County. By far the majority of those participants are single family homes. Um, but when we do get commercial sites, they're, moving, they're removing a lot of turf. So we want both to participate. Um, 81 million has been invested in turf removal so far. Um, cumulative savings to date is, is almost 41,000 acre feet. Um, our penetration rates is the thing that, uh, if you compare where some of my agencies need to be with regard to the standards, uh, they're gonna need to do a lot. And with the penetration rates that we're getting, I'm, I'm scared that they're not gonna be able to make it. So uh, our overall uh, penetration rate is, is a tenth of a percent per year of the single family housing stock. During drought, we saw a massive increase to about a half a percent. Um, as Bill mentioned, uh, uh, in Orange County in, in the 2015 timeframe, we were receiving about 1,200 rebate applications for turf removal per month. And so we staffed up, we, we ground through those and, and got them processed. Uh, we also require stormwater capture features, whether it's a cistern, a rain barrel, a rain garden, uh, even grading. Uh, right now we're also uh, developing tree requirements so that we can use trees as stormwater capture features and also to create shading and cooling in the landscapes. Um, the turf removal program participation process is very, very onerous. Uh, we, we have about a 45% dropout rate on the residential side. It requires a design plan. It requires a pre-inspection, uh, a post-inspection. Uh, you got to have that stormwater capture feature. You've got to have plant coverage requirements. And so uh, there are a number, you know, quite a few people that drop out. Commercial is much less at about 15 to 20 percent. The next slide. Mr. Berg, has that um, generated much of a discussion around direct install, knowing that I know it met, you know, yeah. Adele, uh, Haji Khalil, the current GM and others have spoken uh, very strongly about trying to move to that model only because it does take the burden off the household from yeah. having to manage all of that? We've, we've not really thought uh, seriously about a direct install program. Um, it's, it's incredibly costly. So our, our, what we're seeing is the total cost per residential project is six to $8,000 for, for turf removal. And I think the average is about 1,200 square feet of turf removal. Uh, our rebate is only paying for about half of that. So the customer's got a significant outlay of cash themselves. Um, but we, the reason we did the design assistance was to break down barriers for participation. And I don't have a breakout of the dropout rate with design assistance, but it, I'm sure it's it's lower because of that. Appreciate um, that, thank you. And then another concern is if if you do a direct install, and we found this with toilets in the early 90s, if, if, if a water agency installs that toilet, the water agency owns it from the customer's eyes. And so uh, we do need to have a little bit of a separation of responsibility and, and that being one. Um, Helpful, thank so you. smart timers, um, we, we, again, single family is by far the biggest participant, but when we do get commercial customers in the program, there's usually multiple smart timers, for example, in an HOA or a, uh, in another sort of community uh, uh, platform. Um, we've got uh, over 12 million invested in that so far, uh, uh, 93,000 acre feet roughly of savings. Uh, penetration rates are even lower than turf removal. Um, but from a cost effectiveness perspective, smart timers are, are a bigger bang for the buck. Um, and then uh, 
timers are a stormwater capture feature. We've, we did a study that, that measured the reduction of runoff by 50%. Um, we looked at water quality. The pollutants did not concentrate, so we were reducing pollutants by 50%, uh, just with smart timers alone. So uh, if you can take the responsibility out of the homeowner's hands to adjust the schedule, which smart timers do, you're, you're going to make it easier on them as well. And next slide. So my, my kind of takeaways are, are, are focused on kind of the standards framework. I figured I'd seize an opportunity here. And uh, there are many agencies in the state, as, as the, the DWR and Water Board staff mentioned, that are going to be in compliance with the standards. Those agencies are not going to take their foot off the throttle to implement water use efficiency programs. So I think it's important that that volume of savings be recognized in that 500,000 acre foot goal. Um, even with robust programs implemented day in and day out, uh, there are going to be agencies that are going to have a hard time to meet their standard. Um, I, I would hope that if an agency can be seen as putting forth a good faith effort, they have a strong program uh, that, that that would be taken into account. And then um, there's been a huge amount of investments made in landscape. It's it's kind of the turtle and the hare thing, right? That the I'm banking on the on the turtle that slow and steady is going to win the race. Um, so, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Really appreciate these points and uh, the one around uh, just being uh, good about capturing uh, what is the natural. I think in in part um, your your first uh, point there on. Uh, the 500,000 acre foot goal and our actions and how much that would account for. There's a lot of incredible conservation as we've just covered that's already gone on, will continue to go on. So really it is helping kind of frame what is our budget setting trying to do? And I think what you know we think best here, or I'll just say quickly, I know this isn't a conversation all completely about that, but I appreciate your point, is capturing much of that momentum and pushing it a bit and saying, how do we, how do we really continue to? And I, I appreciate the leadership and know that, uh, especially with the pressures on the Colorado and all the ongoing issues we still have yet before us, that uh, the water agency leadership out there is saying, you know, yes, that standard setting is good. We'll continue to do what we are doing, even if you're already meeting it, because it is kind of a journey. And there are systems out there that are a lot further behind and it will take dollars, resources to try to catch them up and we'll have a good conversation around how we, we view all that um, as we go to budget setting. But I just really appreciate those points. So thank you and your leadership both. I uh, really appreciate that. Vice Chair. This is a good discussion. Thank you for taking the time uh, to be here personally today. Um, this is really causing me to look at um, a, a couple of areas that um, Ms. Eli, you, you brought up earlier about um, uh, board member Firestone and I um, asking for some additional information on disadvantaged communities. And so it just, uh, uh, I don't know if this is an accurate statement or not, but looking at areas that are able to take advantage of regional um, programs where it's kind of hard to get a program up and running, if, especially if you haven't had one before. And so just maybe taking a look at um, where there seems to be gaps I know just in sort of my neck of the woods, it appears to be about 50-50, 50% of the agencies, um, their rebates are really focused on indoor only. And then the other half are doing something along the lines of, you know, turf replacement, um, smart uh, irrigation systems, uh, maybe not both. And so I'm just kind of wondering, is it due to a lack of these regional programs um, and what could be done to further incentivize. Um, and so I'm just suggesting maybe having a conversation with the Department of Water Resources because there's the 75 million, but there'll be ongoing um, opportunities. You know, what could be done to help uh, fill those gaps? Would welcome your comments on what I just said. You know, this is just my okay. sense, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, for the, dis as you saw, one of the programs we have for disadvantaged communities is our partnership with SoCal Gas because they know where the disadvantaged communities are. So you'd have, and if you're not in, you know, so we're lucky because we partner with them and they're a great partner. If you are a water utility or a city outside of that and that energy utility didn't partner with you, now you're, 
as you say, you're creating all of this stuff on your own. Um, that's hard, that's a big lift. Um, one of the programs that we've created too is, um, and it, this is kind of interesting because water utilities, depending on where you are, if you're a city, you have different rules. If you're a water agency, it's like in our district, we can't give a higher rebate to somebody based on their income. So what we did, and I didn't show it here because there's many more programs that I didn't <laughs> show you, I didn't, this time is of the essence, but we created a multifamily program. So I was able to go, okay, I can't create a program based on income or where you live, but I can create a program based on a dwelling unit, like a restaurant or something. So I created a multi, or we created a multifamily program. What we do is we make the incentive so high, it's that if you build it, they will come. So the incentive is so high that a contractor will go to a multifamily building and they can take out the old units and put in new units and still, you know, be profitable. So we had to create, we created a separate multifamily program for older multifamily dwellings. And that, we, when we first did it a few years ago, pre-pandemic, we set aside enough funding to do 10,000 units. I'm curious how long that would last. Those 10,000 units lasted like seven minutes. So the res they were reserved by contractors within seven to 15 minutes or something. So when people say that the market's saturated, I have a hard time believing that. So then we set aside 20,000 units the next time we did it and they were reserved in 20 minutes. So then the pandemic came and we're starting up again. And so it's a program where we are, we're going into uh, multifamily dwellings because there's really, if you are in an apartment, you can't change the product. A lot of landlords don't change it. So we, you know, basically now this is free, so we're changing it. But there's still a lot out there. I mean, if when we're doing 20,000 units at a time, that's four to five million dollars, and it gets used up in 20 minutes, half hour, it, it's hard to sustain that. So we do that, try to do that every year, um, and we keep upping the number, because I'm hoping one day we'll issue it, and it'll take a while <laughs> to actually implement, but right now it's still going like that. And I can add another example, and, and this is, because of a uh, program Bill hasn't mentioned yet is the leak detection grant. Um, we were awarded a $100,000 grant uh, from Bill to do leak detection, and every one of the MET member agencies was, was offered that, that grant. And uh, MODOC started a shared services program, so we built a whole new division of staff focused on distribution system water loss. So we have staff that does d leak detection, our retail water agencies contract with us to do their leak detection on their systems. We report to them where the leaks are and then they repair the leaks. With Bill's grant, I focused those uh, miles on disadvantaged communities. And so we were not only finding leaks on the water agency system, but we're finding leaks on the customer side of the meter as well. And that's water flowing through the meter that, that's getting billed to that customer. And so, um, we do meter accuracy testing, would we do system flushing, we do suspected leak investigations, um, and then we have a whole separate technical assistance program where we have a contractor available uh, that specializes in water loss and can help the agencies with their annual water balance and strategizing for uh, leak recovery and that kind of thing. So uh, just another program Bill has that, well, that's making a difference. Out it kind of goes to that, we couldn't do that regionally, so we wanted to do leak detection, so how do you do that? Well, you have funding available for the agencies, and it's not every agency raises a hand and, and utilizes the funding either. Anaheim, Fullerton, and Santa Ana are direct MET member agencies. Santa Ana and Anaheim are contracting with MODOC to, with that grant to do leak detection on their systems. In fact, we're starting Anaheim, I think, uh, in the next week or so. Incredible and exciting and innovative work, it really is. Um, and, you know, the demand side of that is uh, that those are businesses, those are jobs, uh, ultimately. These are investments that are really just continue to drive uh, an industry that will only continue to grow in these next years because of the pressures, uh, you know, 
way you're not um, on on our systems in the long term. So just thank you. I really appreciated this space. And but board member and also board member McGuire, I I can see you here in front of us as well in case you <laughs> make a comment. So thank you so much. Um, really amazing, amazing, um, and grateful for you to come here and talk today about the work that you all have been doing for decades in some cases. Um, uh, I'm just curious, you all are wholesalers, so you may not, have you gotten um, estimates from DWR on the irrigated um, acreage within your service areas? And is there a way to know what, how much of that landscape has been transformed up till now? We're working on that. Um, we attempted to use 2009 LIDAR data, uh, not, not LIDAR, um, oh, the, it, it, uh, the name of it just slipped my mind. It's an acronym. But it's through, I believe, the Department of Ag nationally flies imagery. So we looked at that imagery on a parcel by parcel basis. We weren't comfortable that it was accurate. But if you aggregate it, it becomes those errors go away. Um, we're analyzing that right now to quantify that by retail water agency. And, and like Bill, we're, we're really starting to look at the uh, measurement of the the dedicated irrigation meters and through that process we're defining what's uh, functional and what's not functional so that's a work in progress great thanks thank you both board member mcguire okay nothing to add great thank you thank you uh, all again for the good discussion and really appreciate the participation and board member morgan's request here and the good tracking Ms. Ely, of our various requests uh, for the work so Thanks again. We'll chat and be talking about us all uh, again very soon. So really appreciate it. That concludes item number three and this informational item. We're going to, I'm going to go ahead and flag. We'll take a late lunch. Um, I want to get into item number four before breaking for a lunch. So we will um, get into the presentation and discussion. Uh, try to take a few folks that can't hang over lunch and try to, I, I will ask, um, at the appropriate moment for commenters that aren't able to hold over uh, through the lunch if um, they could raise their hand and we'll identify you at the appropriate moment. I want to flag all that now for everyone's planning. So um, we'll go ahead and transition here into item number four. Uh, and as we do as well, uh, we have an uh, announcement to make on inter uh, translation first uh, and want to kick it over to, uh, I believe it's Mike Gutierrez, who will be uh, our uh, translator today. Thank you, Chair Esquivel. Uh, para aquellos que nos uh, acompañan, sea por medio de Zoom o en persona, queremos dejar de saber que hay interpretación al vivo disponible para la sesión de hoy. Para escuchar el programa en español, por favor, seleccione el icono del globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla que dice Interpretation. Luego seleccione su idioma Spanish o Español. De ahí podrá escuchar el programa totalmente en español. También hay la opción de escuchar por medio de nuestro webcast al vivo Lo, lo cual puede encontrar en el sitio calepa.ca.gov. Y también puede elegir en qué idioma desea ver la presentación. Vaya a la parte superior de su pantalla y seleccione el botón que dice View Options, luego Screen Share, y de ahí podrá seleccionar Presentación en Español para esta parte del programa. Gracias. And please note, for those on Zoom or in the room, interpretation services are being offered for this portion of the session. To listen to comments or questions given in Spanish, please select the globe icon at the bottom of your screen that says interpretation, and then select your language English, and you'll be able to hear a live rendering of that comment into English. You can also choose in which language you'd like to view the presentation. Please scroll to the top of your screen and select the button that says view options, then screen share, and you can select the English presentation. Thank you so much. Back to you, Chair Esquivel. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. I appreciate your part, our uh, participation and, importantly, your services today and ensuring that we have um, adequate participation and access uh, through interpretation. So thank you. Um, I, I want to I will kick it over to Celia to, to begin uh, the presentation in a moment. But I think here at the top, just have to acknowledge, um, and I, I think I, I do this each time we have our racial equity discussion, uh, how sometimes very personal and difficult these conversations can be. Um, the challenges that we face uh, around racial equity as a society um, touch very deeply to many of the lived experiences that we all have collectively. And so just ask for a lot of grace 
um, but importantly, just want to acknowledge and thank the incredible work that's gone on, the professionalism uh, and the depth of, of, of um, commitment uh, that so many have brought to this work, both internal to our organization and importantly external to it as well. Uh, it means a lot to be able to handle a conversation that isn't very easy, I know, like I said, uh, for, for anyone really um, in, in, in our society right now, let alone um, how best we as a very bureaucratic agency uh, really kind of gather ourselves together um, and, and provide uh, our important interpretation of how we recommit ourselves to what isn't work that just appeared a year ago or two years ago or here uh, we're reminded with uh, acknowledgement of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and, and, and the commitment of, of his life's work here um, that we're just re-embracing what are common themes that have been part of the even founding of this board 50 years ago but so many critical conversations at the national level that were about environmental justice and racial equity and the nexus between um, how we continue to live up to what are uh, the ideals, if not um, the real history uh, of commitment to uh, racial equity amongst us in our communities. So just thank you from a very personal seat um, and would hand it over to Ms. Passos for um, a deep dive into the item now. Or, I, or Eileen, I, I apologize, <laughs> Ms. Sobeck, I actually yeah. hand it over to you for, you. for no. comment. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Chair Escobar. And I, I do, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud that we're presenting um, this uh, racial equity uh, action plan to you all today. And I do think it's uh, quite appropriate that it's done the week uh, that we're celebrating the Martha, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, holiday. It has been a challenging but a really rich um, process, as you noted, and it has really, it has taken longer, as, as many things that we do, longer than we hoped, but I do believe that it is better, a better uh, plan because of it. Just like the strategic work plan that, that um, the board will be looking at later this afternoon, this is not an action item, but that doesn't mean that it's not an important board document. Uh, it has, it, it, uh, represents a lot of input from a lot of parties, many people in this room, many people watching on, online, uh, many people who are planning to comment, many of our own employees, um, and especially the members of our racial uh, equity team. It does reflect um, the input from board members. We have breached, briefed each of you individually and we expect to hear more from you uh, today. And so we as staff take very seriously uh, what is contained? What will be contained in this in this plan? And that we will be planning our work um, accordingly. And we assume that if and and hope that if we are not uh, living up to the expectations set out in this plan, that we will be letting you know why that happened and how it and when it happens. And we'll be getting feedback back from you on a regular basis about our efforts to live up to uh, the goals that and objectives that we've set in this in this document. It is really exciting to be here at this pivot point where we move to um, explicit implementation. There have been a lot of great conversations. We've said multiple times we aren't, um, we, we are implementing, uh, we are looking at our work through a racial equity lens, but we have set out some very discrete actions here that we are gonna um, start into uh, the implementation phase. And a lot of people who spend a lot of time on the planning process will now be available to consult, uh, provide advice, and actually do the hands-on work of implementation. And that's, that's really important. Going from planning to implementation is really what it's all about. So I think this is a pivotal, a pivotal moment. Um, and as we are at this pivotal moment, I do want to thank, again, especially the members of the racial equity team, past and present. They've really uh, gone above and beyond. Their um, supervisors have given them the opportunity to to do this as part of their work time. This is not other duties as assigned. Uh, but we all know that um, when you're working on something that you're passionate about, you do, do go above and beyond. And I believe um, the members of the team um, have all done that. Um, in addition to the executive leadership that's been provided by Nefertari Cooley, Adriana Renteria, uh, Stephen Kahina, and, and others um, who've participated. I do want to note that um, 
like any other planning document, new challenges will come up that we hadn't anticipated. Um, I think especially in this arena where we don't have a lot of experience, this is the first um, iteration of our plan. And so I expect that there will be a few bumps in the road and um, we'll make changes um, during the way. Um, again, as with our strategic work plan for other board um, work, not every single thing that we're going to be doing in the realm of applying a racial equity lens is reflected in this action plan. I really expect uh, everybody in the board to be um, bringing the racial equity lens to everything that we do. The whole purpose of this plan and the planning phase was to think about, talk about how we move from, how, how we change the culture of how we look at things. And that we don't just check the box on racial equity or think about it after the fact but that we, in, fa in fact, from the very beginning, think about where it is best applied, whether we have considered um, options, and we don't close off avenues for exploration um, um, of equity options um, at the very earliest stages of our work. So I, I, again, as with any plan, unless it were encompassed every single thing that every part of our organization we're gonna do, which is prohibitive, there's going to be, I hope, I expect, I anticipate, and I know that we're gonna be doing lots of work beyond what's um, captured in this plan. We are going to phase out the uh, racial equity team at the end of February. They have done a great job of fulfilling the very specific tasks that we asked them to do. We really look forward to the members, past and present of that group, participating um, in their uh, regular job capacity to help make sure, to keep us honest, to keep us on the right path to help their, uh, their colleagues, their supervisors, their, uh, their, the, the folks that they do supervise to implement the plan. The, uh, we already have a very strong Office of Public Participation, which is where the primary responsibility for environmental justice uh, rests. And uh, the leader of that office, Adriana Renteria, has done a fantastic job, she and her team. Um, we're gonna continue to look for them, to them to make adjustments within their, um, within their organization to make sure that the racial equity um, um, uh, progress that we've made is reflected in their organization and in their staffing. And very soon we will be um, advertising two new positions within that office uh, that will help us deal with the additional uh, attention that we've been given to racial, uh, we've given to racial equity. So I really look forward to that. I do think it's very important to uh, regularize and integrate racial equity into all of the work we do. <clears throat> I think that we've gone through this lengthy process to make sure that that is not just um, a perfunctory business as usual process, but that uh, we need to make sure that um, every, every supervisor, every executive leader, and every office uh, takes this very significant matter into consideration and in, in doing their job. And I think you will see this today as we discuss um, the action plan. Um, instead of just having, we, we, are gonna, we are welcoming the um, remarks by the racial equity team, but we're gonna have presentations and discussions by executive leadership of the various parts of the board that will be responsible for these actions. And I think part of that is to just demonstrate that the executive team um, took part, learned a lot, um, took a lot of um, information in that was provided by the racial equity team and public comments that they um, participated, reviewed, and um, helped with input um, into the, the action plan itself, and that they understand that they, and that they will give um, priority to these actions and that will, they will be responsible for their implementation. So, um, with, with that, I just, um, I will say that we have um, a lot of work ahead. We know this isn't perfect. We're going to keep working on it. Um, and I really look up, look forward to us all rolling up our collective sleeves and um, getting on with the work of the board in this new and improved way. And with that, I will turn it over to Celia Passos. And I, I do wanna just note that Celia has, has um, led the, uh, the process of putting together this um, the state water board's racial equity plan, and Celia works for a region, and I think that just shows the um, the benefits of having having had the racial equity team have such a um, a diverse membership in terms of 
the types of positions um, that people have and brought to their role and the fact that we did include the regions because we know that our work is integrated with, with what the regions did. So um, with that, Celia, thank you so much. Thank you, Director Sobeck. And I have to acknowledge as well uh, the chairs uh, of the Regional Water Quality Control Boards, uh, which uh, to, to your point with Ms. Pazos here, um, this has been an effort, uh, not just at the state board, but a water board's wide discussion and really acknowledge their, their leadership as well uh, in the capacity of their own regional boards. So thank you. Ms. Pazos. Sure, thank you. Next slide. It's an intro slide. Okay. <laughs> Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Eileen, for your opening remarks, and thank you for the words. Um, we're going to get really deep into the action plan today and the planning process. Um, my name is Celia Pazos. I'm here today to present the 2023-2025 State Water Board Racial Equity Action Plan. The action plan is a compilation of goals, actions, and metrics intended to advance the State Water Board's racial equity efforts. So we've alluded to it a little bit, but this is a major milestone for the water boards. We are so excited to be sharing the final draft with you today. Um, next slide, please. So just to piggyback off everything that has been said already um, before jumping into the heart of the presentation, the racial equity team wants to extend a huge thank you to everyone who helped shape this plan, who shared their thoughts, time, and resources to develop the plan. As we developed the racial equity resolution in 2020, we heard from the public that the action plan should be developed in partnership with black, indigenous, and people of color communities most impacted by racial inequities. We heard that and we did our best to incorporate all of that. So it took many people to get us here today. So thank you to our community members who attended public workshops or listening sessions, those who emailed our, their thoughts and priorities, community leaders who shared their stories and experiences with us. There were folks who retweeted or shared our social media, folks who attended board meetings and submitted formal public comment, and then our community partners who helped develop and host the public workshops we had in July. So thank you. And before we leave the thank you, we wanna thank Waterboard staff because it took a whole bunch of staff <laughs> to get us here today. So thank you to Waterboard staff who came together to ensure that this plan match, matches the assets and opportunities in the communities we're aiming to serve. The Waterboard's racial equity team, our executive team, board members, executive management, um, regional board members, the Environmental Justice Roundtable, and I can go on and on just listing staff from all of the departments that helped us get here. So thank you to everyone. Next slide, please. Okay. So the agenda for today is on the, um, for the presentations on the screen. I'm going to start off with some background on the Water Board's racial equity work and discuss the racial equity action plan development process. Then we'll go over the action plan structure. And um, like Eileen mentioned, division and office leadership are going to present and discuss their lead role actions. Then we'll finish with questions and discussion. Next slide. So starting off with some background. Next slide, please. So the state water board and the nine regional water boards, collectively the water boards, have a shared mission to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of California's water resources and drinking water. <coughs> this mission is strengthened by a commitment to, to racial equity and environmental justice. The water boards acknowledge and condemn inequities past and present in water quality, access, and affordability, and are proactively working to eliminate the structures and practices that perpetuate these inequities. The water boards have made racial equity a priority we acknowledge our historic role in creating inequitable outcomes and are committed to addressing and changing them. We also acknowledge the perpetuation of inequities in our workplace and are working to address them. Next slide. So the State Water Board's racial equity vision is a California where race no longer predicts a person's access to or quality of water resources Water board employees at all organizational levels reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of California, and a racial equity lens is consistently applied to water board's decision-making processes. So applying a racial equity lens means that the water boards will conduct and incorporate racial equity analysis in their work by considering questions like, how, much Cal how must California water laws, regulations, and policies be implemented and enforced to ensure that race no longer predicts access to or quality of water resources. 
that was a long example, but there's another, um, by this we mean um, an example would include um, using demographic mapping tools to identify vulnerable communities most impacted by pollution and then to prioritize inspections or site cleanups in those communities. Um, this vision was developed during the visioning workshop we held on May 3rd, 2022. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, that workshop included water board staff, tribal representatives, and community representatives. So that workshop and today's presentation of the action plan are just one milestone along our racial equity journey. Next slide. Okay. So beginning in 2016, and just to note, all of this work is still ongoing. So in 2016, the State Water Board adopted the Human Right to Water Resolution and also several regional water boards adopted their own human right to water resolutions afterwards. The human right to water recognizes that every person in California has a right to safe, clean, and affordable water for human cons consumption, cooking, and sanitary purposes. In 2017, the State Water Board adopted definitions for tribal beneficial uses in basin plans. And in 2019, the water boards adopted the tribal consultation policy. Strengthening the, water, strengthening the Water Board's commitment to meaningful tribal engagement. In 2019, the SAFER program was established. SAFER is a set of tools, funding resources, and regulatory, author, regulatory authorities designed to ensure that Californians who currently lack safe drinking water receive safe and affordable drinking water as quickly as possible. The SAFER program also aims to reach sustainable operations for all of the state's drinking water systems and is a critical element for achieving the goals of safe and accessible and affordable water for all Californians. Next slide. In 2018, the water boards joined the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, and the Cal EPA Advancing Racial Equity team. In 2020, water board staff presented a framework for addressing racial equity as an informational item to the state water board. The board acknowledged the historic effects of institutional racism that must be confronted throughout government and directed staff to develop a priority plan of action. In the fall of 2020, um, our executive director, Eileen Sobeck, established a racial equity team to advance this work. The Water Board's racial equity team is comprised of Water Board staff representing all levels of the organization, including support staff, engineers, scientists, technologists, and executives. The racial equity team was tasked with three major priorities. One, to establish a foundation of internal and external engagement that values listening and collaboration to drive action. Two, to draft a resolution on racial equity to be considered for adoption by the State Water Board and to be leveraged by the nine regional water boards. And three, to develop racial equity strategies and action plans to drive efforts for the coming years. So the racial equity team began that first charge in 2020 November and December of that year, the racial equity team began developing the resolution by hosting public listening sessions to inform the development. Next slide. So the State Water Board made a huge step by adopting the racial equity resolution on November 16, 2021. The racial equity resolution connects the dots between systemic racism and how we do our jobs every day and lays the foundation of accountability moving forward. The three primary goals of the resolution are one, to acknowledge and condemn systemic racism and its effects, two, to institutionalize racial equity, and three, direct staff to act by developing a racial equity action plan. So in 2022, the water boards began developing a racial equity action plan. That development extended through 2022, which brings us here today, January 2023, presenting the final plan. Next slide. So let's talk about it. <laughs> Next slide, please. So as I just mentioned, the racial equity resolution included several directives for water board staff. The resolution stated that the action plan must outline steps that the water boards would take to normalize conversations about racial equity, foster a workforce that competently integrates racial equity into its work, effectively reach and engage with black, indigenous, and people of color communities to benefit those we aim to serve, and additionally, the plan was to be developed within one year of adoption of the resolution. It was to be metric driven in order to evaluate our progress. And it was to incorporate all state water board divisions, offices, and programs to address all aspects of our work. Regional boards are taking the lead to create their own ac action plan directives as they have with the racial equity resolution. Next slide.
So the racial equity team developed the action plan based on input from um, the water boards, as well as tribal governments and the public. In April, the water boards began government to government tribal consultations on the action plan development. In May, we held visioning and strategizing workshops where water board staff and community leaders came together to develop our, our racial equity vision, which was shown in an earlier slide, and also to develop draft actions for the plan. We also held a series of action planning workshops where the state water board staff and management and regional board executive management met to further develop draft action ideas. Also in the spring, office, the Office of Public Participation staff and racial equity team members held one-on-one -on -one meetings with our community partners to plan, develop, and ultimately host the action planning workshops we had in July. Many community partners also met with OPP staff and our diversity, equity, and inclusion consultants to discuss the plan's development. In June, we had an internal employee listening session where participants discussed and considered the question, what actions should be included in the REAP, in the action plan? <laughs> and feedback was connect collected anonymously. Next slide. As I mentioned, in July of 2022, the racial equity team partnered with the Office of Public Participation and Community Leaders to host four public workshops. A version of the draft action ideas document was shared with the public in mid-July prior to these workshops. The workshops were held, were held to ensure community priorities and strengths were incorporated into the action plan. The workshops began with board member remarks, followed by community storytelling and a staff presentation. Participants broke into small groups, both online and in person, to review and discuss the draft actions and identify which most resonated with them. Next slide, please. In August, the racial equity team categorized and, sh and sorted all, the, uh, all of the ideas from the workshops, the July public workshops and the May workshops to draft the racial equity action plan. So again, during this process, we considered both public and employee feedback. And also some of the comments we received during the resolution development process were integrated into the draft action plan. So the racial equity team uh, sorted all these comments and worked with division and office leadership to integrate them into a draft plan. And then we released that draft for a 30-day public comment on September 23rd, 2022. A board workshop was held on October 19th, 2022, where staff presented the draft action plan. Verbal comments were also heard during that workshop. And then on October 24th, we closed the public comment period. We workshop reviewed and finalized the action plan through December of 2022. Next slide. And sorry to interrupt Ms. Puzzles as you transition. I just wanna note on the technical side for folks that are viewing through the YouTube live webcast, um, you're seeing just the Spanish version of the presentation. That's something that we elevated up to Zoom, an issue that we can't control unfortunately, but we will have the link there on the YouTube live site to the English uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and that will also be available on our website just for folks that are experiencing that on the YouTube uh, stream. And I will say that the Cali PA webcast is um, functioning with its two separate streams. So there's an English language broadcast, which is showing the English PowerPoint. And it also has the Spanish language broadcast, which is showing the Spanish language PowerPoint. So if, if you're on YouTube live and you wanna see uh, an English PowerPoint, you could always jump over to the Cali PA webcast and that's provided in the notices. Thank you, Mr. Laffer. Thank you, Ms. Pazos. I just Thanks, wanted Seth. people that were on the cast to not be feel frustrated by that. Thank yes, you. Yes, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so we're going to, uh, during the 30-day uh, comment period, the State Water Board received 47 sets of comments from the public and 32 cents, sets of comments from staff. Most of the comments received expressed general support or opposition to the Water Board's racial equity work, and many requested clarification, more details, or suggested language, which we'll talk about in the next slides. Next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> so summarizing some of the common themes. We heard many comments about resources. Where will resources come from to support the work and ensure it is ongoing? This was addressed in the action plan by adding the letter R to the stage column to identify where resources are gonna be needed. Also actions requiring resources are still included in the plan. Some actions were added to the future action section. The draft we released in September did not include metrics. So we received many co public comments about accountability and how we will measure our success as the plan is implemented. 
Division and office leadership develop metrics for 2023 actions, and those are included in the plan. Also, this racial equity action plan will be assessed annually with an annual update to the board in a form similar to this one as an informational item. And also several new actions were added to ensure we are held accountable. Next slide. We heard that tribes are sovereign nations that have used and in some cases continue to use water to support their cultural, spiritual, ceremonial, and or traditional rights. Each tribe has unique water needs and perspectives and engagement in consultation should be meaningful and in alignment with our tribal consultation policy, not just a check the box exercise. To address this, several actions were added to strategic direction three, and some of these actions will be presented in detail in a later portion of this presentation. We also heard that expanding and prioritizing funds for community capacity building was a major priority for black indigenous and people of color communities. Based on this, there's a 2023 action under strategic direction three to develop a community capacity building pilot fund. Next slide. We received many comments about in-stream flow requirements and how they may negatively impact BIPOC communities, tribal beneficial uses, cultural resources, and related ecosystems. Many specified the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan implementation. To address this, the Division of Water Rights modified their lead role action under Goal 1B and added a new action to address these concerns. Again, we're going to hear from the Division on these actions in a later portion of this presentation. Next slide. Several changes were made to the draft action plan after we closed the public comment. So after close of public comment in October, Water Board staff revised the action plan to make the actions more specific and measurable. The draft action plan that was released for public comment in September included three action types, A, B, and C, based on whether the action was new or had resources. So those previous action types helped Water Board staff prioritize actions based on public feedback. And in this plan, all, action, all actions are now categorized into two types. So those two types are actions for 2023, those are actions that will start, continue, or be completed in 2023, and then there are future actions, actions that will not start, continue, or be completed in 2023. All actions will be assessed during the annual update and may be modified as other actions are completed. Next slide. The action stages have been revised to reflect ongoing Water Board's racial equity work. The September draft included a zero as a stage, and we've since removed that. And as mentioned in prior slides, the letter R was added to the stages to identify actions that require resources. The challenge statements were updated to highlight where water boards have ongoing work, racial equity work. And the plan now includes performance indicators for each 2023 action. Due to the diversity of actions included in this plan, measurements of success include metrics, milestones, data, and other indicators that can be used to indicate successful completion of actions or to track progress towards actions over time. Performance indicators have been developed for each 2023 action, but some actions require performance measures or counts, such as the number of staff or the number of outreach events to establish a baseline to assess the action's progress over time. Next slide. So getting into the action plan structure, the action plan has four main parts, the vision, strategic directions, goals, and actions. So number one is the vision, which we've talked about in a couple slides, is overarching. It lets us know where we wanna end up. Number two are the strategic directions. Those clarify how we will achieve our vision. For example, the first strategic, strategic direction is integrating racial equity and measuring impact. So how will we achieve our vision? One way is by integrating racial equity and measuring impact. The goals are broad outcomes we are aiming to achieve. Each strategic direction has two or three goals or outcomes. And then under each goal is a list of actions. And those are the what. That's what we should do to achieve our goals. Each action is assigned to a lead division or office who will take the lead role in implementing the action. And that's another layer of accountability. Next slide. So some more details about the actions. The actions are intended to be assessed annually in a board up, update, again, similar to this forum. Each action is categorized either as an action for 2023, those that will start, continue, or be completed in 2023, or future actions, 
those that will not start, continue, or be completed in 2023. Each action is assigned to a division or office who will take the lead or supporting role in implementing the action and is also assigned a stage as of the end of 2022 that will be used to measure and evaluate progress in the future. Performance indicators have been developed for 2023 actions. Performance indicators are quantitative performance measures and qualitative targets to assess progress and monitor each action success. Future actions and the entire action plan may be modified in an annual assessment. Next slide. So that summarizes the action plan development process and the structure. And as we've been um, mentioned, the division office representatives will now be presenting actions where they are assigned the lead role. Division and office leadership will share a few of their actions and discuss how the action will advance racial equity and what kind of impact we expect the action will have. So a reminder to our pres presenters, I have this note for them, <laughs> um, to please speak slowly and pause for interpreters and to cue the next slide for Courtney. Um, so that with that, I'm gonna pass it, we're starting off with Nefertiri Cooley, our Deputy Director for the Water Board's Communications Office. Good morning, board members. Good morning. Or good afternoon morning. now, afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> and good afternoon, everybody. I'm well, gonna be super morning. excited to be here just wearing my racial equity team had I um, echo all of the thank yous and expressions of gratitude that I heard this morning because it really has been um, a labor of love and it's very uh, motivating, encouraging, empowering, empowering to see how many folks have been rooting for us and how we have worked together even through the opposition that we've received to doing this work. So with that, I will put on my um, Deputy Director of Communications Office hat and get started on our presentation. I'm gonna rely on notes so that I don't forget things. Um, I want to mention that I'm actually going to be covering the action items for the Communications Office, the Office of Public Affairs, and the Office of Public Participation, which are included in the Communications Office. We do have a Director Jackie Carpenter here, who of course leads OPA, and Director Adriana Renteria, who leads OPP. Um, and Adriana has to get going a little bit early today, so if you end up with questions about her actions, it would be great if maybe we could cover those here while we have her brain trust, okay? Okay, so before I dig in, I recognize that there are people um, listening today who have no idea what our office does, and so I want to read our mission statement, which gives um, some insight into that, and also, of course, complements and advances the Water Board's mission statement. The communications office believes information sharing and public engagement are integral to the water board's mission and to advancing environmental justice and racial equity. We listen to the wisdom of Californians and Native American tribes, inform them about the board's work directly and through the media, and facilitate opportunities for accessible and equitable inclusion in the board's decision-making processes. So with that, I am going to go ahead and dig into our action items. Um, I'm not gonna cover them all. We pulled some out that we think are especially important to share today. So starting with the communications office, next slide please. So this particular action item is about the accountability that we heard today, making sure that our website offers a home so that we're sharing information where we hold ourselves accountable and those who are invested in this work, including um, partners, BIPOC communities, you know, those impacted by our work can actually see the progress that we're making on our action plan implementation. Next slide, please. So in the board meetings that I've listened to, and I'm sure those of you who have been around even longer than I, we often hear that the process to provide public comment at our meetings, to understand our um, decision-making processes can be challenging, especially for those who are not as familiar with um, the work that we do and how we do it. And so this particular action is really about hearing that feedback and doing something about it and trying to, working to um, make the instructions and the information on our website in particular more accessible. And this action, as well as the prior action, of course, our team will be doing with um, the Division of Information Technology in partnership. 
Now I'm going to move forward, next slide please, um, to tell you about the Office of Public Affairs Racial Equity Actions. Next slide. So one of the things that we've talked about as being important to truly advance racial equity in our area is to broaden our idea of what the media is, to broaden um, our reach in terms of who we collaborate with, who we share story opportunities with, who we provide interviews with. And so to do that um, takes another level of awareness and intentionality. And so this action is about really cultivating relationships um, with multi-language uh, media and BIPOC communities so that we can better not only form those relationships, but of course through relationship you then have the opportunity to share information in a way that's more meaningful and to better contextualize that information. Next slide please. And the second one is complementary. So we certainly have our list that we keep of media that we're reaching out to. And it sometimes feels like it's the usual suspects, not only that we're reaching out to, right, but who are coming to us. And so we need to do some legwork. And that legwork, we don't wanna do by ourselves. We wanna really go to the folks who um, have some knowledge about how we can expand who we are reaching out to and then add those to our media contacts list. So again, these two actions complement one another and this action in particular, the Office of Public Affairs will collaborate with our Office of Public Participation to do. Next slide, please. I'm gonna move us on to the Office of Public Participation now. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so finalize language access guidance document and deliver training. This is really about providing clarity to our water board's employees on best practices and legal requirements. Um, I think oftentimes staff have the will to provide language access services in relationship to their work, whether that be translation or interpretation, but they're not always aware of the nuances um, that go into considering when it's appropriate to provide those services, the best way to deliver those services, um, and really to create equity, right? Because if we have some folks who are able to access what we're providing and some folks who are not, we're not really achieving equity. So that's what this particular action item is about. Next slide, please. Um, so we just did a lot of work on this action, so that's why you'll see this particular one is at stage three. This year, through Office of Public Participation's facilitation pool, they created a new cohort of trainees who we took through the racial equity training and certified to become new racial equity trainers at the water boards. And so we now have 10 certified racial equity trainers at the water boards. As part of their certification process, they trained 150 Water Boards employees, and we are looking forward to this year officially launching racial equity training for staff at the Water Boards and training even more Water Boards employees. Um, as we know, training is so essential because it's an, another area where you may have the will to do the work, but you really need the tools that help support that work happening in a way that's effective and that's meaningful. Um, so yes, next slide please. So this particular action item is about capacity building with our staff um, and others when it comes to outreach and engagement plans. Uh, Office of Public Participation excels at this and it's an opportunity for them to share their knowledge and their experience with others so that when we are engaging with the public, with our tribal um, uh, governments, our tribal partnerships, that we're really mindful of what are, the, what are the best ways to engage and how can we make sure that we're not perpetuating inequities, that we're not doing further damage and we're actually bringing folks in and giving them an opportunity, um, a better opportunity to be part of our processes. Next slide, please. Okay, so this one is about um, developing a community capacity, excuse me, <coughs> a community capacity building um, 
pilot fund to compensate tribal and BIPOC community partners. This action involves with engaging with the public. So it's a, it's a thing that it's going to be tried out, right? We want to make sure that while this is an idea that it's um, implemented and developed effectively, and it's about removing barriers to engagement and, again, not creating unintended consequences with the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the final one that I'm going to share with you, and this is about the Tribal Affairs webpage so that we are being transparent with the current um, tribal consultation opportunities for water board projects. Um, you'll see AB 52 mentioned there, and I just, you know, as a communicator, I'm always mindful people may not know what that means, so I'm just going to share briefly that it was passed by the legislature in 2014 and amended the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, to require lead agencies to consider the potential impacts that a project subject to CEQA's requirements will have on tribal resources. And pursuant to AB 52, lead agencies must consult with tribes traditionally and culturally affiliated with the geographic area of any proposed project that is subject to CEQA review. This um, action is not going to replace our existing tribal consultation policy, but as I said, it's about increasing transparency and expanding the opportunity as well for tribes to learn about and engage in our efforts. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pause. We had planned to just go speaker to speaker, but again, if you have any questions for Adriana, I'd like to give her an opportunity to respond to those. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cooley. And I just have to acknowledge just your personal leadership, uh, dedication and professionalism, um, and that, the hallmarks of that leadership throughout this work. And I know this has been an incredible group effort, um, but uh, your, your hand at the helm of a lot of this um, has provided uh, just a great comfort for me because I don't think there's anyone else that have, could have uh, contributed as, as you have to this in such a, an incredible way. I mean, the, there isn't, there aren't, uh, this is so bleeding edge that there isn't a lot out there. So um, you've actually been um, just an incredible contributor to this, and I just have to acknowledge that. So just thank you. Thank you. Board Member Firestone. Yeah, I want to um, echo that. Thanks. Um, I, I, this is really comments on the amazing work that you all have done and the importance of it. Um, you know, my first experience with the water boards um, was when um, an, when we organized um, and helped bring up, um, you know, uh, many vans full of folks that didn't have safe water to the Central Valley Water Board up in Rancho Cordova. And um, uniform cops were called to provide security for the meeting. And actually, Bill Jennings um, was the um, one that stood up and said, you know, I've been coming to Central Valley board meetings, and cops have never been called. And um, you know, what's different now is that there's people of color. And um, I think we've come a long way from then, and, and actually pretty quickly that was changed. This was a long time ago. Um, but I think that goes to the fact that um, we, we often don't realize that we are um, not creating a space and environment where people are welcome. Um, and uh, so looking at um, investing really intentionally in um, training guidance and resources so that um, black, indigenous, and communities of color are able to not just participate in an environment um, and meaningfully, but, but be valued um, is really, I think, a transformation and vital to achieving our work at the board. Um, and, and so I just want to acknowledge the importance of the the work that particularly the communications offices, I think, are, are have a lot of vital um, expertise in helping us achieve that vision. Um, and, uh, you know, lastly, I'll just say um, one of I, I, one of the things that um, is 
has been very clear to me in my work over the years is how important it is to, to kind of put our money where our mouth is on these things. Um, I do feel like the, the capacity building pilot program is one that is vital to really supporting meaningful participation. Um, we can create processes and space, but if we're not supporting folks to be able to meaningfully participate, um, we're also not achieving our goal. So I, um, I just really wanted to say my thanks and value for the work that you all have been doing and, um, and for just the intentionality and importance um, going forward. And um, thank you to, for your leadership and the leadership of the um, racial equity team. Thank you, board member. Thank you, Ms. Cooley, and thank you, Ms. Mentoria. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Okay, my name is Lucy Aneri, and I'm the Human Resources Branch here, here for the Division of Administrative Services, or also known as DAS. Um, DAS's role is to support uh, the board's programs, divisions, and offices, and all personal related matters, um, which also includes racial equity and diversity inclusion. All 12 DAS actions include racial equity plan, include a number of items. Um, today, I'm going to focus mainly on the recruitment efforts. Most of the AS's um, action primarily involve the human resources branch in those actions. Next slide, please. The actions identified by DAS um, are increased recruitment for job um, opening internships, opportunities, establishing partnerships for both colleges and universities, um, as well as multicultural organizations on those um, colleges and universities. Um, also involve regional boards, programs, divisions, and offices in those recruitment efforts as it relates to racial equity and diversity inclusion. Um, our performance indicators, um, DAS plans to continue to track this information by collecting data on impact report that DAS will be sharing um, in the upcoming days with all of the water boards. Um, for example, our 2022 impact report currently reflects we have and implemented the following items an outreach request form that allows us to identify the recruitment needs for the water boards programs, programs and implement diversity inclusion practices at the front end of recruitment process, including our outreach with multi multicultural organizations. Second will be the career fairs. We attended 14 career fairs in the spring of 2022 and 23 career fairs in the fall of 2022 at colleges and universities with diverse, with diverse um, student population. Um, we also plan to attend an additional 17 job fairs in the winter and early spring of 2023. This is particularly important for the, particularly important for DAS, not just to brand our organization and make the Wadworth the employer of choice, but also a directly, um, directly impacts our initiative to diversity and inclusion and racial equity by engaging with students from various um, backgrounds. We've also made student connections, made a total of th about 342 student connections. These are students particularly interested in either obtaining um, employment with the water boards or um, upon completion of their um, graduation or um, a, um, a paid, in paid or non-paid internship um, for to meet their academic requirements. Next slide, please. Finally, for 2023, DAS will continue to, to promote diversity, inclusion, and racial equity by one, updating the recruitment portion of the Water Awards website. This state, um, this particular is the state hiring process is often seen as a complicated and bureaucratic um, process. While we cannot um, change this process immediately because of the various statutory requirements, including the state hiring process. We can provide tools and resources to potentially candidates to help them better understand and navigate this complex process. We believe this will help job seekers understand the specific actions that they need to take to apply for jobs here at the water boards. Next slide, please. Finally, um, we know we're going to focus on promote diversity ownership opportunities. This is by establishing um, continuous internship and volunteer opportunities, including youth aides. Um, these are high school students. 
um, with every program, program with the statewide awards for students of underrepresented communities. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, this commitment from uh, Division of Administrative Services. I know um, when I first came to the board, uh, there wasn't yet an internship program, and I know uh, Eric Oppenheimer, I appreciated making, uh, along with uh, John Russell and folks at DAS, a priority to, to set up a paid internship program. Um, these, all these actions are just incredible and real important commitments to creating the right pipeline, um, as you said, of, of folks coming to the board. So just thank you. I really appreciate this commitment from DAS. Any comments from board members? And uh, board member McGuire, just raise your hand as well. I'll, I can see you here. Okay, thank you. Mr. Paul Hamas. Good afternoon, board members. Darren Paul Hamas, Deputy Director for the Division of Drinking Water. Certainly our mission is to help ensure high quality water is delivered to all customers and drinking water customers in California through our regulatory actions. And I'm pleased to announce today two of our actions that we'll be incorporating in our work in the Division of Drinking Water. Next slide, please. So primary to what you remember um, about us uh, when we came to the board was regulation, but we've added a lot more to that since then. Since 2019, with the help of many in this room, we've incorporated the SAFER program into a lot of our work. Uh, that work uh, certainly has highlighted a lot of the communities throughout California that have suffered from uh, and, and see the fingerprints of uh, past actions that were certainly uh, contributing to the, the situation they find themselves in, not having access to water, not having uh, fully funded uh, community systems and the likes. Uh, our work in SAFER obviously has been directed at all of those communities. We'd like to now incorporate through these actions really an analysis in the needs analysis that does highlight the, the BIPOC communities and how that makeup is within the SAFER program, how we go forward, and just increase our understanding of that work um, certainly, I don't see it, you know, dramatically changing our work, but that's why we do this effort is because you're usually surprised. And when you do look at these things, you do see uh, where you can improve. And so that's our hope with this. I think it, it'll be a w welcome addition to the needs assessment we do uh, annually now and continue on. And next slide, please. Certainly, we also, in the Division of Drinking Water, set our maximum contaminant levels. Those have always been done. Uh, kind of uh, blind eye, assuming that everybody is is uh, impacted equally throughout California. But um, as lessons have learned through all of this work that we're doing is that's not always the case. Uh, we are going to continue to endeavor now to add as well an analysis in our work associated with this. Uh, when we're working on MCLs, understanding the affected communities and how that is uh, writ large in the full impacts to those communities beyond the drinking water regulation per se that we're looking at specifically. Uh, we've done some work already in this area to try to explore this with uh, Chrome 6 that will be coming to the board in not too distant future. Um, I wouldn't say it was a success at that point. Uh, it's been a learning journey. We realized we're going to need some more data sets and some more tools to be able to do this appropriately. And so uh, first steps have been taken and we'll continue to to work in that space. So those are the exciting areas the Division of Drinking Water will be incorporating uh, along the lines with this, and I'm sure there will be plenty more as we continue to endeavor in that space. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamas. Really appreciate it. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon, Chair Escobar, members of the board, Joe Karkowski, Deputy Director, uh, Division of Financial Assistance. Next slide, thank you. So we have uh, one action identified, but it's going to cover uh, many of our major programs, and that is to assess the race and ethnicity data, other relevant uh, demographic data, uh, and look at that uh, with the perspective of where is our funding actually going? So you know, we have sort of standard eligibility criteria that are used based on statute and board policy. But we're going to use that um, lens as well. And as you may recall, we have used that lens with the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, the fund expenditure plan. We've looked at that information the last couple of years. Uh, it was great that we actually honored um, Lucio earlier today because he's been instrumental in helping us do that analysis, along with 
um, Darren's team, Kristen Appold and, and her folks. So the needs assessment the, this year, we were actually able to look at sort of what is, what is the population of communities we could fund that are on the human right to water list or identified as at risk. So the needs assessment provided that sort of comprehensive look. And then we were able to compare, like, where did our funding actually go? So, uh, you know, we, lo we look to expand that analysis into our other programs, you know, our clean water uh, funding programs, the, the loan side of our drinking water um, uh, financing programs, and then also uh, in our cleanup uh, programs as, as well. So what's, what's not stated there, but I'll, I'll state it, is that, you know, the assessment obviously is just one step. Then the question is, well, what does it mean and what could we potentially do? So that'll be the important uh, follow-up work. Um, you know, whether do we need to potentially change board policies or potentially change our uh, outreach um, and engagement approach. I think we have a you know great start so far. You know, certainly you all are aware on the drinking water side and wastewater as well. We have technical assistance providers. Many of them are in um, disadva economically disadvantaged uh, communities. So. So I think we have a really good head start, and as Darren was saying, but it's, it's, I think it's important to use this lens and sort of see, are we, are we reaching those communities that uh, really need our assistance uh, the most? So um, that's, that's all I, I had. Happy to take any questions. It's a lot, and I just want to acknowledge that there has been uh, a lot of incredible progress, and uh, it, it seems like, you know, it, this is all encompassing and quite a bit of a lift, and so I really do appreciate the continued focus on it. So, thank you, Board Member Firestone. I'll just add, um, you know, agree. This is, I think, something that we've already started, and um, appreciate that it's a um, a major focus uh, continuing going forward. Um, I also just wanted to call out the future action around um, operator certification and kind of understanding our role within uh, the workforce um, efforts more broadly within the water sector and, and um, appreciate that as an area of focus um, going forward. And uh, I appreciate the, um, the work that, uh, that that will entail. Thank you for that, board member. Thank you, Mr. Karkowski. Ms. Mogus. Yeah, to continue the parade. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, board members. I'm Karen Mogus, Deputy Director, Division of Water Quality here at the State Water Board. The Division of Water Quality's mission is to lead, promote, and support California's statewide water quality program through coordinated and collaborative efforts. The Division of Water Quality has committed to and is lead for six actions in the Racial Equity Action Plan. Some of those actions are quite program specific. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus my remarks on three of our actions that broadly apply to all of our water quality programs. Next slide, please. The first is to conduct a demographic data needs assessment for all of our water quality programs. Division of Water Quality staff working closely with the Office of Information Management and Analysis, will use this assessment to identify data gaps that need to be filled and provide valuable information for prioritizing where to allocate our limited resources to achieve the Water Board's racial equity goals. We'll measure progress by the number of programs that have completed the data needs assessment, the types and number of data sets assessed, and by establishing a process for ground truthing the data sets developed. Next slide, please. The second action I'd like to highlight recognizes the Division of Water Quality's role in coordinating water quality program development and implementation with the nine regional water boards. Communication and coordination among the regional boards, the state and regional boards within water quality programs is achieved through what we call roundtables. And those roundtables are guided by charters and annual work plans. So the Division of Water Quality will work with the roundtables to incorporate racial equity into their program charters and work plans as one way to institutionalize implementation of the racial equity action plan in our water quality programs. And in the long term, we anticipate this work will result in updates to the various water quality program procedures manuals. Next slide, please. 
finally, I'll highlight the recently enacted legislation, Assembly Bill 2108, that requires the water boards to conduct equitable, culturally relevant outreach when considering proposed discharges of waste that may have disproportionate impacts on water quality in disadvantaged communities or tribal communities. Effective January 1 this year, this legislation requires the water boards to make findings on anticipated water quality impacts in disadvantaged or tribal communities as a result of permitted activity or facility. Division of Water Quality staff have initiated work with the Office of Chief Counsel and the Office of Public Participation to develop guidance on how to implement these new requirements in the context of the broader racial equity work to which the water boards are committing in the Racial Equity Action Plan. We'll also measure progress by type and number of templates updated to include racial equity and environmental justice considerations. So thank you for the opportunity to go through some of our uh, actions. And now I'll hand it off to Eric Ekdahl with the Division of Water Rights. Thank you, Ms. Mogus. And for those of you in the room, I know I think there was some um, protesting going on, uh, not for our board meeting, thankfully, but um, if the uh, microphones are picking it up, that's what the background noise is. Mr. Ekdahl, good to see you. Thank you, board members. Uh, let's go directly to the next slide. The division has three items in the action plan. I want to run through two of them. The first is to consider impacts to BIPOC communities, tribal beneficial uses, and cultural resources and related ecosystems when developing and implementing and enforcing in-stream flow requirements consistent with all applicable laws and requirements, including those related to water rights, basin planning, public trust resources, and endangered species. And I think that the gist or one of the the message we wanted to convey here is that there's a lot of ways and processes that you can look at setting in-stream flow mechanisms. There's processes through our, our drought work, through water quality control plans, through basin plan amendments, and we need to consider how each one of these mechanisms could affect in-stream flows in the related communities that rely on the flows in those streams. We have a specific performance indicator, develop and update web pages to identify where we are doing this work along with providing easier to access information on upcoming events, uh, other ways to engage with the process as it moves forward. Next slide, please. The other action to highlight is to establish a single point of contact in the division uh, to serve as a coordinator on Bay Delta tribal and BIPOC engagement to improve communication and outreach and to conduct tribal outreach under AB 52 and B 1011 for the Bay Delta Plan implementation regulation for the lower San Joaquin River flows in Southern Delta salinity. Uh, as you know, last week we did uh, send out a letter on AB 52 and B 1011 uh, consultation opportunities that went out to over 90 tribal governments representatives and uh, we look forward to hearing from them soon. And we have established the a uh, single point of contact in the division. Rob McCarthy will serve as that role going forward. We have a number of performance indicators, establish a division coordinator, which has already been done, a uh, number of consultation requests and engagements, and then including a chapter in the uh, Sacramento Delta staff report focused on BIPOC and DAC issues. And with that, I think next slide, would you turn it over to the EEO? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ekdahl. I know we heard and received a lot of feedback and tomorrow as we have our discussion around the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan update, I know will be part of our uh, discussion around engagement and ensuring that uh, all voices in that decision making are really brought to bear. So I appreciate the, the explicit call outs here. It's, thank you. Yes, please, okay. Board Member Firestone. Um, sorry, can I ask while we have you? <laughs> um, sorry, I know it's late and folks need to eat. Um, but uh, so on the, um, the uh, in-stream flows action. Um, well, first of all, one of, um, I know it's underway and we're committed to doing it. There is an R next to it. So I'm just wondering if we feel like we're going to be able to at least do the website um, development and update uh, yes, regardless. Yes, no, absolutely. And sorry, well, I didn't, wasn't trying to leave too quickly. I wasn't sure if there were any <laughs> questions now or after, but. Absolutely, and the, we already have a website in kind of an early stage. It's the California Water Action Plan website, which carries much of what we're doing, but we do plan on repurposing that. 
over the next couple of months in, in making that in more accessible and just kind of easier to understand uh, website. Great. And then um, I just, I think, you know, in the, um, in this action, there's a lot there and it's trying to encompass, you know, the huge amount of work we do around end stream flows, whether it's development of new one, but also just implementation where we have it and enforcement where we have it on um, both kind of permanent and now in drought in particular. Um, one of the, the things that we're recognizing is um, more intentionality around um, consideration of tribal beneficial uses and black indigenous people of color communities. Um, and I'm just, I, I guess this is maybe more of a comment, but curious if you have um, a sense around this, but I think it would be great to develop um, more of a, a clearer process um, for how we do those considerations. I know there's been um, a lot of work and I appreciate the, the Bay Delta specific one around tribal consultation and engagement um, and implementation of our um, tribal uh, policies. But, um, you know, I think the more that we can make sort of concrete how we're doing considerations, um, it feels a little more um, real. Uh, so I, I would just say if we, and maybe that's, you know, one of the things you didn't go over was the um, more broadly piloting the toolkit around um, racial equity that's being developed. And so I, my hope is through that, there'll be a chance to, um, to sort of document and flesh out a little bit more what that looks like. And then also be sort of considering um, maybe future iterations of the performance indicators because you know this one for this year is one we can very concrete when you know hopefully we can check off this coming year and I think just as we go forward it'd be great to be developing more uh, metrics for thinking about outcomes and and um, and performance that uh, as, and so I, I really I think my question is just is there um, a process or a place that you all that you see that that um, happening, or uh, you know, how do you see that? I think the toolkit um, process coming in. No, that's a, a great question, and I think there's still a lot to do in in both of the recommendations that we highlighted. Really, as you know, speaker said early on, we're at the kind of start of this whole process, and so the toolkit isn't yet available. I think we do. Uh, look towards that being available as kind of one of the first things that we can do and leveraging that throughout all of the divisions programs it just you know kind of taking that that viewpoint and the other element that I think we'll hear more of later is the the data components which I think will sit over much of what the entire water board will be doing in kind of leveraging that data. So a lot of the data we don't have yet, but developing it and working with OEMA and any other you know, division and office that uh, is in the process of developing it is really one of the key first steps. The last thing I'll kind of mention is that the, the in-stream flow process, I think, is poorly understood just in general. And that's one of the things that we can do to uh, just make it better understood for everybody. Uh, and specifically the, the entities that you know, are looking towards the boards to setting in-stream flows, we do a lot of work on it. Uh, we don't always necessarily see some of the progress that's being made, even though there's an immense amount of work going on. A lot of that is the process and requirements that are behind it. And as a kind of interesting note, you know, we, we set in-stream flows for the Russian Shasta, Scott, mill and deer in four months during the drought when we had certain authorities and protocols kind of shifted uh, as opposed to none in eight years of the water action plan with our kind of quote unquote standard processes in place. So just understanding and describing that to the public at large is I think a really important step that we need to do over the next couple of years and then we can start to add in the additional data and how we're actually going to consider the various uh, communities and racial equity plans that we need to understand. Thank you, Ms. Tractal. Thank you, board member. Can 
afternoon. Good to see you. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Kyle Mossman. I work as an investigator in the Equal Employment Opportunity Office under EEO Officer Shiloh Hoffman. Uh, next slide, please. So our action plan as it relates to racial equity is to provide guidance and outreach to staff regarding the roles of the EEO office and how to access resources through our office. Um, our office has developed educational materials for staff to help improve and understand the EEO process for submitting racial discrimination harassment complaints and the next steps after a complaint has been submitted. The performance indicator to represent this action is to utilize the developed materials and provide training to staff. So our, st our office has been uh, training staff since approximately 2016 before EEO training became a requirement for all staff as it is now. Although the pandemic has hindered our plans uh, to travel and present our in-person training to staff throughout the water boards as we've done in years past, we plan to resume this practice starting this year. Even though we have not been able to provide our normal training, staff still have the ability to participate in similar training via webinar and have been reminded throughout the year by the training office and others uh, that they could access this training through the California Civil Rights Department, who acts as a control agency for EEO. So a frequent theme at listening sessions and in comments uh, were that you know, there's not a good understanding of the EEO office's roles, its processes, protections, and its limitations. So the impact we hope our trainings will have is a better understanding throughout the water boards on not only the EEO roles and responsibilities, but also the EEO office's processes and procedures. In addition to conducting outreach to staff, we hope to survey staff for feedback when conducting these trainings to ensure everyone understands the EEO office's available resources and also their protections when they participate in EEO processes. This will also be an opportunity for our office to improve processes when possible and to strive for continuous growth. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. West, good to see you. Good afternoon, Chair Escavel, members of the board. Uh, I'm Yvonne West. I'm the Director of the Office of Enforcement. Uh, the Office of Enforcement provides technical and legal support for both the state and the regional water quality control board enforcement staff across all the water boards uh, program areas. I'm going to highlight three items that the Office of Enforcement will be taking the lead role in 2023 to facilitate work of enforcement staff across the board. Uh, next slide, please. The first one is, the first action is that the Office of Enforcement will be representing the water boards in implementing the Environmental Justice Enforcement Action Plan. This action plan is developed in coordination with the U.S. Protection, Environmental Protection Agency and the California Environmental Protection Agency and all the BDOs under those, that agency. The performance indicators we'll be looking at in implementing the action plan, we will be tracking the water board enforcement staff implementing the plan through their participation in community listening sessions, the rapid response team operations, community outreach trainings, and any multimedia inspections in overburdened communities that are a result of those listening sessions. Implementing this action plan will advance racial equity by providing enhanced sustained community engagement, addressing community concerns through the rapid response task force, and coordinating responses to these community concerns across the Cali PA BDOs to ensure that those responses are efficient, transparent, and effective. This, next slide, please. The second action item is the Office of Enforcement will take, internally we'll be looking at and evaluating how the water boards participate in community-based environmental violation monitoring meetings or IVAN meetings. Um, we'll be looking to evaluate and improve the water board's participation. Uh, the performance indicator being that we will look at the number of these community meetings and community trainings that are attended by water board enforcement staff. This, this action plan will advance racial equity by ensuring that the water boards are providing enhanced sustained community engagement in these, in these communities. And then the third action item that is the development of a water board specific guidance document concerning how to improve and streamline our enforcement complaint process. The indicators we'll be looking at include um, 
whether there are duplicative complaint pa pathways that are outdated pathways that should be eliminated from our website and making sure those updates are done. And then the guidance document it's, itself, development and dissemination and implementation of that document. This action will advance racial equity by providing greater transparency and accountability for our community complaint process and helping us, again, ensure that we are maintaining that engagement with our, with our overburdened communities. And those are the items that I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. West. Hi. Afternoon. Good afternoon, board member Esquivel and other board members and the members of the public watching this. It's uh, with great pleasure that I'm here to present on what the Office of Information Management and Analysis is committed to doing in the Racial Equity Action Plan. The uh, Office of Information Management and Analysis is really committed to building capacity for use of data and accessibility of our data throughout the organization as well as to the people of California. And so with those commitments in mind, and reflecting on the fact that there's a lot of talk about the role of data throughout this whole action plan, as well as um, the role of data throughout everything we do at the water boards. Um, our office is here to help build and support the rest of the programs in their, in their work to develop, deliver the outcomes that we are aiming for. So next slide, please. I'm gonna briefly discuss uh, three of the actions that are in the action plan related uh, to the lead of our office. The first one is this idea that in prior drafts you may have seen and in many of the conversations leading up to this, we've heard the importance of data and the importance of making data accessible to all the programs, the regions, the offices, the staff, the engagement partners, um, the local folks that we work with and the public so that we can use that racial equity lens to advance equity and so knowing that it's a lot um, what what I'm proposing in this action plan is that we have a process a commitment to a, a process uh, upon which the principles of reusable and accessible and understandable data is the is an iterative uh, product it's not one thing that you build and then you move on it's really a, it's a practice and so these three elements in the action plan that we're committing to for racial equity data would be uh, built on the practices, um, first collating, curating, and, and then training up on what are best practices for using um, both the administrative data that we have throughout our organization as well as um, demographics data that might be synthesized with our administrative data to do the different um, toolkit steps. Um, the second component of the action plan for data is related to um, expanding and increasing how we engage with our community partners on the data. Um, OEMA and the water boards have a long standing practice of trying to make sure that our open data and our public data is being engaged with folks. This is really um, taking that and, and multiplying it, really um, emphasizing how important it is for that step to happen, that interaction between us and the folks that we serve and the folks that are affected by how we make decisions with the data and the the code, if you will, behind um, how we use it. The third component of this action plan on data has to do with um, building an ongoing resource, so a catalog of data resources, um, starting with things that we already have, uh, many of these uh, products that we, you've probably heard about in the past, the pollution and prejudice story map and things like that. How do we expand and make those places um, uh, a, a, an interface and a platform so that folks can go reuse someone else's work and or use it um, as it is. So that's the third component to this action plan. To do this, um, we have received uh, like permission and, and authority from our executive team to build a task force across the organization, um, knowing that the folks that are already using and doing racial equity work and data work should be part of this um, larger task force or team that's doing the work. So that will be the first step that's happening right now. Um, the indicators are uh, multiple, and um, I don't think we need to read them, but I will say that based on what I've heard, um, I, I want to commit to the fact that our office, because of our role with the performance program, is committed to the idea that these are iterative things. Many of the, uh, the performance measures are 
indicate they're indicating where we're headed and there's probably going to be lots of measures and sub uh, measures and what have you that have to be developed with not only the community but your board member input on where we should be going with some of these indicators and measures next slide please um, the two other things that we're working on in OEMA that relates to this um, have to do with, again, capacity building. So the, one of the very foundational and core pieces to the work of doing racial equity is the toolkit. Um, that's a very broad term. It sort of is very similar to that idea of data. Um, it, it's going to be something that is uh, an example toolkit and then cases of, of reusable components. But um, they're all going to fall into the three basic categories of either using a racial equity lens to sort of make sure that we're doing a good assessment of uh, what are the outcomes and partnering with folks. Um, and the second major tool is uh, using a results-based, or excuse me, a root cause analysis to sort of try to identify where are the strategic weak points and tactical areas that we can emphasize. And then the third is that results-based accountability, which is really performance-based management. And so the toolkit um, is going to be broken into those sort of three basic principles or pillars, and it'll be uh, developed and iterated upon throughout the organization as it gets used and tested and revised. Um, finally, the Office uh, of Information Management Analysis is helping do the second employee survey on measuring our progress towards advancing racial equity. This is the um, survey that is intended to uh, evaluate how we're doing on the model of change. So are we still normalizing most of our work? Are we organizing or are we operationalizing the work to advance racial equity? That is going to be rolled out here in the next few weeks. So with that, I will hand it to the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Gearhart, uh, for your past uh, and just incredible contributions and ongoing. Uh, like you said, all this data is and, and the ability to have this data lead to our better decision making is incredibly foundational to all of it and your leadership. Uh, through the years as through GARE and all this work um, is just really acknowledged and noted and just thanks for your office's continued foundational effort in all of this. So thank you. Thanks. It's a great day. Good afternoon, chair, members, and uh, colleagues, members of the public watching at home and here in the room today. My name is Anna Hoval Melendez, and I am the Legislative Director for the Water Boards. The mission of the Office of Legislative Affairs is to effectively represent the Water Board and regional Water Boards on legislative matters. We primarily work with the State Water Board, including the nine regional Water Boards, and other state agencies, as well as the Legislature, to provide technical assistance as legislative bills are introduced and moved through the legislative process, and are in turn implemented in statute. This means that we work very hard. Oh, next slide, please. Thank you. This means that we work very hard to build positive relationships with the legislature, members of the public, local agencies, and locally elected officials. The Office of Legislative Affairs stra um, strategy outlined in the Racial Equity Action Plan pertains to activating BIPOC community wisdom and sharing power with the goal to consult, collaborate, and partner with BIPOC communities in decision making processes. While the Office of Legislative Affairs work has traditionally been focused on items before the California State Legislature, our action item is specifically designed to increase our proactive outreach to legislators and their staff, as well as increasing our outreach to locally elected officials. Our action item will work to increase our briefings and outreach to legislators who represent geographic areas with a high percentage of BIPOC communities to help inform them of Water Board's resources and public participation processes. Increasing this outreach and better understanding local areas of concern and interest will, better help us, uh, will help us to better understand barriers to Water Board's program implementation and hear suggestions for how to overcome these barriers. The performance indicators chosen for this work will focus on the number of briefings we are able to hold for elected officials and their staff, the geographic diversity of these offices, as well as the diversity of the type of elective offices we communicate with. This last piece is important to note because as we would also like to make sure that we provide a more holistic, broader, and proactive outreach um, approach to, the, to those who are most often on the front lines of answer, answering local community concerns and who represent communities in need of assistance. Thank you. Thank you. I just really appreciate uh, the, the growth of uh, your office and here 
providing a level of service that I think would, again, appropriately focused on uh, our legislators, but there's a lot of city council members, there's a lot of uh, county board of supervisor members, a lot of partners that are part of all this work that we're doing, and your already engagement in so many of those offices has really meant the difference, I feel, in a number of projects out there, just to have that ability to ask questions and for us to be able to translate that into direct responses for those elected offices, again, that, as you said, are, are really on the front lines and partners with us. Uh, so I appreciate you already doing your part and the commitment through this. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm James Knockbauer, the director of our Office of Research, Planning, and Performance. Uh, we are lead for five items in the action plan, but I'm going to only speak about uh, three of them today, all of which relate to planning. Um, the office leads several programs, though, um, and we're mostly marked by our programs being cross-cutting and highly collaborative across the organization. Uh, next slide, please. Or, there we are. Um, so, our first action I'm covering here is the development of a racial equity training plan. Training has been a theme that's come up several times already in this presentation, uh, and it's important. It's an important part of how we normalize and operationalize racial equity here. Uh, people have mentioned the main racial equity training, uh, the racial equity toolkit, efforts to incorporate racial equity into our data efforts, uh, into our communication efforts, um, and into our human resources and other areas. All of those things require training, and we will be working to coordinate uh, those various efforts, as well as consider what kinds of trainings on these topics are effective, what kind of new content may need to be developed or provided, um, and how we can modify or expand some of our current course offerings. Um, and we're actually hoping soon to be hiring um, this, uh, this for, for someone who will be uh, significantly responsible for uh, this racial equity training plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second planning-related item I wanted to touch on is our state board strategic work plan. Uh, I won't say any more except that um, just a plug for the, uh, the later item. Um, and then finally, we are working to develop a plan on climate change impacts uh, at the intersection of the board's authorities and roles and racial equity. So this is part of a longer term goal of identifying and implementing actions the board can take to make progress uh, both on racial equity and on climate change simultaneously. The action here on screen is the planning phase of that longer term project. And, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Knockbauer. And I just want to, I know it took time to get through uh, all the divisions and offices, but just really thank all the executive uh, staff and, and support here. It meant a lot to hear uh, directly from the offices and really appreciated everyone's time to be able to gather, review, and hear us personally speak to the items in the work plan. It, it meant a lot, so thank you all. Ms. Pazos. Thanks, and thank you, everyone. Um, I echo those those thoughts. <laughs> it's just really good to have everybody here and, and hear it from everybody directly. So I'm back. I'm going to finish this off with the next steps. Um, just a couple more slides. So next slide, please. Okay, so board members will not take action on the action plan today. The intention is that this document can be modified and adjusted as necessary based on what we learn as we implement these actions and as we further engage with BIPOC communities. Board members will be regularly updated on the plan's implementation. There will also be an annual update presentation of this plan to the board. After two years of implementing this racial equity action plan and evaluating progress on these actions, the State Water Board will reinitiate a public engagement process that will include reengaging the public and tribes to reflect on accomplishments, hear feedback on emerging priorities, and develop new priority actions. Staff aims to present a second iteration of this plan to the Water Board as an informational item in 2026 after this public engagement process. As this plan is implemented, we can expect to see racial equity integrated and considered into Water Board's projects and programs presented regularly to the State Water Board as part of regular board processes. As I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation and as we've heard from division office leadership, 
The intention is to make racial equity considerations part of our everyday work. Next slide. So just some additional information on the screen there. Uh, California Native American tribes can continue to request government to government consultations on an ongoing basis to discuss this work. And input from interested parties and general comments about the Water Board's racial equity work will continue to be received through our dedicated inbox shown on the screen. Lastly, the action plan is available on our webpage. Um, and again, we will continue to receive feedback at racial equity at waterboards.ca.gov. So again, thank you for your time and engagement. That concludes our presentation on the action plan. We have a large group of folks here to answer any questions and <laughs> um, to discuss, but um, that's the end of our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so kindly, Ms. Pansos, and for the great presentation, the coverage on this, and your leadership as well, and, and synthesizing, again, what is an incredible amount of work, um, intense discussions, a lot of passion, and uh, just really appreciative of the professionalism around this. Uh, we are late uh, into our late uh, lunch. I want to get to it, but I also don't want to carry over anyone that really can't um, carry over through the lunch. So uh, what I'll ask is uh, if any of you are in the room to identify yourself, and then if you're on the Zoom platform, do raise your hand. I ask if um, you can hold over, please do with us so that um, you can st stick with us across the other side and we can get to a lunch here sooner rather than not. And if we don't have anyone that needs to go immediately, we can transition to our lunch and we'll come back at 2.30. Looking to see if there's any hands up uh, in the room and or on the platform and seeing none, I appreciate that. And let's come back. We'll continue to actually discuss this. I wanna hear feedback and there'll be further uh, direction and, and question from board members, I'm sure. So thank you everyone for your patience, both for technical difficulties and uh, for just your participation in all, in all today's discussion so far. Let's come back at 2.30, uh, give ourselves a 45 minute lunch and we'll continue on on this item. Thank you everyone.
Okay, everyone, we're at 2.33. I hope everyone had a good lunch and appreciate everyone holding on uh, here to the other side of it. Uh, we can now begin to get to our speakers. I, I know we have, um, I think, uh, some in person, and then uh, otherwise we can get to folks that we have remotely. Um, and so I, I know Eric Oriana is on my sheet here and may not be here in person. Uh, and then otherwise, I uh, can go to our next uh, virtual person, but I think Eric was going to be introducing uh, some of them as well, so. Yeah, I, th I think he'll be coming back. So uh, I'm just gonna go to additional, what's that? Uh, eight, yeah. Okay. Yeah, at this point we have three uh, commenters on Zoom for this item. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and go to, I'll just see, I see Sean Bothwell in the audience. So um, we'll take some folks in person first and then we'll uh, go to our people on the platform. So Sean, yeah, by all means. <laughs> I'm just gonna call out of order at this point, so. <laughs> thank you. I, it may not be on. Right, it's not. Good afternoon, Chair Esquivel, board members. Uh, Sean Bothwell, I'm the Executive Director for California Coast Keeper Alliance. Um, it's been said really eloquently by a lot of people, but I just wanted to, again, say how really just proud I am of this agency and the staff that put the racial equity plan together. Uh, it's an amazing document. Uh, it's really felt like a safe space to actually talk about things, and um, I really appreciated all the honestly, the act of listening that, that got done uh, throughout the process. Um, I'm gonna start with some of the more supportive things and then work my way to maybe a couple concerns. Um, some of the things that we really appreciated being added to this new draft, the annual review by the board, that was something I echoed of making sure there really is some board oversight going forward. Um, and the two-year update, um, you know, I think is really important as a living document. Uh, one of the things I was really excited to see was uh, using, looking at racial equity in the lens of the 303D list. Um, I think that's really going to tell an important story of the disproportionate impacts that are really impacting these communities. So we were really excited to see that one in there. Um, along with the, the analysis of racial equity when it comes to the lack thereof of water quality monitoring and the data gaps that exist out there in those communities, that was important to us. Um, and then also the TMDL prioritization um, and the prioritizing uh, you know, actions to restore waterways and bring, bring our waterways um, uh, into compliance with, with basin plans. Another thing we had mentioned uh, was board appointments, having a kind of a line of, so that we have diversity on our boards. And that's something, you know, I, we work a lot with the governor's office on, trying to talk about how, how can we get that message out there of these appointments are open, you know, how can we get diversity to those boards? And so I was really excited to see that added. Um, and then also the inclusion of um, AB 20, 2108 and the incorporation of that in, into the plan as well. Um, a couple other things that were added, but maybe a couple just recommendations, maybe for a later draft or maybe today. Um, on the, the, the 303D list and the water quality analyses, um, it kind of just brought up a question to me of how many of these analyses are going to be publicly available? How much of them are going, you know, for transparency's sake? And how, of them, how many of them are more internal things that maybe won't be uh, available to the public? And certainly the 303D listing issue and the, the monitoring gaps uh, were important to me for transparency's sake, but I'm sure there's a lot of stuff in there. And it just kind of opened a question of which ones are going to be publicly available and what type of an, you know, data and analysis is not going to be publicly available. Uh, the urban water efficiency regs were added in there. This is just um, you know, a recommendation maybe for a future draft, but we're looking a lot on, on rates and rate structures. And this is you know, a little outside your purview to a degree, um, but, but certainly looking at equality uh, when it comes to rate structures and how we're designing rate structures is a really big thing um, and something that I think uh, kind of fits into this plan. Uh, the digital divide, like having access, uh, particularly with you know Zoom and uh, the way things are going, um, I believe the action plan talks about access to the website, um, but doesn't, and maybe I'm just confused by what the language meant, but it didn't really talk about people having access to a regulatory, this proceeding, for example, like people that lack that internet connectivity, um, removing that barrier is something that's important. I'm gonna touch on it again, the community capacity. And then um, this is, there was, um, 
We asked for more like timeframes for accountability purposes. Um, and we appreciate the phases so that there's a kind of a phased approach. But you know, that was just still something that we felt is important of, you know, there's a lot of projects out there, but having actual timeframes, uh, we continue to think is important. I'm gonna touch on three kind of concerns um, that I might have, and, and maybe I just misunderstood some of the language. Um, I did catch the community capacity part before I had to leave, but maybe I misunderstood some of the other parts. Um, you know, the community capacity building thing, and I heard Member Firestone speak on this earlier, is incredibly important to us. Uh, it's kind of why we did the 2108 bill, why we did the 2113 bill that didn't pass. Um, we really wanted to see that move forward. And uh, maybe I'm missing something, but it looks like we took a step backwards actually between the draft and, and the, the version before you today. The, the, the version in the draft seemed like a more permanent program. It seemed like a program that was going to refund possibly travel expenses language access issues, and again, the internet connectivity issue. And I, I, the way I read it, those things have been removed from the, the plan, which gives me a little bit of concern. Um, the disproportionate impacts in permits and policies, that's another big thing for us, again, why we did 2108. Um, in the draft, there was a lot of stuff there about toolkits and then analyzing data gaps, but then there was one in particular that said something to the effect of removing those disproportionate impacts you know, through the lifetime of the permit or policy or whatever it was. And that kind of commitment, I don't actually see in this new draft. And so that kind of gave me some concern. Maybe we feel like it's captured in 2108, but I was pretty happy with the draft language. I thought it went further than 2108. So um, that's one other thing to flag. And then the last issue is um, the in-stream flow issue. And I appreciate the language that's in the draft now. Um, and I, I appreciate it at the beginning of the um, presentation, you know, everyone flagged that, that that was a big priority. But the issue is more so that these in-stream flow standards are just not getting done. Like that's the inequality there. That's the issue that's, that's causing the problem to those communities. If tribal communities don't have the water to have their cultural practices, setting the in-stream flow is the key, not necessarily uh, analyzing an in-stream flow or an enforcement action based on racial equality, but we need to set those in-stream flow standards. And I'm gonna harp on that again in the priorities in a second, but um, I'll end there. Again, extremely supportive of the document. I just wanted to be helpful and provide our, our thoughts on the, the current plan. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Appreciate you uh, quickly going first here and, uh, and the flags uh, for the concerns. I know we'll have likely a, a bit more discussion around uh, the in-stream flow components of our commitments there, but <clears throat> how they tie into uh, our here, what we'll hear uh, in the next time, next couple items, our strategic work plan, say. So thank you. All right, next, I'd like to go to Eric Coriana. Good afternoon. Thanks for the patience and yeah. My pleasure. Thank Good with afternoon, us for the Chairman, uh, board members, and staff. Uh, wanted to come and provide comments and strong support for the Racial Equity Action Plan. For folks who don't know, my name is Eric Oriana, and I represent Community Water Center. I wanted to first start off by uh, commending staff members and uh, really everyone who provided input, especially community partners uh, up and down the state of California to get this Racial Equity Action Plan to where it is today. A special uh, shout out to Ms. Pasos and uh, Ms. Renteria and others for uh, their hard work on this effort. Um, really wanted to underscore the work that it took to uh, engage communities on the issues that were facing them related to racial equity and drinking water access and other water access issues. Uh, there's really uh, a lot of great work done here and it gives me confidence that the State Water Board will continue to uh, conduct significant and meaningful outreach in the coming future. Um, as I've previously stated in, in, in previous comments, uh, the board is doing really critical work to realize racial equity in the drinking water space. Um, we know that nearly one million Californians live with unsafe drinking water uh, and that the human right to water passed into law more than 10 years ago. Uh, that gap in time really demonstrates that while we have aspirations for a better future, uh, hard work and effort are needed to root out the racist legacies of past and present. Uh, we're excited about uh, particularly the board's prioritization of community capacity building fund, which will empower the board to include disenfranchised communities in development of its policy. Uh, we strongly support the latest iteration of the state's racial equity action plan and have some recommendations in response to the latest changes. Uh, as far as it might not be included, I just wanted to uh, comment 
uh, related that the racial equity action plan mentions racial equity analysis for future maximum contaminant levels. Uh, and so we wanted to just uh, iterate that this should include the establishment of a chromium-6 MCO. Um, while the racial equity action plan mentions an effort to consider racial equity and the development of racial equity analysis for future policy decisions, the latest action plan should expressly mention the importance of racial equity analysis in the board's role in the implementation of Sigma. Uh, we understand scale of this action plan's effort, but we really encourage specificity uh, in this regard. Uh, we request you expressly note how racial equity will be considered in your role in Sigma's implementation. Uh, the action plan also makes mention of augmenting staff training efforts around cultural biases, racial equity, and engaging with uh, underrepresented communities. Uh, and while this is a critical step, uh, the latest changes are less forthright about how critical of a need this is. Uh, and so we recommend the board further highlight the importance of agency-wide improvements uh, to community engagement and outreach with communities of color. Uh, in closing, I want to encourage board members and staff in your implementation of the action plan. I want to remind you all that Californians have entrusted you with the responsibility to fight and root out racial inequities and encourage you to be steadfast because this cause is just uh, in honor of uh, Martin Luther King's uh, remembrance holiday, I just wanted to share a couple of comments. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to, I quickly, I forgot to mention that uh, I'm sharing comments on behalf of Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability as well. Uh, but just some comments that I, I think are related and, and relevant to uh, today's conversation. Uh, two quotes uh, from the great Martin Luther King. Uh, Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights you will make a greater person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. Uh, let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away, a deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities, and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adriana. I appreciate your engagement, uh, the support, and uh, always uh, the recommendations on how do we can do better. I, I do want to comment on the MCL and Chrome 6. I know um, Darren Plumas, I think, made uh, mention of it, but we did uh, do some initial work, I think. Uh, I, I know uh, when it comes to our, our data and analysis on racial equity for Chrome 6 and came upon some of those data gaps and some of those issues that I think are, are common and that we've identified. So. I think what we're, we're committing to do is, is to do more, and I'm sure it'll certainly be, still yet be part of the discussion as best it can with the data we have now as we consider Chrome 6. But I appreciate the flag and desire to make sure that we're, we're not just leaving out Chrome 6 as we do it and just applying it to, to future ones, knowing that that's such an active one for the coming year. So I just wanted to make mention of that and appreciated the recommendation on the Nexus with Sigma. As we will talk in our um, priorities discussion, uh, that will definitely be another thing coming up this year, so I appreciate the nexus there. Um, so thank you. Next, I'd like to start to go with uh, folks on uh, the Zoom platform, and I'll go first with Cynthia Cortez, and then Castle Willie, Yan Lu, Jennifer Capitolo. Oh, I apologize, that's not actually the order. Let's just go to Cynthia Cortez. I actually, anyway. The second person after that will be Regina Chikazola. Uh, good afternoon. I am Cynthia Cortez, Assistant Policy Analyst for Restore the Delta. I am here today to comment about the equity resolution that the board and board staff continue to develop. We appreciate the spirit of the resolution. We understand how important it is to BIPOC staff members for the water boards, how hard staff have worked on this resolution, and how it prioritizes many important areas of development of water development in California. We are equally concerned still with its incompleteness. We agree with Sean Bothwell's comment earlier, as well as a comment presented by the Community Water Center. The assessment of historic water rights is inaccurate as described in our petition recently filed with US EPA because the board refuses to include tribal water rights and fully embrace under the Clean Water Act that beneficial water uses for rivers and streams are as important as drinking water. The resolution will miss the mark of addressing the needs of all tribal and environmental justice communities 
in California. An equity resolution that fails to address the needs of all environmental justice communities and tribes will fail to address the disparate impacts created by present board mandates for water management in California. We ask for these changes again to the equity resolution. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. Cortez. And are there um, exact language uh, changes that were offered up? I imagine there was uh, here at some point and just want to know um, better how uh, our work was reflected, but still, but thank you. I appreciate that, that comment. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Regina Chigazola. Hello, um, my name is Regina Chigazola. I'm with Save California Salmon and it is storming. So if you can't hear me at any point, let me know. Um, but um, first of all, I just really wanted to thank staff. A lot of effort was put into this process um, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, there were changes that were specifically based on comments of both us um, and tribal leaders from the Red Ink hearing from what I can see. And I really appreciate that a lot. Um, I do want to again ask for um, changes to the resolution language, which I know is not going to happen overnight, but um, the wording that tribes have lost water rights is still incorrect um, and words matter. I know people are, say that it can be dealt with, with in implementation, um, but on that I also wanted to bring to the board's attention that the EPA is actually um, in the process of doing a rulemaking specifically right now on this issue, saying that tribal water rights do need to be considered in all decisions to do with water quality. And that will be, a, that's a federal process that's happening, but um, hopefully that EPA rulemaking will help clarify um, and maybe also help with changing the language in the resolution itself. Um, uh, again, I still thank you though for how the action plan moved forward. Um, there are some things that I did not hear in the presentations that brought me a little concern, um, and I'm hoping they are dealt with. Um, the number one thing being specific th specifically to the water rights issues, which were brought up before. Um, the draft did say that reviewing water rights was going to be necessary. Um, and I can think of nothing more racist than our water rights system and specifically how it's applied in as far as how um, in stream flows work and how cutoffs work. I mean, pre-1914 water rights belong almost exclusively to large landowners and white people because they are pre-1914 water rights when other people could not own land and genocide was actively happening in the state. Um, I was really heartened to see though that the Office of Legislative Affairs was here because I think there could be recommendations as far as legislation to deal with this issue. Um, so I do think that office for participating, having so many different offices participating is so critical to this process. Um, but I do think the Department of Water Rights needs to look at how water rights is, um, the how water rights in California are administered and um, whether or not the public trust and um, equity is being considered in that. Um, with that said, I also have concerns based on earlier in the meeting um, with the conservation as a, a way of life law, and maybe this can be another place where the um, Office of Legislative Affairs could be helpful, is that that doesn't apply to agriculture at all. Um, and being that agriculture use 80% of the water in the state, the fact that people in cities, especially communities of color, are going to be so tightly regulated while people up in my area are still actively flood irrigating, even during times of curtailment, is a problem when it comes to racial equity, especially because that's been a big issue that's been brought up in the regional board process. Um, and the regional board did actually come to Happy Camp California during this process, which to me is a major step in racial equity. So I thank you for taking all these steps forward because it's starting to come down to the regional board level also in a good way. Um, that said, I do see a lot of actions moving forward that have major racial equity consequences without the racial equity lens being applied or thought about. Um, and I know that this was just approved, but I just really think implementation is going to be so critically important, um, and especially in how it relates to water quality permitting, um, water rights permitting, and things of that nature. I mean, where this plays out the most to the public to the general public is where the rubber meets the road in these water quality decisions. 
Um, not that I was super heartened to see that the division of water quality was also here. Like the, I'm really impressed by the work that's gone in and everyone here. I do think there could be some actions taken to make it a little better of a plan and to serve communities a little better. And um, dealing with agriculture and dealing with water rights are the number one things I think that need to happen to really deal with racial equity when it comes to surface water in the state of California. I mean, imagine if our justice or education laws were still based on 1914 laws and whether or not we could say we were meeting racial equity. Um, anyway, again, thank you so much. Sorry to bring concerns. I'm very happy with the work that went in and um, I hope to work with you in, in the future. Thank you. Really appreciate that, Ms. Chikazola. And don't be sorry for bringing concerns. Uh, don't uh, anyone ever out there, uh, we, we want to, we need to hear criticism and concerns and it's uh, not about um, trying to make us happy with good comments. And so thank you, uh, truly. And, and But still also thank you for the support of the work. Um, it's appreciated to, to have that and uh, look forward to, I know, and, and hear you as well, um, that I, I feel you know, and, and, and look forward to the opportunity tomorrow when we get into the water quality control plan discussion. Um, and even here, when we talk about our, our priorities discussion, um, how it is uh, still a lens here that we're trying to apply to all of that, even if the words and here the exact um, uh, recipe, which we're, we're still in the middle of doing. This is the first time we've developed a document like this. We'll come back, we'll be checking back in, we'll be improving. Uh, but nonetheless, um, here, you know, taking our, our first best cut and getting into implementing, I think, will be important and just appreciate uh, the support and the opportunities, I was going to say, there um, with the strategic work plan and with these other specific projects out there to continue to incorporate and do better by, even if, again, the words aren't exactly right yet on the action plan. So thank you. I appreciate that. Next, uh, I'd like to call up Castle Willie, uh, who will be followed by Yuen uh, Liu and then our uh, Jennifer Capitolo. Uh, good afternoon. This is Caso Willie. I am the staff attorney for Safe California Salmon. Uh, first thing I just want to say, I also appreciate all the work the staff and community has put into creating this action plan. Uh, prior to today, today, I received many emails and reminders about the presentation, so it was good to see that there's an active effort being made to inform as many people as possible about the racial equity action plan. Um, I was glad to see that some of our questions were answered in the action plan and some of our comments were added into the final draft. For example, we included comments about the TMDL and flow actions. However, as was noted, there's further action that needs to go into making these actions equi equitable. And as the document evolves, I hope that these concerns regarding these issues will be addressed. Uh, for my main comment, I just want to encourage quick implementation of the action plan. Specifically, under the point goal 1B regarding the regarding creating a point of contact to serve as a coordinator for the Bay Delta for tribal and BIPOC engagement. There's current and immediate actions being taken regarding the Bay Delta plan and racial equity definitely needs to be brought into that discussion. Specifically tomorrow when you hear about the scientific report of the VAs, since the VAs were a racially exclusionary uh, created in a racially exclusionary way. Uh, tribes and environmental justice groups, which are often communities of color, were not included in the creation of these. And so that must be taken into consideration during the workshop tomorrow. And the process should be viewed through a lens that definitely va values and prioritizes racial equity. Uh, lastly, I just want to quickly re reiterate the concern with the water rights system and how it's directly connected to racial equity. And I hope that this will be also be addressed in the future. I appreciate the incorporation of our comments in the action plan, and I look forward to seeing how this action plan is applied and hopefully that it will be applied as soon as possible in upcoming board actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the, the good comment and support as well. Um, next, I'd like to call up Yuan Liu and uh, followed by Jennifer Capitolo. Can you hear me? We can. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, this is Yuan. So I'm a resident in Southern California. Actually, I live in San Diego. Uh, I'm a, a belong to a community of color. You can see my face. So actually, I 
I want to show my concern even I oppose the racial equity action plan. I think it, this plan is couched in the ideological euphemism, such as equitable outcome and institutional races and race racial injustice. This new plan by the state water board is the latest example of the politicization and the racialization of the public policy. Um, this action plan spells out the strategic direction and specific goals so that a racial equity lens is consistently applied to water board decision making process. In addition to the concrete uh, steps to embed uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training into the state uh, agency, the plan also sets goals and uh, merit metrics to ensure that uh, water board employee at all organization level reflect the racial and uh, 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 sanity diversity of California. This is nothing short of unconstitutional racial balancing and um, I think um, you guys are just uh, wasting my taxpayer money, not only mine and lots of uh, other residents in California and the uh, public resources on the blatant uh, like a uh, race-based training and policy. Uh, even recently the New York Times uh, Journal, one article is uh, criticized the diversity training after documenting the American DEI industry as a 3.4 Billion market is also argues that the mandatory DEI training may well have a net negative effect on the outcome manager claim to care about. Rather than helping the organization solve the specific problem, meaning this kind of training, actually, uh, such as implicit bias trainings emphasized in the California Water Board Plan, uh, futilely seek a revolutionary a re-understanding of race relationship and create a heightened legal risk. And in the very end, I want to, so since, since this Monday, we just celebrate the month, uh, our great Martin Luther King's like uh, day to memorize him. Oh, apologies, Mr. Liu, uh, your microphone went on mute. Um, you should be asked to unmute here again. I'm not sure. Mr. Liu, uh, apologies, your, your microphone uh, went muted. Um, you need to unmute. Sorry. Please continue. Uh, Mr. Liu, if you're able to uh, hear me, you, you're able, it looks like you're unmuted now, so uh, you're able to continue. And apologies, you're... Sorry, uh, I can't hear you clearly. Okay, if you can hear me now, Mr. Liu, um, you can you can resume your comment. Uh, you had uh, gone uh, muted there for a moment. Oh, I have been muted? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, and it was only uh, a, a few moments, and so uh, apologies for that. Uh, I don't know where I should start. Maybe I, re I repeat. <laughs> Do I have time? Okay. Maybe uh, let me repeat it again. About, so. uh, no, K uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, so you were, you were starting to talk about him, so you might start from that point. Thank you. Uh, Martin Luther King? Okay. Yes. Yeah, basically, this is the very, very end. So basically, I oppose this action plan. I want to finish with the Martin Luther King's famous quote. So it is said, uh, since we just celebrated uh, his life on this third on this Monday. Uh, not only on this Monday, we need to celebrate him every day. Really, it, we, this is what Martin Luther King said. So, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their characters. I have a dream today. So, this is what Martin Luther King said. Okay, that's it. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Liu. I appreciate your time in participating in our discussion today, even if we have, I think, very differing views um, around the work. Um, I know it can seem, or especially given, and here at the top, uh, talked about difficulty of sometimes talking about race, but it, it is a heightened uh, political um, um, topic uh, that we often hear, but know here wholly uh, for myself, and I know this board and everyone that's engaging in this work, uh, it's not about politics. Um, it is about here are our communities and the need to, to see an equity that 
and, and struggle around equity that began uh, here before us, certainly. Um, and as you use the words of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, again, it's, I, I'm reminded of how we are all called to re-embrace what are these important ideals, and especially in the face of evidence that continues to show uh, continued exclusion, continued in inequities, um, and aren't easy discussions to have, um, and a disagreement there even amongst it. So I appreciate, again, uh, your time, your comments, even if um, we have, I think, very different views on, on the work. So thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Jennifer Capitolo. Thank you, board member Escavo and members of the board. Um, I just want to start by saying, echoing everyone's comments, thanking you for your work, for staff's work on this important plan. Um, we, as an association, have also been working on our priorities related to racial equity. And I think that's part of what I wanted to share today is that this, this work we really can't do in a vacuum. You all, the water board, are taking a leadership role, but us as water associations and our member water utilities need to follow your lead and make sure that we're doing this within our own organizations as well. Um, I had not planned on calling in today and testifying, but I got a call from one of my members as soon as you all started hearing this item, and she asked me to give you a call and just let you know a situation that she's been dealing with that she thinks is something that the Water Board should consider in a future um, action related to the racial equity plan. And that is that she has um, a really hard time recruiting in small communities that are heavily Latino communities for new water system operators. And the reason that she views recruiting as difficult is because the operator exam is only offered in English. And she has folks who can speak English, uh, even if their language, primary language is Spanish, but the anxiety around taking a test in English is difficult for them. So she asked me to call in and just ask you in a future um, action to consider offering the operator exam in other languages. Thank you again for your work today. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And uh, here, your member agency uh, desiring to make sure and engage and, and make sure the board hears something here. I appreciate, as board member Firestone noted, that uh, there is an action uh, and work associated with our drinking water operator certification and wastewater operator certifications. And uh, that's a great suggestion. I know that we recently uh, rebooted um, our um, advisory committee for, for the uh, operator certifications. And I think would be a great topic to make sure that just gets fed into there, um, even absent it being already uh, enumerated here in the action plan. So thank you. Okay, I think that may bring us to the end of our uh, virtual commenters, unless um, it's Tyler looking over to you all, if there's anyone else or Mr. Lauper. Okay. Board members, uh, this isn't an action item. This is an informational item. I know we heard some concerns and uh, I think we've done our best uh, to reflect here in, a, in the document as it is. Um, what we had, we had heard, we do have opportunities to change it. I don't think, you know, here right now, we won't be entertaining changes. I think this is a, a moment to, to really encapsulate uh, here what has been an opportunity to provide comment around the document. Um, and there's opportunity to still improve. Um, so welcome to, to hearing um, re reflection from board members, uh, thoughts on, on how we continue here. And I think I, I wanna just say, completely committed to ensuring as this year goes on, we, we are checking in, both just at that personal level. I know we all have a, a lot of conversations with the executive and you know always have our kind of ticker of priorities that we have. I know that will come up in those conversations, but then also um, as we publicly engage with this work, um, perhaps not at an informational item at this board, I think what we're committed to is you know sometime in a year coming back to the board. But I know throughout that year, there's gonna be opportunities for us and here priority for the board to stay on top of uh, the commitments that we, uh, we've all expressed here in public uh, together and um, excited to get to this phase of implementation. I know it's been a lot of work and so just incredibly uh, humbled and thankful. And so look to colleagues for, for any thoughts and again, uh, reflection. 
Great, thanks. I'll just um, hit on a couple kind of summary final thoughts on this. I mean, I, I think the, um, there's a lot of analysis and reflection and um, kind of learning and listening that we're focused on in this first year. Um, I really look forward to in the briefings that we get as board members and in the um, uh, presentations as we consider policies and actions um, to see consideration of disproportionate impacts and um, uh, also report out on the consultations and engagement that we're hearing from our work with um, black, indigenous, and people of color with, at, within the decision-making processes that we have being brought to us even over the next year as we're developing this. So um, I think uh, I also just echo, I, I do think we want to be trying to make as much of that publicly accessible as possible. So to the extent there are analyses, um, you know, I think the intent is certainly to make that um, publicly accessible uh, to the extent we can. Um, I, you know, I want to encourage um, us to think about and, and sort of staff um, to think about how we may want to set up kind of advisory groups or regular meetings to check in to how this continues to evolve and be implemented and defer to staff on how that best works. Um, I know we have some uh, new staff coming on that can help us kind of keep 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 our eye on the ball, um, but making sure we're we have some structure for that as we go forward, I think would be helpful. So, um, uh, especially as we're transitioning off of the um, racial equity team, and then uh, you know ultimately. At the end of the day, making sure that we have our eye on the ball is on exec and us as board members and, and ultimately all staff um, and community members to help us um, really be, um, be on the ball to make sure that these actions are actually implemented meaningfully. Um, and just at the end of the day, kind of proof is in the pudding, are, is this, um, the whole point of this isn't just to uh, go through more motions, but it's to really see different outcomes and to see that outcomes um, are not predicted by race and to um, really create through within our decision making process um, of structural and systemic changes. Um, as we do our work in the water board. So, you know, a lot of this is, is process oriented, data oriented, um, but that's really because I think the theory of, of change that we're all working within is that that will help us make better decisions and better priorities that are more accountable to, to creating the kind of structural changes that are necessary to get um, equitable outcomes and again, make sure that race isn't a predictor of who has access to safe water or clean water. Um, and just, I'm so excited about this. I'm really grateful for the huge amount of work uh, and look forward to, to rolling up our sleeves. You're here, thank you, board member. Vice Chair. Thank you, um, and that was really well said, board member Firestone, I appreciate um, uh, your focus um, on, the, in particular, on uh, data collection, um, process oriented. Uh, this uh, plan is not in and of itself what's going to fix the problem. And so uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us and uh, my focus on it um, from day one has been to listen, learn and become better educated and look for those opportunities. Um, and then also to make sure I've said this before that we do not include things in this plan that are not attainable because I think that that creates further damage to people that are suffering and have been suffering. And I think for a regulatory body to make it seem as though we can wave a magic wand, uh, I think that's inappropriate as well. So I've always been looking for this way to, to balance and the words have really mattered to me. And so with that, I just really wanna compliment everyone from our staff on this. 
uh, and of course the public uh, that have been involved. But I appreciate that it went back. I, I like that the divisions came up here individually today because they're the ones that are going to be implementing the specifics for the most part, you know. And then the information is going to come to us so that we can make. Um, better decisions going forward. And so I think that the language has been tightened up for those that are, you know, maybe a little bit frustrated that it might look like things got changed or rolled back. I think that um, uh, for the most part, it was um, intentional to make sure that where we have the authorities, we say that, where we don't have the authorities, or we, maybe it sounded um, a little bit more than uh, what we could have accomplished, um, some adjustments were made. So I think that it was, you know, in that vein that those changes were made. Um, and then in particular, Mr. Bothwell, I appreciate you bringing up affordability. And I just quickly went through the plan again. And I just want to double check with staff. It looks like it's already covered under the needs assessment. That's an area that I think is you know, important. And so just wanted to give staff an opportunity to comment on that. I was looking to see if Joe might come up and comment on that, but it is captured in the needs assessment, is my understanding, mm -hmm. as you pointed out. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. So just wanted to double check. OK, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yeah, I, th I think it is, and, and would note that um, through, I think, one of our conservation and inf informational items had a bit of a gloss on at least uh, the rate structures insofar as um, volumetric incentives that are, are sort of in there. And I think there is a space for us to continue to look at rates and affordability generally. So appreciate that. Board Member McGuire. Yes, thank you, Chair Esquivel. I just want to echo all the comments that were already shared. And um, just know that, yeah, this certainly is a journey. And it's already been a journey. I'm reflecting back to the George Floyd murder, I mean, which really precipitated so much all of this almost all of this work that we're doing here today and those events the protests uh, that stem from that and for me a real um, awakening and, and increased awareness of the racial inequities that are pervasive in our society and I'll just you know for me this these past couple of years have been such a learning experience and a difficult one at that and I've said numerous times you know I I want to start now you know I want this action plan to be done and as you know, off to the races and implementing some of these measures. And so uh, I'm so happy that we're here today that this draft or this document is completed and ready to hit the ground running and and to see that a number of the actions are already being implemented and at some stage of implementation that is really heartening to see. And I, I really feel that the um, this action plan does truly reflect the intent and the spirit of the resolution that we adopted last year. Uh, and addresses the intended outcome. So I too will look forward to the, you know, the briefings, the discussions, the, the annual updates at the board meetings. I think those are all important uh, checkpoints and making sure that we're continuously listening to the public and the community just on the whole in terms of how this action plan is being implemented. And then in each piece of each decision and action that we have to take, to ensure um, we are incorporating racial equity um, discreetly <clears throat> in the work that we do. Uh, I hear you and I agree. Uh, we need to do that. We need to be uh, diligent, mindful, transparent about how that process happens. And Executive Director Sobek, I made a close note of your comments in the very beginning that you know just because everything is not, you know, every action and decision point is not listed in this action plan, we still fully intend to apply a racial equity lens to every decision that we make. I think that's an important takeaway. I hope everyone heard that. Um, and I certainly uh, I support that desire. And, you know, for me, it's, um, you know, we have to we have to walk the talk as board members. I mean, a lot of this is geared towards staff training, uh, <clears throat> towards the work that's done at the staff level, but it applies in my mind all the way up the chain. It applies to the board members ourselves and I certainly take this seriously and personally and you know where I have opportunities for training um, to continue to learn and understand how to address these issues as we go forward in my um, uh, decision making responsibilities I you know I'm going to take advantage of that so I appreciate the tools that are being developed um, the uh, uh, you know the the 
better data and information that we'll have available to make informed decisions and really understand what that balancing and trade-offs look like. You know, whether we're looking at, you know, there's so many issues coming up this next year. Um, you know, we talked about water use efficiency, sigma, uh, drinking, you know, hexavalent chromium, drinking water standards, um, Bay Delta, you know, all those things. It's so hard to do it um, in a silo. It's so hard to do it without good information um, about the implications of um, different decisions and different balancing points that we might make. So I'm really looking forward to having the, you know, the data action plan in place to start to see the, the fruits of some of that information. Uh, I think it's really going to evolve what we can do with this plan and how effective we are in addressing our, our overarching goal. So thank you to staff. I know this has been an incredible amount of work. Uh, I know there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen, you know, just having so many, you know, all the different offices and divisions and everyone, including board members and the public and really just carefully listening uh, to all of that input and trying to synthesize that into one document that's uh, is, is no small feat unto itself, let alone implementation. So just thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Um, I really appreciate that. And I just, I do have yeah, one last question because it came up a couple of times and admittedly it's an area that I support and, but I'm not very um, up to date with what's going on in this spot. So I was wondering if, if staff's there and I can't see everyone who's there, I apologize. Um, but if you could speak to the community capacity building comments that were shared, I think a couple of different stakeholders indicated that in, in some respects, it felt like a, a little bit of a step back from the draft. And, you know, not to say that we can't take two steps forward, but if you could just help me understand where we're at um, with some of those priorities, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, board member, for the just good comments and, and reinforce everything you said, important how foundational the data is to our decision making and uh, eliminating and understanding our own biases and importance and all of that. Um, and Adriana Renteria is not with us and I believe that's where the action lived and so looked to- Yeah, to but I, I can just make a general comment on it and then board member McGuire, we can get back to you with more detail later. So as you pointed out, um, there were some concerns with the community capacity building item because it had had a more detailed description in a prior iteration of the action plan. And um, I think it was, I don't remember which one of our board members today said that um, there was some benefit to creating some language that was more all-encompassing, more general, but Adriana Renteria did have a conversation last night with um, some environmental justice groups who had expressed concern, and where she landed in terms of the summary that she provided back is that she is going to take and lead a more holistic view of that particular action item um, to ensure that their concerns are addressed, but also, of course, keep that conversation going. So we can certainly circle back, as I said, with more specifics. Thank you very much, Ms. Cool. Yeah, board I'll member. just add on that, because I, um, you know, that this is a priority for me. I've been following it. Um, I think this is a good example of just, we need to do a public process around development of it. So I think, you know, there's limited words in the um, document, which is, I think, um, what uh, Nefertari, you are saying. I just, I, I think we really want to make sure that we're, um, you know, fully listening to uh, input as we develop and, you know, get fully briefed and do a whole public process as we are all of these actions. So that one in particular, I think um, there certainly will be. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's definitely a less is more moment where it's uh, it was taken out not to limit, but actually to make sure we weren't, you know, being overly prescriptive and, and or leaving something out before actually listening a little more. Question. Thank you. Uh, and I feel a need to say that I, I agree about um, having a bit more of a public process. Um, I think flexibility is important as much as possible. Uh, but then I think on the other extreme, there might be a concern about it being like a slush fund um, and uh, without accountability or parameters. And so I think a public process will help to ensure the integrity of the fund itself. Thank you, Vice Chair. And again, uh, yeah, very much a balance uh, in how the five of us come together on this critical item. And so just thank you for all the feedback, uh, the work, 
doesn't stop here, uh, but this is actually a, a fantastic moment to just celebrate uh, what has been, as board members here have said, an incredible synthesis of a lot of work out there. We're here trying to be as intentional, if not more, uh, than those that uh, built structures that excluded and here again didn't reflect our, our values in the 21st century. And so um, it, it is why it's so important to be intentional in our actions, in our commitments and follow through, and uh, just appreciate everyone's uh, work with all of this. It is uh, honored to be part of it, so thank you. With that, we can transition. Uh, Chair, thank you again. Chair Escobar. Uh, Sorry, yes, please, oh, I, David Rose. Please. I don't want to make it sound as though we have any check boxes on this plan because there are none, but there is a check mark. I think Eric Ekdahl had mentioned it earlier, but uh, Ms. Willie had asked or Thank you or uh, for a name already. I, I, I Thank you. Uh, please uh, do identify who uh, the point yeah. person is for water uh, rights. Rob McCarthy in the Division of Water Rights is the point person for the item about establishing a single point of contact for Bay Delta Tribal and BIPOC outreach. So Rob McCarthy. Really appreciate you following back on that because um, it came to mind because I recalled Mr. Ekdahl um, identified the name. Um, uh, Mr. McCarthy hopefully will be at tomorrow's meeting and we can maybe identify him uh, for everybody. Okay, with that, thank you. And concludes uh, item number four and just my incredible thanks to everybody for the work. Um, we're at 2.30 or 3.30, well, let's continue on um, to uh, item number five at this point. Um, we'll have a small break and then we'll do six um, for everyone's planning purposes. Item number, and we'll give folks a moment to transition and item number five is consideration of a proposed resolution to amend the State Water Board's conflict of interest code. And really appreciate I know the work that went into this. Good afternoon. Thank you. I know it's been a long day. And so thanks for staying with us. Gracias. Yo sé que ha sido un largo día. I think we may still have some crossfeed from the um, translation, or was that someone else trying to speak? Oh, I think someone came on mute. Okay, we're ready for our item. Ms. Good Kalba, afternoon, good afternoon. Board, Chair Esquivel and other board members. It's good to see you all in person. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, let me discuss the water, Gracias por la oportunidad para... the water board's update to our conflict of interest code. Uh, my name is Amy Kaba and I work at the water board um, as the Form 700 filing officer. And I'm joined by Kim Niemeyer, uh, who is an attorney that works in our Office of Chief Counsel. Um, and I wanted to point out um, that a great majority of this presentation was pulled from directly from the Fair Political Practices Commission website, which is the body that enforces the Political Reform Act of 1974, which is where all of this originated, all these rules and regulations originated. So I highly recommend folks go to the Fair Political Practices Commission website if they need more information and of course, we're here for, for help too. Um, next slide. So what is a conflict of interest code? Um, it designates um, employees that make or participate in making governmental decisions that may have a material effect on a financial interest. Um, it, re it requires state agencies to specify in their code document um, the positions that involve the making or participation in making of decisions which may foreseeably have a material effect on any financial interest. Uh, staff who serve in these positions that are designated in the code 
must file a Form 700. It's also known as a Statement of Economic Interest. They must also take ethics training. It's a mandatory course. Um, the code must adequately differentiate between designated employees through the assignment of disclosure categories. Um, not everybody has to disclose everything and the categories uh, minimize the amount of information that you, you're required to report. The current version of our conflict of interest code um, is, uh, has most of the positions that do need to uh, file a form 700, but there was a decision in 2018 by the Fair Political Practices Commission entitled Rookledge, Stephen Rookledge, and that um, brought to our attention that uh, the state's current code does not include all the positions where the staff participate in making decisions. The state board must therefore expand our conflict of interest code to cover these positions. Next slide. So why uh, must we adopt a con conflict of interest code? It's required of all state and local agencies um, pursuant to the Political Reform Act of 1974 and um, this this act prohibits a public official from using his or her official position to influence a governmental decision in which he or she may have a financial interest. Uh, the individuals in the designated positions must disclose their financial interests as specified in the conflict of interest code um, pursuant to the assigned categories that they're given. Uh, every elected official and public employee who makes or influences governmental decisions is required to submit a Form 700 or Statement of Economic Interest. This provides transparency and ensures accountability in two ways. Um, these documents provide necessary information to the public about a, an official's personal financial interests and it ensures an, officials are making decisions in the best interest of the public and not their own. It serves as a reminder to the public official of potential conflicts of interest so the official can abstain from making or participating in governmental decisions that are deemed conflicts of interest. And these Form 700s are a matter of public record and they must be produced if requested by the public. Next slide. So there are three parts to the conflict of interest code. There's um, the incorporation section, which designates where the Form 700s are filed and retained. Um, then there's a list of the, all of the positions that are required to file. And the second part of the code must list all agency positions that make or participate in make, making decisions that may foreseeably have a material effect on a financial interest. Um, this covers agency members, officers, and employees, and it may include consultants and volunteers on committees. And then the last part of the conflict of interest code are, are the disclosure categories, and these are descriptions of the type of financial interests that um, officials in one or more job classifications must disclose on their Form 700s. Disclosure categories describe the interest to be disclosed and only require the disclosure interest that may be affected by the person's decision making. So the Water Board currently has nine disclosure categories and um, while the categories haven't been substantively changed, we did modify an existing category to apply to the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. Next slide. So the key changes to the code update, um, uh, we are legally required to review our code every other year and uh, we, we did that in 2021, um, but our current code was last changed officially in 2016. So it's, it's uh, been a while since we've changed it. Um, our code must accurately reflect current structure of the agency and properly identify all officials that should be filing a Form 700. These new updates to the, the code will designate all positions held by professional staff, including engineers, scientists, geologists, 
um, and other technical positions that make or participate in making government decisions. The current 2016 version of the code includes most of the positions that make or most of the positions that make decisions, but the 2018 decision, Rookledge, um, brought to our attention, as I mentioned before, that our current code doesn't include all the positions where staff participate in making decisions. So um, participate, participating in making a governmental decision includes providing information and opinion or recommendation for the purpose of affecting the decision without significant intervening substantive review. Next slide. So I wanna focus on that, um, the difference between make a decision and participate in making a decision. Um, so here we have a comparison of the examples um, and what it means to make a decision and participate in making a decision. Um, and so while our current code includes the water board's decision makers the reason we're updating our code is we need to capture the water board employees who participate in making decisions and um, i wanted to focus a little bit on the statement without significant intervening substantive review next slide so the professional staff at the water board such as engineers and geologists environmental scientists participate in making governmental decisions, which include negotiating terms of a contract, writing specifications of a bid, interpreting or analyzing data relied on by decision makers, and advise or make recommendations without significant intervening substantive review. So this, this term without significant substantive review has been interpreted by the FPPC, the Fair Political Practices Commission, to require more than the mere review of supervisors of the recommendations, but rather the independent checking of results without solely relying on the data or analysis provided by the staff person. So staff um, is considered to participate in making this decision even if it's reviewed by superiors um, if those superiors rely on the data without checking it independently, and those superiors also rely on the professional judgment of the staff person, and if the staff person in some other way actually influences the final decision. So um, as an example, if staff not only does an analysis and a calculation, but also decides or advises as to which is the best right answer, the task is no longer ministerial or technical, and that's participating in making the decision. Um, in addition to these positions, there are a few analysts and other positions who are also being included in the conflict of interest code because of the work they do. And also by being designated staff, um, professional staff are also being recognized for the important work that they do for the water board and the public. Next slide. So the process to amend our code is, there's several steps involved. Um, the, it, this process began in March of 2021. Um, all of the division chiefs and executive officers of the regional boards were asked to review their organization's designated positions and make recommendations to add others and change current ones. And a draft of the code, after all that was done, a draft of the code was sent to the Fair Political Practice, Practices Commission in uh, mid-year mid last uh, 2021, and the, they performed their review and provided some feedback to us last summer. And then a second review, because so much time had passed because of the pandemic, I guess, um, we asked the executive officers and regional um, regional executive officers and deputy directors again to, to get their input. And then we gave public notice in, in October of 2022 and public comment was extended one time and that ended on December 15th of 2022. And upon board approval, we will submit the final revised conflict of interest code to the FPPC again for a final time. 
and um, they'll return it to us after their review and then we'll send it to the Office of Administrative Law who will send it to the Secretary of State for endorsement, um, which is basically approving it, putting a date on it, and uh, 30 days after that Secretary of State's endorsement, the code becomes effective. And concurrently, while all of this is happening, we will be internally getting our ducks in a row as far as um, adding new filers to our website that we use called eDisclosure, which allows filers to submit their Form 700s electronically, and it also allows them uh, to sign the Form 700s electronically. The next slide. So um, as far as concerns and comments about this change, um, we received a total of 17 comments. Um, and a response to the comments was provided with the board agenda materials. Um, but to briefly summarize those comments, um, four of the comments were just about adding positions that were left off or grammar and punctuation changes and all those changes were made. And three of the comments expressed concerns about having to disclose property um, interests, specifically about how this would affect staff's privacy. And those comments were responded to individually. Um, and we, we indicated to those folks that um, generally they don't need to uh, list their primary residence on the Form 700, but it is still considered an economic interest for uh, conflict of interest purposes. And um, for property interests that do have to be listed, you can also use an assessor's parcel number. You don't have to list a street address. And then two comments um, asked why the State Board is updating its conflict of interest code to include all professional staff, including engineers and scientists. Um, and these were concerns from the um, engineers and scientists unions. And our Labor Relations Unit um, did have an in-person meeting with a representative for the scientists and engineers to discuss their concerns. And we also, uh, they also sent a written response and I'm, I know we did receive another written response late Friday, um, so we're reviewing that. Um, and commenters were responded to. Um, we told them about the Rookledge decision and we br that brought to our attention that we were not including the positions where staff participate in making decisions. Um, and then there was also three commenters that stated they did not think that their positions should be designated because their work is purely technical or ministerial or they do not make decisions um, that have a material effect on a financial interest. But they were told to check with their supervisors uh, to see if they agreed. And um, this exception does not apply where analysis or recommendations based on professional judgment are involved. So for example, if staff is not, not only does an analysis and a calculation, but also decides to advise which is the best right answer, then the task isn't ministerial or, or technical anymore. Uh, employees that participate in making governmental decisions must be designated unless there is significant intervening substantive review of their work, just to reiterate that. and. Um, let's see, next slide. So as far as the implementation um, of this new document, this code and the training, um, all new filers will have the opportunity to attend a webinar and we hope to be able to have the FPPC provide uh, a, an in, a live webinar uh, just for us. Um, before their first submission is due. Um, the FPPC does also hold periodic free webinars on how to file your Form 700 throughout the year. That it's free to sign up and it's self, you just go to their website and sign up. You don't have to get any, um, fill out any paperwork. Um, and employees may sign up directly on the FPPC website. Employees may also review the uh, series of YouTube videos that they have produced in order to complete their Form 700. Um, and 
All new filers will be entered into the e-disclosure da database, which is the website where you can electronically file, and you'll receive notifications via email regarding your obligations and your due dates, and you'll get reminders. And there's also um, lots of training resources on the FPPC website and on our intranet. And I'm also available as a resource. You can call me anytime uh, if you have questions. And also Kim uh, or someone in OCC, OCC is going to be available to help people too if they have um, tricky, tricky questions I can't answer. Um, and then, um, okay, next slide. So once we obtain the board approval, um, we will send to the FPPC. Um, I think we kind of covered this a little bit already and we'll be working on the process um, in, the, in the coming months. Um, of course, the timeline is subject to change if, you know, because we're relying on other agencies to get our documents back to us. But we hope to have everything completed sometime during the second quarter of 2023. So next slide. So we recommend that you adopt the proposed updates to the conflict of interest code to be consistent with requirements of the Political Reform Act. And the State Water Board action on this item will assist the Water Board in reaching goals five and six of the strategic plan update. Um, in particular, approval of this item will assist in improving transparency and accountability and promote fair and equitable application of all relevant laws, regulations, policies, and procedures. And thank you for the opportunity to present information concerning the Water Board's conflict of interest update. And Kim and I are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Kaba, for just the good work and implement, uh, updating and here implementing, continue to implement um, our important reporting requirements around this. I know. Uh, I can sense and I know and we'll hear, I know we have a commenter here, Jesse Rodriguez, concern, continued concern around uh, just the burden that this will put on, on a number of folks out there as someone who has to report. Um, and it really is a matter of the complexity of what investments you may have out there. But um, I, I know that there's incredible support waiting for folks that have questions. And through uh, both the e-disclosure, um, you know, the, the website, but then also the Signing, uh, it's actually not a very complicated and or long process. Um, doesn't have to um, be as burdensome as, as some may be fearing. Um, and here, I'm glad for the resources that are being developed um, or that are out there, but that will help continue to shepherd folks to uh, around any concerns or questions. And so just thank you for the good work. I know uh, this is important to make sure it's updated and uh, reflective of of what the law is uh, around the work. And, and disclosure and ethics is, and the transparency around uh, preserving the public trust in our decision making is incredibly critical. And so here, um, updating it, although it will come with some work for folks that they will have to do further, um, comes with great benefit to our decision making, the trust and the work that we do. So just thank you for that. Colleagues with any questions or comments before we go to uh, Ms. Rodriguez? Okay, we go to Jesse Rodriguez and apologize, I need to pull up my uh, list. Uh, go to him, apologies. Good afternoon, honorable board member, uh, honorable chair and board members, can you hear me? We can, good afternoon, Mr. Okay. Rodriguez. Good afternoon, it's an honor to appear before you all today. My name is Jesse Rodriguez and I'm counsel for the Professional Engineers in California Government, PEG, and the California Association of Professional Scientists, CAPS. PEG represents approximately 14,000 engineers and related professionals in state service, approximately 1,100 of which are at the water boards, employed as water resource control engineers, sanitary engineers, and engineering geologists. CAPS represents approximately 4,500 state scientists, approximately 450 at the water boards, employed as environmental scientists, research scientists, and chemists. We appear today because we have outstanding concerns and questions about the water board's amendments to its conflict of interest policy. Specifically, the water boards is proposing to add over 1,000 PEG and CAPS represented employees 
to its Form 700 list of required disclosures. This is obviously significant for us. To be clear, neither PEG nor CAPS objects to adding any of our members as required disclosures if they make or participate in making decisions which may foreseeably have a material effect on any financial interest. So there must be a connection between the decisions the employees are making or are involved in making and any financial interest that they may have that would be materially affected by that decision. In some areas of the proposed amendments, it does that. For example, disclosure category six states all investments from sources of the type which provide research, planning, or environmental impact reporting services related to water supply or water quality. We can readily see the connection here and have no objection to the inclusion of this particular category. However, in other areas, the, the proposed, rule, proposed rules do not make this connection. For example, if the proposed amendments are approved as is, all of our represented employees will have to disclose the following under disclosure category two. All investments from entities of the type to contract with the state water boards to provide services, supplies, materials, machi machinery, or equipment. We asked the water board staff what the term supplies means. We were told that the term supplies includes paper, such as the white sheets of paper in your printers. So under this category, if the water board purchases its paper from Office Depot, then employees will have to disclose any interest such as stock in Office Depot. However, though the connection there is extremely attenuated, it gets worse because they will also be required to disclose any fi financial interest from entities of the type to contract with the water boards. So in addition to reporting their stock holdings in Office Depot, if any employee also owns stock in Staples, they will also have to disclose that too. What we've been asking the water boards, HR and legal staff, is how does an employee's ownership in Office Depot or Staples stock in any way impact any governmental decision they may make as an engineer, geologist or scientist or chemist at the water board? We have never received a clear answer, hence our objection. There are other questions that have yet to be answered such as why every unit nine and 10 employee, irrespective of position, duties, or tenure has been placed in the same disclosure categories. For example, there is a big difference in terms of duties and decision-making authority between a new employee who comes in at the base of their classification is very likely still in training mode and a 30 year employee who is more likely to be tasked with providing recommendations or final approvals. We have other questions such as how do employees know all of the materials, machinery, equipment that the water boards uses? The responses we have received thus far are unclear, but it, it sounds like this. In addition, this is from the water board's December 28th letter to both PEG and CAPS. In addition, people in the offices generally know of the types of services, supplies, materials, machinery, and equipment that the water board contracts with just by looking around and being familiar with the services, supplies, materials, machinery, and equipment that they see used. So apparently what, the, what our members and your, and your staff and employees are expected to do is look around and they see a, a, a HP printer, for example, they have that has to trigger in their mind that they must disclose not only ownership stock in HP, but potentially every other tech company that, that exists today. I don't think this has a foreseeably material effect on any financial interest uh, with respect to any decisions that they're gonna be making. Um, the water boards has the authority to demand compliance with all of its policies. We don't, we don't doubt that. And employees, our members have a duty to comply with those policies. However, when the policy is vague, that exponentially increases the likelihood of, of confusion. This confusion often results in conflict and this conflict can result in employee discipline. When we raised this disciplinary issue with water board staff during our November 22nd meeting, we were told by a staff member who works in your discipline unit, in the water board's discipline unit, that the water boards would likely only use it to reprimand an employee if that employee has a history of dishonesty or words to that effect. We responded that no employee should ever be disciplined if the cause of their compliance is the policy itself. To address this concern, PEG and CAPS proposed an amendment that would first require notification to the employee, a reasonable opportunity for that employee to comply before the department moves to, towards any disciplinary action, including a reprimand. In closing, PEG and CAPS are requesting that the board not approve the amendments today. 
but instead directed staff to resume meeting with us so that we can arrive at a policy that makes sense, is clear and actually furthers the water board's legitimate interest in, in ensuring that its employees are only making the, the decisions that are in the best interest of the public and the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Looking to uh, our folks for any response to uh, Mr. Rodriguez's um, points. Sure. Um, so, in, I mean, I think the categories that he's talking about um, in terms of the supplies, um, there are people or there are, you know, laboratory equipment, there are monitoring equipment. So when people are familiar, you know, with the equipment that they ordered generally, I mean, that's what it's covering. And so it isn't a, a gotcha sort of exercise. This is an exercise of thinking about, you know, what are my um, financial interests that I have? Do I own stocks that exceed $2,000? And if I do, then looking at those categories and trying to decide, does that fit within, is it of the type? And I think that exercise, we have not had any problems with um, people figuring out whether or not they need to, to comply. We, people often over-report and, and come to us with questions too. Um, so none of this has really been an issue in the past and these categories are not new. These are categories that people have had to, you know, work with um, since we've had our disclosure categories and they're also based on um, templates that the FPPC puts out. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure how else to, to no, address I, it. No, I, I appreciate, thank you, I appreciated uh, that response. You know, I think the, Mr. Rodriguez is pulling up um, hypotheticals that again at this point in even running our, our program we just don't see and if they do come up you know again a lot of confusion there are resources both internal to us and so far as a point of contact through Amy and the office of chief counsel uh, to work through whatever those those questions may be so I appreciate that I think you know the point um, I'm hearing there and important is again that these categories have existed we've been using them other agencies as well um, and the sort of mass confusion that I, I think and or um, uh, certain hypotheticals here that Mr. Rodriguez is, is kind of working from are, again, um, we haven't seen that sort of um, challenge that people have. And as to your point, people may over-report a bit um, and if they want to make sure that they're, they're coming at that right touch, if you will, being able to consult and work with um, the Office of Chief Counsel and Amy and then also, if we need, you know, elevating to, to our sister agency who can help unpack what, you know, maybe a, a thorny situation or something. I, I feel confident in, in our ability to do that, I guess is what I would say. Vice Chair, please. Just because I think there might be some employees watching that um, are a little anxious about this. Um, could you provide um, a, a hypothetical answer to the hypothetical question? Like if someone were to come with to you, either of you, with that type of question, um, would you do anything more than refer them to the website? Sure. Or no, would I, you, I what, would, what would you say? If they came to me with, um, you know, financial interests that they have and they were unsure whether or not it fit into the category, um, I would, you know, help them to, to think about what that category is about and what might be included. Um, you know, most of our, um, I mean, so this might come up, for example, if they had individual stocks that were worth more than $2,000 and it's for company XYZ and they're like, this is the only financial interest I have besides my house, what do you think? Do I need to report it? And so we would look at the categories that we have and decide whether it was of the type that provides services or equipment um, you know, if it, if it doesn't, if it's not that kind of company, then, you know, I would advise them that they probably didn't need to report that. Um, similarly too, you know, is it a, is it a company of the type that we regulate? And we could talk about what those, what, what types of, um, things that the water board regulates. They may not be familiar with everything, so we could, you know, help them to understand those types of um, things that we regulate. 
And then how about as to the incidental, you know, the, the paper, the copy paper, as opposed to lab equipment, that sort of thing. Right, so if someone owned, um, an engineer owned $10,000 of stock in Xerox, um, we would probably advise them that they would want to um, report that because it's probably of the type. And the one thing I will add to what, what Ms. Niemeyer said, and I think she did a good job covering the issues, and I think Ms. Calvo's presentation was excellent as well, is you know, there, there are lots of different reasons why we have these tools. Um, and when the staff come to us with questions that are unanswered, there are additional tools that we can rely upon. For example, all of the water boards contracts are available on our intranet site. Currently, a lot of that's getting pushed out to Fiscal as well. So it's something, the Fiscal Open Government website. So people could actually search even without coming to us to figure out what kind of supplies and what types of contracts the water boards were entering into. So if they were trying to resolve any ambiguity about whether one of their interests. Um, as Ms. Niemeyer indicated and Ms. Calva indicated, a number of staff tend to over-report in an abundance of caution. Um, there's no harm from that, and there's actually significant value to that because one of the processes we have in place here at the Water Board is that supervisors become aware of economic interests that are held by the people they supervise so that it becomes more than just the employee keeping an eye out for their own ethical and conflict of interest responsibilities to avoid participating in a governmental decision involving one of their economic interests. But it essentially becomes a multiplier because their supervisory team, as well as the Office of Chief Counsel, also become aware of potential conflicts. So not only does this help ensure the integrity of the Water Board's decision-making framework, but it also helps and thereby provide confidence to the public, but it also helps protect the individual scientists, engineers, and other um, staff that are participating in governmental decisions. Thank you. Board Member McGuire. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to, you know, those, those responses are really helpful. Uh, and I just wanted to give a little bit of context for my background. I'm a registered civil engineer. I've worked at multiple levels at the Water Board as staff and now, of course, as appointed board member. But I had to complete the seven, you know, Form 700 as staff and navigate that process. And I do think the resources that are available, uh, the training and you know, other tools and, and staff support to help understand you know, what needs to be disclosed and how to go about that process has always been you know, there and a good um, a resource. And I never had any, you know, personally never had any issues with it. I know everyone has their own financial uh, circumstances and, and you know, there could be complicated situations out there. But I, you know, in hearing the staff presentation and that there will be training, there will be notice to staff to, you know, be able to have time to prepare and, you know, properly understand their unique situation. You know, I'm very comfortable that this is the appropriate step to be taking, but I certainly appreciate Peg's concerns and understand their um, and, and cap and, you know, their need to look out for their members. It, it makes sense. And these are good questions to ask and understand before we proceed, but I just wanted to signal that I'm uncomfortable today. Thank you for that board member and uh, for helping bridge that experience. I know uh, from reporting from staff, even here to the board as well. And thank you. And again, to vice chair's point, uh, I know, you know, there are a number of our folks, I'm sure tuning in and feeling a little anxious about this expansion. Uh, no, we're here to, it's not a gotcha game. Um, it's not a, an excuse to try to, um, or, or uh, here, you know, desire to find disciplinary actions or anything. This is truly to help continue to con build the, the full faith that we all know is necessary in the transparency of our decision-making and interests of all of us collectively in it. Um, so uh, board members, any anything further? And if not, we can entertain a motion. Yeah, I just wanna thank you for the excellent presentation and th for the responses. And with that, I'm prepared to make a motion uh, to approve item five. I'll second. Thank you both. Uh, Ms. Tyler, can you please call the roll call vote? Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. The vote is unanimous and uh, the resolution and amendment is adopted. Thank you. Really appreciate the good work, Ms. Calva. Thank good you, everyone. You. Thank you, thank you.
Let's go ahead and take uh, a five minute break. Uh, so we and I know we're already a little late in the day, but um, let's bring ourselves back here at 4.15 and uh, we'll go on to our, an important uh, discussion about our yearly strategic work plan. Uh, I know uh, board member McGuire will be losing you. I believe you're at four. So thank you That's right. um, and appreciate everything. So we'll be back here at 4.15. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, we are at 416. We can gather back and we are on item number six, which is a informational item and a discussion on our yearly strategic work plan. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, Kick it over to our executive director. Right. Thanks, Chair Escobar and, um, and remaining board members. Um, and I'm, I'm really sorry that um, we're at the point in the day where we don't have the full uh, board membership present, because this is one of the few opportunities that you have to discuss this in 
this work plan all together, but it is what it is, and we have had some good discussions with each of you um, in your pairs. And I, I won't go into a huge amount of, of detail. I did want to make one note, which is that there were some minor changes made last Friday and posted last Friday. So if, if anybody downloaded um, the previously posted version, um, they might want to go back and just um, look at the Friday version. They were very, very relatively small um, changes, and we'll, we'll go over most of them. Um, once again, um, this is a plan that we, um, a, a work plan that is not approved by you all, but that reflects both staff input and board input and reflects what we will be spending our time as staff um, uh, um, as priorities and is really um, the high priority guidance that we receive from you all about how we should be spending our time. And these are the items that we are generally going to divert resources away from other items to make sure that they get done. Um, but with, of course, the uh, footnote that everything changes and you know we will come back to you all um, and let you know if we are if there's a new priority um, as there there were in past years when we had unexpected emergencies or new priorities from the governor's office or um, covid intervened in our lives or um, there's always there's always something especially in the water world but generally speaking i think that this has been a good roadmap to the work that we're going to prioritize within the board and um, as usual, we, a lot of the work that we do at the state boards takes more than one year to complete. So every year, a few items do come off of this priority list and a few items come on. Um, and so we have um, provided at the back of this document uh, some of the items that have come off for various reasons, including they've been successfully um, um, completed or they've been deprioritized to allow other items to go on or for whatever, or, or that they've become moot, other, whatever, whatever the reason is. And then what we're going to, um, what we, we, we will talk about anything that you all wish to discuss, but what we wanted to do is have a, a, um, a fairly quick step presentation where we go over the newly added items and then the items, whether they're new or not, to which um, we've added the red star, which is our priority, priority items. Um, and I would just, uh, um, the one other new thing we've done this year is in this document we have added a little um, blue W um, icon that indicates that the item is part of the, the water supply strategy that was issued this August by the governor's office. And um, there may be some other water supply strategy items that um, that aren't in this, but that just means that we aren't going to be working on them this year. And to the extent that they come online in later years, we will add those. But some of those are get a red star, some of them don't. But we wanted to, without completely reordering um, the way we organized this document, we wanted to just make sure that you and members of the public are are able to to follow how we are um, um, that we that we are uh, identifying those items as being um, important and are tracking them. So uh, with that, I think that um, um, the last thing I will just say is, as, as, we, as I said earlier, this, this document clearly does not um, represent everything that the board does. It doesn't even represent all of our priorities. It really represents what we think are priorities that need particular attention and can't afford to have resources diverted from them. It is sort of an ongoing discussion with, with you all board members about um, whether an item um, is sort of more routine, um, core work, and we're going to be doing it, but it doesn't need to be reflected in this document or whether it needs to be um, elevated and identified as a priority for some, for some reason. Some of these items are going to require explicit um, action taken by you as board members, some not. Um, so it's an art, not quite a science about what goes on this list, and so if there are um, you know, last minute recommendations, we, we are open to that. But I think, I hope we realize at this point that in, that collectively the items that are in this document are helpful for um, getting us all to understand uh, what we should be working on and making sure that we are accountable to you all for that. And, uh, and that, uh, again, that we need to check in and do course corrections as the year goes on and have a refresh uh, a year from now. So with that, what we thought we would do is just run through the document um, and not go through every item, but 
uh, go through the, again, the, the new items that are indicated in gray, the red asterisk items, which are the priority priority items, <laughs> the highest of the high priority, and uh, the water supply strategy items. So. Okay. I, I looked ahead. I cheated. I got the first one. So uh, first new item, if you scroll down to the, uh, um, we'll get to through it. Well, the number is 1.1.5, but we're going to keep going down through this introductory stuff. There we go. And it's the statewide needs assessment for um, wastewater. Um, we have a needs assessment that we did for drinking water. This is for wastewater. And it also includes um, looking at the, um, um, trying to create that holistic view of the of the needs associated with um, our disadvantaged communities for wastewater, including consolidation issues. And um, if we scroll down, I can just take care of this. Yeah. If you just scroll down to the next stop right there, back up to 1.2.1. I think we've talked about this a couple of times today, and you may want to have Darren come up if you have questions on this, but it is um, moving forward as a red start priority, trying to get the uh, maximum containment level for um, Chrome 6 um, across the finish line this year. Next one, I believe, is 2.1.1. It's under the uh, Protect and Restore Watersheds, Marine Waters, and Ecosystems theme. And this one is. Um, continue to work on the drought emergency flows. We've got uh, emergency uh, flows and curtailments regulations in place in multiple watersheds throughout the state. We'll continue to implement those, and if the drought persists, we will um, can we will update those or propose to update those if needed. Uh, one thing to note here is that um, this was modified to. Uh, reflect some of the language in the racial equity action plan discussed earlier today. And in doing this work, we're affirming our commitment to consider impacts um, to black, indigenous, people of color communities, tribal beneficial uses, and cultural resources. Next one is 2.1.2. This is Clear Lake Hitch. We've heard about this recently at our last board meeting. It's an emerging issue. The hitch is a small fish that resides in Clear Lake and its tributaries, and we're committed to working on the issue. It's, uh, the fish is experiencing significant declines um, and has a serious risk, and we will be working on um, collaborative efforts to address flows in the watershed, and we will also commit to um, ensuring that water rights are uh, enforced and abided by. Additionally, if needed, um, we'll evaluate uh, the feasibility of uh, taking additional regulatory actions. 2.1.3 is uh, a start priority and a continuation from the last plan, temperature management for fish. This mainly pertains to order 90-5 and temperature protection activities downstream of Lake Shasta in the Sacramento River to protect winter run salmon. And, you know, hopefully this will be an improved year compared to the last couple for temperature management. But as we heard about in the drought update or the hydro hydrologic update information earlier today, we're not completely out of the woods here by any stretch. And it's kind of a wait and see um, if, um, if hydrologic conditions don't improve, um, we'll end up probably spending a, a fair amount of time on this, and if things get better, we'll spend less. Okay, if we can cruise down to 2.1.10. Um, though this doesn't sound new to anyone that's been on the board for a while, it's um, we once again are doing an update to the ones through cooling, and this year we made it a priority. Um, our, hopefully this will be the last one, but I've said that before. Um, yeah, the next one. Why are we here? I'm sure he'd say something further as well. So. Yeah. 2.1.11 is new. It's the broad um, band middle mile permitting. Um, we have a number of actions moving forward to streamline that permitting and get it going faster. Is a very short time frame on the federal money that's being used to support this. 
And so we are making sure that we're not a, a bottleneck on that. You've already done the first piece with the construction stormwater permit. Um, and we will continue to um, make this a priority so that um, we can address this. I think this has some important um, environmental justice benefits to getting this in place, but. Um, yeah, uh, I appreciate on this, uh, not often thought that the board is necessarily involved in ensuring that we, we get to communities here with broadband, uh, but it does completely support all the data work and discussion and access to our processes that we've really talked about. So it's nice to have you know, this little cross-pollination in the project, yeah. so I appreciate it. Uh, the next one is uh, 2.1.12, which is the uh, DDT funding. We received money in the legislature for um, um, addressing and helping with the uh, cleanup of the DDT off of the Palos Verde shelf. We have, as you all know, we approved in December um, uh, delegation to the uh, to Karen to be able to enter into a contract on this. We're moving forward with that. It is also a very short time frame on it, um, and we will be getting the contract in place and getting the um, RFPs for the research this year. Um, so high priority to get that addressed. Um, the next one is 211.13, which is the four pesticide permits. Um, that are um, behind their MPDS permits for doing something we don't usually do, which is put toxics in water. Um, but we're permitting that because of very specific um, um, needs for um, aqua uh, aquatic weed, invasive weeds, and, um, and also for the vector control um, issues. And, um, and then 2.1.14 is a, um, is, um, an OCC DWQ mix, which is um, high priority petitions. We're committing to um, finishing the um, the um, existing dairy order um, um, and the um, irrigated lands from reason three. Um, I, I can't say we'll get both of those totally committed this year, but that's their high priority to get us moving forward on this. The next one is 3.1.1, and I'll just note we're now moving into the third thematic um, priority of the work plan, which is increased uh, statewide water resilience in the face of climate change and other threats. And 3.1.1 is implement water rights modernization. We were uh, fortunate to get a resource augmentation last year for additional staff and funding. And this, uh, this new action is about basically doing what we said we were gonna do with those resources. And it includes things like initiating a telemetry, telemetry pilot project or pilot program uh, for more closer to real time uh, exercise, ex implementation of the, of the water rights system during drought. It's about expanding models and planning capabilities in the division of water rights for uh, assessing drought conditions and demands in the watershed, improving the models that we have and expanding those models to other watersheds if they're needed. And uh, it's generally about um, preparing for future droughts um, and taking the steps necessary to be ready when they occur as we know they will. Uh, the next item is 3.1.2. This is temporary urgency change petitions. We don't know that we will get temporary urgency change petitions. Hopefully we will not, but if we do, uh, they will be a, a substantial uh, staff resource demand and we have you know, no choice but to evaluate them and uh, work on them. So we leave that in as an ongoing priority. Great, we're gonna drop down to 3.1.3, uh, which is um, drinking water drought response program. This is an ongoing priority. We started um, this year and we will continue, even though we've just had endless rain, there will still be a need for, um, I expect to respond to drinking water supplies where drought wells have gone dry and continue throughout the year. And I think that brings us to 3.1.4. Uh, 
which is a water supply strategy action emergency urban water conservation. This is actually almost a verbatim direct pull from the water supply strategy. And what we'll be do doing is developing short term efficiency based water conservation targets for the 400 plus urban water suppliers based on the characteristics of their service area, things like climate, uh, climate zone, water demand, landscape area, population and other relevant factors. The idea is we will have these targets at the ready if they're needed, but at this point there's no plans to implement those targets. And I think that takes us to 3.2.1, um, which is uh, direct portable reuse. Um, as you all know, this is a start priority because of a, a requirement to get the direct portable reuse regs done by December 2023, and also develop the programs to support those regs, including the um, pretreatment um, for those um, upstream industries, and um, hey, can I ask a question? Should yeah. this have a should this have a blue W? Is this part of the water supply strategy? It is, right? So we'll, we'll go ahead and add Appreciate that. that. And um, <clears throat> the next one, three point two point two, is um, infrastructure funding. It's got a star and W. It is. Um, uh, obviously a big priority with the money coming in and making sure that we're um, providing the, the funding um, for, for drinking water, for wastewater, for our infrastructure. Um, um, we will also, I would just say, you know, this is also one that's going to be, um, need to have um, analysis on how we're spending this funding. You heard Joe talk, this is gonna intersect with that, on that piece. Brings us to 3.2.2, or sorry, 3.2.3, uh, urban water use efficiency framework. This is our work to adopt permanent regulations to implement the uh, conservation as a California way of life legislation that was passed in 2018, and also to consider the recent recommendations from uh, the Department of Water Resources. And then moving down to 3.2.4, uh, this is another water supply strategy as was the or water supply um, um, for hotter, drier climate as was the last one. This one is our work on the WISIP program or water storage investment program. Uh, this is a priority for the administration and for the board. Um, this is to uh, make sure that we can do our part to implement the water storage programs that the Water Commission is working on funding. Our work here mainly involves work on the necessary water right permitting, and then for a subset of the projects to enter into contracts for the water quality public benefits that are claimed by the project proponents. And then we can go down to um, 3.2.5. This is um, all the planning work associated with uh, recycled water, desal, and stormwater capture that's in the water supply strategy, um, and that will be um, um, worked on the next this year and the following year, and then we'll be on to implementation of those, and so things will change in the priority setting. Um, I appreciate uh, this, and I know that um, in just that one paragraph, there's a lot uh, that we've kind of packed in uh, that's part of the water supply strategy and that there's already been a lot of outreach. I, I know from water agencies and groups wanting to understand what's this strike team, what are we doing, how are we gonna be doing it? Um, and appreciate we'll have more to come on that as we unpack that. But just to note, there's, there's a lot that is, I think, um, in there and I really appreciate the great leadership that's really come from our, our folks here, you specifically as well, uh, Mr. Bishop around just kind of helping to, to start to do a lot of that work. And I'd be happy at any time to spend more time talking about each one of the words in there that means 10 hours of staff work and you know. Thank you. But um, the next one is 3.2.6, which is on-site um, reuse regulations that was required. It is um, um, being led by um, Department of Drinking Water, Division of Drinking Water, but doing non-portable reuse uh, for um, um, recycling on, on site. 
think we can scroll down to 3.3.1. Uh, this is essentially implementing uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It's a continued priority. It's also identified in the water supply strategy. Uh, we don't know what this year will bring exactly, but this may be the year that uh, plans come into the purview of the board, depending on the Department of Water Resources evaluation of, of the plans, but they are at a pivotal moment right now where they will need to be making some big decisions on a number of plans. And there's certainly the possibility that um, some could get kicked over to the State Water Board's purview. If that's the case, our role will uh, change significantly and that will be um, more in a you know front and center high visitability position where we need to um, consider uh, probationary status of those basins if they do come to us. And then 3.3.2 um, is somewhat related and we talked about this earlier today. This is a new, a new action, also a water supply strategy action. And this is just basically processing water rights for underground storage. Again, you heard about this a bit earlier today. It is a priority for us. We have dedicated staff to make sure that we are assisting applicants with the 180 day and five year temporary permits that are available. And also that we have staff available to process those applications once they are submitted. Okay, and I think we can move down to 3.4.1. Um, um, this is an ongoing action that's prioritized um, as um, for the uh, this year to get the um, general order for utilities over the finish line. Um, and this is for pre and post fire activity associated with uh, keeping the power on. And then um, going down to 3.5.1, this is um, uh, one that's been on our priority list for a couple of years to all the work has been done and we will be bringing it to you um, in the second quarter of 2023 for the uh, um, site specific objectives. We also, um, the next one, which is the cost of municipal stormwater, that, um, that proposed salt should be before you in the first or second quarter of this year, second quarter of this year before June. Um, both of those are have been long projects that um, are wrapping up, which is really nice to see. Um, and then the, the next 3.5.3, which on the first one on the next page is uh, water supply strategy. Um, it's been an ongoing project on how do we um, uh, develop uh, requirements to, to uh, incentivize and improve our uh, ability to um, infiltrate stormwater. Um, and so that um, project is also actually a part of component of the water supply strategy. And then if we cruise down to 3.5.6, this is a new um, um, evaluation of the public process associated with uh, of getting input and on um, the projects for our storms program and um, secondly, um, looking at make, ensuring that those projects also help with our water supply strategy goals. Um, so we'll be reevaluating how we do the public input and um, bring a proposal back to the board for their information. Would you bring us to 3.6.1, Bay Delta plans. Uh, we're gonna hear about this probably all day tomorrow, so I won't go into detail here. I'll just say that it remains a high priority to implement the uh, San Joaquin Southern Delta uh, plan amendments and to update the Bay Delta plan for the Delta and the Sacramento River and its tributaries, including consideration of voluntary agreements. And then there is a, um, a new priority 3.6.2 or a new action, also a water supply strategy action, also a priority, which is Delta conveyance. Uh, the Department of Water Resources is currently deep in its CEQA process for evaluating the Delta conveyance project. If the project is to move forward, it will require uh, water right change petitions to add new points of diversions for the state water project. Uh, we believe it's likely that will petition will come to us uh, in this current year. And if it does, um, we're committed to the necessary processing and it will be a substantial workload for the board.
Yeah, and actually I'm noticing that um, although it's not marked new, I'd like to start with 4.1.1 under the engagement section because there is a new piece of language there related to Assembly Bill 2108 that I want to highlight. So the Office of Public Participation is um, working on guidance related to that to make sure we are meaningfully outreaching to the disadvantaged communities and California Native American tribes that are a part of um, what AB 2108 is trying to accomplish. And also, we touched on this in the Racial Equity Action Plan, but they're working on a language access document um, for guidance as well. And both of those documents they're planning to finalize this quarter. So from there, we can go down to, yes, that first new one. Um, so first, I just want to say that one of the things that we set out to do this time in the work plan is ensure that the communications items in here actually support the other policy actions within the work plan. So that's some of what you're seeing here in this um, expanded communications section. So for SAFER, of course, um, you know, we have, it's not that we haven't been doing this, but we really want to double down on our work to um, promote what's going on in terms of our work and the partnerships that we have for advancing safe and affordable drinking water for Californians and also celebrate our shared accomplishments around this program. Um, let's move on to the next one. So um, Sigma is highlighted, but that's actually not for us. So I don't know if someone else wants to speak to that before I go on. If not, I'll just go ahead with conservation. So um, it seems sometimes like our whole life is about um, not only drought, but also conservation. And so again, this is another area where we've been doing some work. But of course, um, our conservation team is very much focused on the California way of life framework. And we have already begun meeting with them and have drafted a communications plan um, that we're continuing to finalize to ensure that it's really understandable for folks what it means when we say uh, making water conservation a California way of life and that also there's an engagement component part of that that we're working with Office of Public Participation on to make sure that we're getting input and not um, doing this on our own or doing it in a vacuum. Uh, next one, please. So, you know, we have amazing experts at the water boards who are very adept, many of them, at communicating about their work. And then we have some other folks who aren't as comfortable with doing that. And we want to provide them with tools and resources so that they can more effectively and more comfortably engage with members of the media. So that's what um, this one is about. It's also about building out those resources that we know um, not only our staff, but the board rely on, such as talking points. We have started a talking points library, and we're continuing to build that out. But we want to get to a place soon where we're actually sharing that and also getting feedback. There are many other people who work on messaging, and they will have an opportunity to contribute to that as well. And then the last one, um, and board member Diodamo, you had some input on the groundwater recharge, which we know, especially in the media, has been a topic of interest as of late with the recent um, conditions that we've had. But beyond groundwater recharge, you know, we view our role as a communications office. Part of our role is greater awareness overall of the regulatory work that we do and the reason that the regulatory work is needed to really move the dial on um, environmental protection and our mission as a whole in California. So that's what this particular item is about. And so we want to build out plans to do that as well. And then the last one I'm going to go over, even though it's not communications, it's racial equity. There's one thing I want to say about that, but I'll wait until we get through this section. So I believe that brings us to 4.3.1, which is modernize water rights data. This is what I think you're all familiar with is the Upwards uh, project. Uh, we have secured approximately $30 million already for a complete overhaul of the state's water rights system. There is additional funding in the budget, uh, in the current budget, if passed, would give us the you know, total required funding needed to complete the project. And I really view this as sort of the backbone of modernizing water rights. Uh, you can't modernize water rights as a whole unless you have a data system that is capable of bringing in the you know, data that's collected and being able to organize it in a sensible format and almost more importantly, pull it out for use 
in doing things like curtailments and managing the system during times of drought. And I think if we go down now to racial equity. Yeah, so I just wanted to point this one out in particular because of course it's starred and we know it's a priority, but also to just mention our awareness of the importance that racial equity be considered even as we work on this um, priority plan, right? There needs to be an intersection between the two and um, you'll see a lot of the actions and even some of the remarks we heard to, here today reflect that, but having this item in here intentionally reminds us to continue doing that. 4.3 is Fiscal. Fiscal is the state's relatively new accounting system. It is a complex system, and we have a complex uh, accounting system ourselves in terms of just a lot of funding sources uh, for the water boards, and it's been challenging. We've made huge progress in getting more up-to-date and uh, adept with the fiscal system and applying it to our, to our accounting needs. Um, again, we've, we've made a lot of progress and we're closer to meeting state mandated deadlines, but we're not there yet. So this remains a priority. We think this year is the year we will close the gap and actually get our work done on time, but we definitely have work to do here and it remains a priority. I appreciate that. I know it's caused uh, a lot of systemic challenges uh, through the years here and glad that we're getting to then um, either close of that, I think, uh, yeah. Fiscal has created a few stress dreams, I know, for a, a number of folks in the institution, I fear, um, myself included. So thank you, Mr. Bishop. And that brings us to 4.4.4, .4 um, which is um, DFA process improvements. Um, I think you've all had um, briefings on this, but this is um, a big effort that Joe's group has been doing on improving all the processes associated with their loans and grants. And um, and it is a high priority to get, make sure that we're actually getting the money out in an efficient method as possible and looking at our policies and our procedures and making the changes that we need to make to make that happen. Um, and I'd just like to note that I had the first and the last. Oh, sorry. Good way to, to end that. And thank you. I know uh, just going through that sample of things, I am already a, a little anxious for the year ahead. There's a lot that we're going to be doing. And I know that that doesn't even uh, cover everything that was in the document, let alone, again, everything that the board does. I appreciate uh, this, the, the thoughtfulness that has gone into it, the engagement uh, with us as a board. Um, again, it's, uh, this continues to serve as a useful exercise to remind ourselves of the importance of uh, being strategic this ne next year, knowing that we un unfortunately are not an over-resourced agency, and so it is always a matter of priority here amongst everything that we could possibly do as board members. So I'm just very thankful for this, and I know we have some commenters, but any um, questions or comments from board members off the top? Then let's uh, hear from folks and their feedback on what is, again, a quite a robust uh, list of things. First, I'd like to call up Eric Oriana who will be followed by uh, Regina Chigazola, if she's still on the platform, and she is. Thank you, Regina, for sticking with us. Uh, who will be followed by then John, uh, Sean Bothwell, and then rounding us out is Jared Voskel. Mr. Oriana, good to see you. Thank you as well for sticking with us for the day. Uh, you might need to turn on the mic. Thank you very Thank you. much. I uh, uh, want to just provide some informal comments here about some of the really good things we saw uh, as part of the strategic plan. Uh, one really exciting thing that I saw as part of the strategic plan is uh, mention of coordination between uh, SAFER, CV SALTS, and the implementation of the Sigma process. That was really exciting to see. Um, also, one of the first priorities listed as part of the strategic plan is supporting water systems uh, to meet drinking water standards. And we've talked about the racial equity implications of that, and so really excited to see that uh, here as well. Um, one of the new additions as well is uh, that we're excited about is the addition of DFA process improvements. Um, we know DFA has been working really hard on this and uh, we'll be, we'll be submitting comments in response to the expedited drinking water grant program that they're working on and that's something we're really excited about. Uh, another one that uh, is really good to see is a PFAS prioritization and a mention of hopefully the development of a public health goal for PFOA and PFOS. 
uh, by the end of this year. Um, and then again, the wastewater needs assessment is a key priority for communities we work with as oftentimes when folks have unsafe drinking water, uh, inadequate sanitary services is one of the uh, main uh, challenges as well. And uh, lastly, I wanted to share that CWC and our partners submitted comments uh, in a letter regarding Chromium 6 MCL. Uh, we understand a draft will be out here soon. Um, one of the things that we'd really like to see is for this process to be finalized this year. Uh, and in addition to that uh, being finalized, we'd like to see, uh, in addition to the workshops that were held uh, last year, community meetings being held inside of the communities that have been severely impacted by uh, chromium-6 contamination. Uh, these are just some of the th priorities we'd like to see, but really encouraged to see some of the new priorities and uh, looking forward to a successful year for the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oran. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I would flag on the P4, PFOS, we'll be uh, doing ongoing work. Uh, I'm not sure where we'll be at the end of the year on some of it, but it, it will still be another year or two before we actually get to some decision. I'd be looking to Mr. Bohemus if that's true, but. Thank you, Mr. Bohemus. Sorry to. I'm going to plead sorry as well that I wasn't listening, so oh, just, just one, quickly uh, the topic. <laughs> on on P4, P4 and PFOS, what, oh, um, we're although that. it's, you know, yeah, it, yeah where, where will we be uh, by the end of the year? Because, uh, yeah. Yes, happy to do that then. So we are actively waiting for US EPA to give us a draft uh, MCL from their part. Um, they promised it before Christmas, and I was going to get a Christmas present, but that didn't ever materialize. Um, so it should be, uh, it's an OMB, it should be out soon. We um, actively have a, a PhD request into OEHA. They are nearing the end of that process for PFO and PFOS. We also have uh, a bunch of investigation going on with uh, US EPA's ORD <clears throat> to help us work on uh, a broader spectrum testing method uh, that will uh, really be useful in understanding PFAS beyond the ones that are in the current testing methodology. A lot of our indications are that there is materials outside of that substantially in volume and mass, and so we want to try to get a handle on that because we'd really like any actions we take to be informed by that as well as potentially contemplated in any rules we set so water systems can address it in one step if that is, is avails itself. If not, we will proceed with the uh, MCL setting process once we get a, a final PhD and uh, go into that. My hope is still, though, that our work with US EPA does yield a chance to do um, a uh, uh, water treatment technique rather than just setting numbers that people have to achieve so that we can uh, really try to address the broader number of PFAS that we know are out there rather than just PFO and PFOS. I, I think we all find that would be unsatisfactory in the extreme if that's all we're able to do. So that's our that's our, our goal and we'll definitely need to report back. I think in the springtime we usually, us and DWQ come to the board and do give an information update and we'll all uh, talk with the full team so that we can make sure we lay that out um, sometime probably around April. So thank Perfect. you. Thanks thank for you. the chance. Really, thank you, really appreciate that Mr. Paul. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, next uh, I'd like to call up Regina Chigazola and then uh, Sean Bothwell. And again, our last commenter will be Jared Voskel. Good to see you, Ms. Chigazola. Good uh, evening. Hello. hello, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to leave right after this to go get my kid from after school. So sorry, I won't hear the rest of the speakers. Um, but um, yes, I think I'm glad I was able to get back on for this. The priorities of the board means a, a lot to the people that Safe California Salmon represents. Um, and it means a lot to the species that we try to fight for. Um, so I'm going to try to go through by section just real quick. I'm sure there'll be things that I miss. But um, one of the things I wanted to start with mentioning is under 2.1.3, which um, it speaks to temperature management under um, 90.5. Um, I just wanted to remind this board that we've brought up at the last couple hearings that the management of the Trinity River is critical within this, this decision. The Trinity River is still treated as it's um, a tributary to the Sacramento River, but it, it's not afforded any of the temperature protections or carryover storage protections. A lot of the Sacramento River is, but it's critically important to tribal trust species and to tribes in the state of California and to the continuing 
um, whether or not Klamath salmon continue to be in the Klamath River. Um, so I would like you just to mention that while your staff is working on that to please consider the Trinity River due to temperature management decisions, we've actually had a lot of co coho dying within the last few years and those are listed species. And this is definitely is because of reservoir management. Um, and after that, um, I wanted to go on with to the in-stream flow priorities. I just want to make sure to um, say that it's important to also note that spring salmon are now listed species in the state of California. And there are um, watersheds that have been brought up over and over again as needing to have um, flows in those watersheds um, to protect spring salmon. Um, and a lot of those are in the Sacramento River tributaries, but also the Trinity River is in on those. But um, Butte Creek, Deer Creek, a lot of those east side tributaries need to have flow um, flows for spring salmon. And as you know, until the Butte Creek spring salmon die off, um, that, that was actually the only spring salmon, um, the Sacramento River spring salmon were the only recovering species of spring salmon, I think within the west coast and it was like an amazing recovery and then they there was a massive die off due to temperature conditions and flows and i think the water board could have worked with agencies to help avoid that die off but now we have to recover those species um, which gets me to temporary urgency change petitions in the delta um, as you know there was a massive fish die off in the san francisco bay this year that was not necessarily because of flows, but it was because of temperatures and pollution. Um, but in order for those species to recover, it is critical we have adequate flows into the Delta. Um, and so maybe we don't grant some of the temporary urgency change petitions. Maybe we think about what is the most important thing right now in recovery of species that just had a massive salmon die off might be more important than making sure to do what the Bureau wants. Um, and then I'm just going to try to move through the rest of the things I have very quickly. Um, we're pretty concerned with the NPDES permit for aquatic spray, and I just wanted to register my concern. Aquatic spray is really important issue to Native Americans communities um, and a lot of communities of color. Um, so please make sure that you do proper outreach on that permit. Um, and basket weavers especially um, are really concerned about aqu aquatic spray. Um, and then under the priorities for the water storage investment program, I just would like to say that it's really important to have a racial equity lens within that priority process. Um, you know, some of those projects were really great, um, you know, groundwater recharge, things of that nature, but a lot of the projects that scored high because of the way that the priorities were set were ones that are extremely controversial, like Sites Reservoir, for instance, got a lot of the money and now you have a water, a, an application in front of you um, based on the um, putting of their application from the 70s, which calls for more water than probably exists in the Delta at this point that's readily available. Um, and so, you know, may, I'm glad that you sent that back and asked for more information, but I also say I wanted to mention that you don't have to just approve it. You can approve, say, hey, this is too much. This is based on before climate change assessments. Um, and then the last thing I would bring up is I really think when we're thinking water conservation and um, we need to start looking at agriculture in a more serious way, even if that means that we will have to retire some water rights and some lands, especially in the areas where selenium is a big issue. Um, and I think I even stayed within my time because I try to hurry that up. I actually had numbers for the rest of the stuff, but I'm just gonna skip that. Oh, one last thing though, um, when you're considering the forest health projects, please consider the use of chemical sprays in our communities and next to our watersheds. PG&E's proposals for chemical spray have been outrageous and they've been in um, critical watersheds that um, not only have EP, um, have listed species, endangered species, but also have um, large use by schools um, and by Native American communities. So yes, we need to make sure that our forest health is good. We need to make sure that we're not gonna have massive fires, but we can't do that by allowing spray that would not be allowed otherwise. And we really count on you under the racial equity lens to protect our communities within the, that permitting. And sorry, I went over, that was a lot, <laughs> thank you. There's a lot in there and don't be sorry at all. And thank you for sticking with us and your, your good comments here. And uh, again, uh, reflect well on, on uh, your points 
and uh, just appreciate the engagement. Thank you, Ms. Chikazola. Next, I'd like to call up John, Sean Bothwell. Mr. Bothwell. Good afternoon, Chair, Board Members. Sean Bothwell, uh, Executive Director for California Coastkeeper Alliance. Um, before I get started, I want to remind staff that Chair Sifal said I didn't have to um, apologize for anything I said up here today. Um, that said, uh, I, I, I really do understand that you guys are being pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, and so, you know, somewhat take this with a grain of salt. These are our, our priorities. Um, but I realize that, you know, you guys have a lot of competing interests, but I want to flag um, certain things uh, that are priorities that are in the work plan and things that we know that might be missing from the work plan. So um, I shared a budget letter um, that we sent to the governor's office and, and you know, the, the assembly and the Senate. Um, those are really some of our priorities that we see of things from discussions with, you know, you all that seem like projects that are good projects, but, you know, you just don't have the resources to move them forward right now. And, you know, in the past we had, we would run bills to try to get you, you know, the resources to, to get those priorities moving forward. I don't know if that plan is really working these days. And, and so I'm trying to do a new course of, of really trying to uh, look at the budget and try to get funding through there rather than run a, a, a substantive policy bill. So I just want you to know that I, I was trying to be, um, helpful and you know consider me a resource if there's anything like that we we can do in the legislature to help move that forward um, in that letter and in your work plan there's two policies I want to flag uh, the ocean acidification policy and the biological policy those are two big big policies that the NGO community has been waiting for for quite some time um, and we're really hopeful that at least this year maybe there's some stakeholder engagement some moving forward with the public process there um, would would make our folks feel you know good that it is it's something that's actually gonna occur at some point. Um, a couple things to flag that weren't in the work plan, and again, um, some of these might just be minor, but I, I just wanna um, remind folks of some of our priorities. Uh, one particularly is the non-dairy CAFO uh, statewide order. Uh, we've briefed uh, the board members and staff a couple of years ago before COVID. Um, from our analysis, 942 uh, CAFOs in the state are unregulated uh, because they don't fall in as a dairy or anything else that has a permit. Um, I believe at one point that was in, in uh, your priorities document and then COVID happened and, you know, things kind of uh, went up in the air. So I just wanted to remind uh, folks of, of that issue. Um, two other issues that we'd raised uh, last year, uh, six PPD at the Caltrans hearing. Um, there was a commitment to have an informational item on that. Um, and so I just want to remind folks, probably doesn't rise to the level of being in a work plan, but I just want to remind folks um, of that commitment to have that informational item. And again, we can be a resource on information, stuff we've seen. Um, another one, grazing, um, has been an issue where we've talked with a lot of the regional boards, um, trying to figure out what's happened since the 2015 GRAP resolution. Not a lot has gone on, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the regional boards seem very interested in hearing from other regional boards of what's going on. And so I think I think as a whole, the state would uh, benefit from, from that informational item. Um, another thing that I realize doesn't rise as a high priority, uh, ASBS, you know, coastal water quality issues, but I see this more of a kind of seeing through an existing policy that's out there that quite frankly has been broken. Um, and we've, we've talked about this before. We provided a memo a couple of years ago about the lack of final compliance plans, the lack of putting in any BMPs to come into compliance. Um, and thankfully, staff was very um, responsive in the Caltrans permit, put provisions in there that we were very happy with. Um, I've recently been looking into Caltrans' compliance plan because of what's in the permit. Um, and from what I've seen, the compliance plan was done in 2016. They didn't monitor three different ASBSs. Um, of all their monitoring, 62 exceedances were determined. Um, and in two ASBSs, they just refused to analyze their samples. And out of that, the final result of the compliance plan was uh, we don't have enough data to know whether we should do structural BMPs. And overall, we're doing an okay enough job, so we're just gonna keep doing the practices that we're doing. And so um, I hope that we can address that in the Caltrans permit or through an enforcement action. Uh, but also as the phase two um, stormwater permit comes to the state water board, uh, keep in mind those communities that probably are also likely out of compliance with ASPS. Um, a couple of things, just positive notes. I uh, really like the in-stream flow language. Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier during the racial equity action plan. Um, but we do have a concern, again, love the language, minus the part about the reliance on the DFW recommendations. Um, I'll just tell you a little story. In 2008, we had a settlement agreement with DFW. The, the settlement said you had to do 20, list 20 priority areas, and every year starting in 2010, do a recommendation, send it to the board. 
It's what, 12, 13 years later, they did two the entire time. And that wasn't an, a settlement order. That wasn't even just me up here asking them to do it. So we really need to move forward on in-stream flows despite what DFW is doing. Um, I mentioned the OA policy, but um, I really want to kudos on the denitrification part for DFA. I think that's a really important thing that we can do now while we're waiting for the policy to get in place. Um, the DPR regulations, since uh, we were a co-sponsor of AB 574, I just want to thank uh, you all for that. Um, moving though in a, in a timely manner, uh, honestly, we were always nervous that there just wouldn't be the resources to get it across the finish line, and it's really stayed on track, so I'm, I really appreciate that. I'm um, just flagging the IGP and the phase two permits, appreciative seeing that, and the IGP non-filer uh, enforcement in environmental justice communities in particular. And then lastly, our favorite, um, storms. I, you know, I appreciate the reevaluation of storms. You know, you guys have heard me say that I, I would like to see it be refocused on treating stormwater as a resource, um, but just a constructive recommendation for uh, potential new projects. Uh, the commercial um, permitting issue in, in Los Angeles is really starting to create a lot of discussion. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about credit trading in Orange County, the Santa Ana permit, um, and in Anaheim, and there's the potential for a statewide commercial permit at some point. And so having storms evaluate uh, credit trading and guidance to regional boards, guidance to the permittees um, on how to create those agreements, I think that's an area of common ground where the municipal permits, the IGP, construct us, we're all kind of on the same page of wanting to move that forward despite its terrible name of stormwater credit. Um, but I, I think that's something where we could get a lot of constructive um, movement on. So um, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the good thoughts. And uh, actually, just really quick on that last note, is there anywhere nationally where you have a real good credit trading program on the stormwater side? Um, has anyone else figured it out a bit more? Just always interested. Yeah, so uh, when it goes to national stuff and credit trading, I always go to American Rivers. Jeff Odafe, if um, that name rings a bell. He's actually um, not no longer with American Rivers. He's in a consulting uh, firm, but he's been talking with uh, Dave Smith, who no longer is with EPA. Uh, we did our comments together not with Dave, but with um, Jeff and, and NRDC, um, really trying to provide flexibility in the Los Angeles permit, but he's probably the best person um, to, to go to on that front, yeah. Fantastic, appreciate that. And just really, and uh, because uh, I know it is of interest to the vice chair and others, you know, six PPD, you know, the chemical from tires and its impact on fish and concern around that, just to flag, I think, to my mind, um, I know that DTSC, the Department of Toxic Substance Control is under, a current like tires um, product kind of review. Right. So maybe there's opportunity to cross pollinate over there. But anyway, Thanks. really appreciate it, Mr. Bosco. Thank you. Uh, and last, uh, I'd like to call up Jared Bosco. Good evening. Thanks for staying with us, Mr. Bosco. Good to see you. Hi. Um, good evening. How's it going today? Going well. Um, going well. Good to see you. Likewise, um, happy 2023 um, board members. Uh, my name is Jared Bosco. I serve as manager of regulatory affairs for CASA, the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. CASA represents uh, more than 130 public agencies and municipalities that provide wastewater collection, treatment, recycling, and resource recovery services. Uh, just at the beginning and reflecting on your long meeting today and the agenda, uh, I wanted to comment about item four and just personally convey my appreciation and gratitude uh, to you each for such a robust discussion and the board's thoughtful comments about the racial equity plan and how this policy will lead to the correction of um, historical injustices and future policy decisions. I'm really grateful that you all are each uh, at the board and leading the state on these broader societal issues. Um, with regards to your strategic plan, uh, there are numerous items in here that impact um, the clean water community. And I wanted to just maybe provide some quick annotations on a few of them with our perspective on this. Um, the first one is 1.1.1 with water affordability. And in a lot of ways, all of the other issues that um, are in this strategic priority work plan um, lead to what are, will the ultimate cost be um, at the local level for utilities to be in compliance or to implement um, the policies. And so, you know, there are finite limits to ratepayer bases. There are constraints on communities um, that are comprised of residents on fixed incomes, and there are limits to how much can be done. And so as we're having to balance, um, you know, which policies to pursue, there's that broader societal conversation of, you know, where there's funding to make those investments. And at the end of the day, we don't want to find ourselves in any kind of water or water afford wastewater affordability crisis 
um, because of, of one specific policy, if there's not a clear nexus on the relationship um, there between the policy and the response by utility. Um, you know, the next items, the PFOS investigations, it seemed more drinking water focused, um, but just to note from a wastewater perspective and, and the kind of the comment in here about beginning investigation of treatment options in preparation for the MCL, um, based on the, the current investigations of wastewater plants and, and kind of the, the data from the statewide effort showing that most of the PFOS is coming from residential and commercial sources, you know, it's our sector's conclusion that we are unable to treat our way out of this and that there's broader source control and source identification issues, which are the way to um, proceed on this issue um, just to, re to eliminate PFOS from the environment at the outset and not have it be something we're shifting from one environmental matrix to another environmental matrix, but to purely eliminate it at the beginning would be the ideal way to go. Um, with regards to the wastewater needs assessment, which is 1.1.5, um, we previously expressed our support um, and we stand ready to help your team on this initiative. There are a lot of different factors to incorporate into the analysis and um, as much as we can help provide our members um, with access to your team or get broader data um, that could be considered as you're looking at consolidations or I think in the wastewater complex, it's uh, context, it's more extensions of services. Um, there are a lot of factors that we think um, existing efforts and projects have kind of underscored need to be resolved. And we want to share that experience with your team to help that effort. Um, moving to 1.2, 1.2.1 um, regards developing an MCL uh, for P uh, Chrome 6. And we see this, there's a kind of a precedential nature to this development. Um, the state's not adopted an MCL in several years, but there's that economic analysis that comes with it. And it's our view that um, our members would fall under the uh, the affected parties provision of Health and Safety Code Section 116365B3. Um, in the case of Chrome 6, the uh, standard that is being proposed, I think, is right near the drinking water limit uh, for wastewater. We're already right there, so the impact wouldn't be material for us. Um, but when it comes to PFOS, in a perspective MCL, it's it's a different standard um, from the current drinking water standard. And so there's a concern then for 1.2.3 um, that if we were having to treat our discharges to comply with this MCL, um, there could be some real cost issues and even technical feasibility issues associated to that. So we just want to highlight that. I, I know we flagged it before. I'm pretty sure we flagged it last year on this, um, but we want to continue working on this one with you all. Uh, the next one is 2.1.5 regarding ocean acidification and hypoxia. Um, currently, the board's um, statewide policies document, has, which was updated in mid-December, it set a draft amendment for June of 2024, a hearing in July of 2024, and a final amendment adopted in the summer of 2025. Um, the, having this in the 2023 priorities, I'm not sure if that means there's a change in the statewide policy or if this is just teeing it up to be ready in 2024. Um, but we're kind of operating under the the guideline or the, the timeline that's currently in the statewide policies. And there are several initiatives related to this, including an independent expert review of the model, um, seeing how fit is it for regulatory purposes, how much uncertainty is associated with the model, and what can be done to improve the model. Um, but you know, in regards to that ongoing scientific work, um, it's being performed by SCORP, the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, and, and they provided some analyses to date, um, but it's important to note, you know, I feel like there's some caveats to, to what those analyses are able to share, um, you know, shed light on. One of those is that currently the model is unable to differentiate um, from nutrients from POTWs or nutrients from the border, from raw sewage, from Tijuana. And that's a very significant volume of nutrients that are kind of going into the entire region there. Um, but right now the model doesn't space those out. And we think that's pretty important in terms of how the model um, analyzes, you know, the totality of circumstances there. And, and are these anthropogenic sources leading to increased ocean acidification, which by and large is an atmospheric process because of CO2. Uh, also the model is not really factoring in um, the billions of investments over several decades in tidal lagoons which were specifically to design for nutrient reductions. And so that's another one of those items that we feel like, you know, some tailoring is gonna need, be needed on the model. 
There's other ones that have been identified, but you know, arguendo, assuming the model was all properly calibrated, um, the four largest dischargers in Southern California represent about 75 or 80 percent of permitted flow to the Pacific Ocean. The other 20 or so agencies in the model make up that remaining 20, 25 percent. And so those four agencies that I just mentioned, they all have commitments on the books to recycle as much as feasibly as possible. And so I think it's critical for the board to be considering this fact um, and the relative contribution, for lack of a better term, um, when it comes to aquatic policies the board pursues and the associated costs and benefits uh, for permittees to have to increase their treatment to remove nitrogen, phosphorus, or other nutrients and generate recycled water, um, to say nothing at all about the demand side for such a price commodity. And we know with the ratification, this is a central issue in terms of increasing supply, which we are so supportive of, and maximizing um, you know, opportunities for recycling as, as much as feasibly possible. Um, the next item I wanted to flag was 2.1.8 with biosimulatory substances. In a lot of ways, this one's um, kind of a corresponding nutrient management policy uh, for inland waters instead of coastal ones. And we want to encourage our staff to engage in potentially some modeling or estimation of the gains that could be achieved um, from POTW from the POTW community further reducing nutrients in their discharges. Um, in, in my outreach to our member agencies, several of them already are complying with really low nutrient standards of 10 milligrams per liter of nitrogen or lower. And so there's kind of a question of how much further can they turn the dial down at what cost and at what benefit um, when considering the totality of inputs, uh, non-point source in mind. Um, couple last items, DPR water reuses in 3.2.1. We're very supportive of water reuse on this item and we're looking forward to the regulations coming out and being adopted at the end of the year. With regards to infrastructure funding, 3.2.2, um, again, this one's central to our members and with all the kind of previous items discussed, this leads to infrastructure ultimately and in increasing um, what, what's there in terms of capital planning. And so we wanna make sure to streamline uh, as much as we can, getting funding out and processes related to that. The urban water use efficiency framework in 3.2.3, .3, um, we want to encourage the board to consider variances for recycled water. Um, your own analyses from earlier this year, which I think is going into this rulemaking, looked at economic impacts um, for wastewater on account of the policy itself and the conservation the policy would drive beyond passive conservation. Over a 10-year cycle, it, it was estimated at 3.7 billion for collection systems and treatment systems. That's O&M and capital, and that's a, that's a very steep cost. Um, we will need to support and mitigate, um, our agencies will need support to mitigate, adapt um, to these kind of changes we're expecting. And we wanna make sure that assets aren't stranded specifically with water recycling. And so, you know, as much as you all can develop variances for recycled water projects, we're supportive of that and uh, we'll happy to work with you all. Um, and then with C, the CEC management strategy in 3.2.7, um, we've kind of noted this elsewhere, but based on our experience from the PFAS investigative sampling order with nearly 250 agencies comprehensively across the state sampling, um, we, we kind of came to a conclusion that a statewide representative sampling approach um, could be advantageous and we'd be willing to support and, and work with you all to develop that. Um, but we thought, you know, you might be able to eliminate costs or the burdens, which are extensive, um, but simultaneously have really valuable information derived um, from a smaller pool of agencies um, and ultimately it's more economically feasible. Um, the last item I want to note is just 4.3.3, 4.3.4. Um, which includes updating CEDIN and updating um, modern data analysis tools for the integrated report. Um, you know, we're tracking this one as it leads to team Dales for our members. Um, seeing some of this is relatively new for us in terms of the goals, but I think broadly we're probably supportive of it as a sector, um, having not officially really talked to my members yet about it. Um, but this integrated report, you know, brings a lot of new questions with it. And I think the last cycle saw something like over 1,000 new water bodies listed, the introduction of an automated process to reach those conclusions, and a lot of back and forth in the adoption hearing about the ultimate determinations. Um, we've heard great presentations from your staff at the California Water Quality Monitoring Council about how they're enhancing and um, the current efforts, building on that last integrated report cycle to make it even better for folks. 
we're supportive of that and we'll be kind of watching as that rolls out this year. And then lastly, the DFA process improvements and 4.4.4. Um, we are actively collaborating with your team and the SRF stakeholder group. We think there have been numerous um, really great ideas that have been identified, which we could pursue uh, that would lead to the streamlining of um, contracts getting originated and the disbursement of funds so these projects can be realized and we can get more and more. Um, I think our ultimate concern is with increasing that annual sustainable funding capacity. It was at about 1.2 billion a couple years ago, a few years ago. It's down to about 600 million now. Last year, the decision was to fund about 250 million in projects. So we weren't using all that capacity. We understand the reasons why, but in the years ahead, we want to do as much as possible to increase that capacity because of all the reasons and the policies we just discussed and how they're going to lead to infrastructure um, you know, improvements at our facilities. We're going to need low interest rate, no interest rate loans um, to keep this affordable for our members where it makes sense. So I, I know there's a ton here. Um, if it's a lot for me, then one sector for you all, I know there's a ton. So we're appreciative of your time and your leadership on these issues and happy to take questions or work offline with your team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vosco. We'll definitely have a lot of opportunity to go back and forth. I appreciate the thorough uh, ticking of some of the concern, what I hear especially, and, and I know for us as always, it's a balance. Uh, we know that whether it's pursuing the policies um, helping fund them through DFA or doing better on the execution side. There's a whole Venn diagram amongst a lot of this work, and it is ultimately a balance on best understanding how we, we all collectively drive to what are a lot of goals and priorities out there amongst us. Uh, but I think in, in this is our opportunity to try to best explain how we uh, are prioritizing some of that work for the year ahead. And in each one of these, is a lot of public process, a lot more engagement, a lot more in work, and that, that balance and the concern which I hear overriding amongst it, which is the total impact of cost to the ability to continue to provide sanitation services for your folks or for drinking water for others. And I just appreciate your feedback on the items and know that we'll, we'll have a lot more to be able to, to unpack amongst it. So thank you. Okay. Chair Esquo. Oh, yes, and please. Um, uh, if I may, I have a yes, go back. Um, I, I went over the Sigma item thinking it wasn't mine, but it is mine. I got a bit confused there. <laughs> so I just wanted to provide some um, brief remarks about what that is. Um, we know that um, groundwater sustainability and Sigma have caused some confusion and uncertainty from stories that we've seen in the media, from um, inquiries that we've received. We very much want to be proactive in sharing um, the important information and raising awareness about Sigma and also our role uh, in complement, you know, complementing DWR's role in Sigma because that's also a point of confusion. So we have regularly been meeting with the Sigma team now um, on communications around Sigma and are working with them to develop some of those communication plans. Fantastic, really appreciate that. And yes, to your point, um, often a lot of communication uh, confusion and here in the next year, especially with potential actions, our, our opportunity to help bridge some of the understanding. So thank you for, for touching back on that, Ms. Cooley. Anything from uh, folks up here at the dais? Um, any, anything further to comment or? Vice Chair, please. I've got an event to go to, so I don't want to take up more time, but this was great, and I appreciate um, the the few commenters that we had because there was, you know, a lot in there. And so just want to um, say, first of all, on um, follow-up on um, grazing and management, I did have, uh, Ms. Mogas, I had a conversation with Phil Crater, and I know he's been busy working on that with um, UC Davis and a whole group and, and the regional boards. But it sounds like, um, Mr. Bothwell, you may have been in touch with some that haven't been as engaged. So I think, you know, I got the impression at the appropriate time that um, something was likely to come before us. So yeah, if you wanna say something on that. Yeah, Mr. Both Bothwell has made these comments previously. Mm -hmm. So we're planning on an information item to include the regional boards who are working on permitting activities to give an overview of the status of grazing across the state. I don't recall when we're actually planning it, but we will follow up. Thanks. Yeah, and then on storms and credit trading, 
that kind of piqued my interest. So I'd like to hear Mr. Bishop. So I have um, a meeting with uh, Sean and Dave Smith and some other folks that he mentioned um, next week, I think, or this week, to hear the, uh, about um, what they're working on and to, uh, to consider what they're proposing. So this is a pretty recent um, suggestion. I did want to say that I don't believe there's any good credit trading programs around the, the country that I've heard about. There are some very unique ones in the Chesapeake Bay about very unique uh, situations. Um, but I'm very encouraged by um, the cross-section of folks that are meeting to talk about this. Um, as you remember, I don't want to take too much time, but as you remember, the, the reason that we had uh, alternate compliance for um, recharge in the industrial permit was that we had a cross-section of um, NGOs and industry and municipalities come together and want, want us to do that. If we have a cross-section of groups that want us to do that, we can work with them and figure out how to make it happen. Um, and if we have to reprioritize um, something, we will. Yeah, great. Okay, and then um, on uh, also on storms, on the issue of um, cost of compliance, I, I have had some discussions with the regulatory community where I think there might be a little disconnect um, as to what was even driving this which, you know, in part, it's me, you know, looking for some way to get more information so that we can have a more robust um, economic analysis when we go to adopt regulations. And so I'm really excited about this project, but I, I'm just wondering, I, I'm happy to engage in some discussions, but wanted to just flag that for you. Great, let's, to let's, hear. Yeah. let's see that. They've they're been working pretty hard on getting a, a uniform set of mm -hmm. criteria. And as I think I reported to you before, um, the regulated community is not um, supportive of that um, because they all report differently. And, mm -hmm. and so um, what we'd asked is that they um, work as much as they can to, uh, to reduce the cost but still allow us to have a uniform approach. But we'd be happy to pull you in at any time yeah. to talk about it. I'd appreciate that, thanks. And then I think just parting words, this is a great plan and I appreciate all the extra time. I, I had you know more than one opportunities to talk with staff about this and I think it's a good combination of being focused. Really, I, I like the way we've pull, you've pulled out the water supply strategy and highlighted those. I think that's great. Um, I see movement you know, where things are taken off the list um, and I think that um, you know, being careful about what we add and trying to be restrained so that we can next year hear back from you about more things that have been taken off the list. So I commit to trying really hard, <laughs> you know, stay focused. And on that note, I'm go uh, on my way to, um, kind of on the next item here on board member reports, I'm on my way to um, uh, RCRC, you know, they have their installation of officers and I'm going to see if I can have, um, uh, a conversation with some of the supervisors from Lake County and on this on the hitch issue I I just thought I would share that um, this is an area where I, I continue to have concerns with the, the emergency authorities and a lot of public comment that we get about border board act you have authorities and then you know we hear um, the need to act quickly and um, um, not anything intentional here but we hear one view and so really looking for how do we better thread the needle where there's this big push, there's a, there's a need, a desire, and um, a desire to act quickly, but figuring out how we can um, really be thoughtful and also move quickly. And so I'm really excited about, you know, the potential opportunity here to work on some collaborative solutions in the meantime. So just wanted to share that that's something that I'm investing my time on because I think that's maybe a way to move forward on a new item in such a way that um, it doesn't uh, take on a, a huge um, uh, burden or lift for us as a board. Thank you, Vice Chair. Board Member Firestone. Um, you know, nothing really to add. I think it's really helpful document um, <clears throat> and uh, echo what's already been said. Thank you. It's just an informational item, so non-voting, and just appreciate, again, the good work. I don't know if, uh, Ms. Sobeck, you wanted to leave us with any, any further thoughts around 
Uh, again, you know, uh, to uh, the vice chair's point, and I appreciated the list in the back, the large habitat restoration permit. You know, uh, we got that. Uh, well, the the uh, the 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 resolution that created the streamlining, but you know, it's all it, it's there. At, we completed that rather. COVID nineteen wastewater rearages. Uh, you know, the reissuance of our sanitary sewer, the microplastics work. It was, you know, it, it is good to reflect on what's uh, always an incredible amount of work that the board is doing. So thank you for that. I really wanted to thank the board members this year. Um, you know, this is this document is so helpful for us because it allows us as staff to say these are our collective um, priorities and that we are, um, when we work on them, that we're reflecting your will, <laughs> as, it, as it were. And um, I, I hope you guys realize that I didn't say at all today Please don't add anything unless you take anything <laughs> off. I feel like you guys have done a great job of internalizing that, and, and that is um, really, staff is, we are all really grateful for that. You know, we did work with you all and added stars and took stars off and took things on and off the list be, um, because of the advice we received from you. Um, but um, yeah, I thought, um, I really thank you all for um, um, helping us uh, finalize for another year a, a document that's always in motion. Thank you, much appreciated. And concludes item number six. And then brings us then here to nearly the end of today's uh, uh, part of the board meeting and we're at board member reports. Anything to report? I know that for myself, um, it has been a lot of work and very busy, but no real public engagement. So uh, I don't have anything uh, to report other than it's been a wild couple of weeks, very wet, and a lot of response, whether it's on the recharge front or doing our part to ensure drinking water, wastewater infrastructure. Uh, you know, we heard from our emergency management program last uh, board meeting, and so it definitely uh, paid off. There's a lot of work that went on. So that's all I have. Board Member Firestone. I don't have a report. Great. Okay. That concludes item number seven, and it concludes <laughs> today's portion of the board meeting. We need not drag this on much longer because we'll be back here tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. where we will continue uh, the continuation of our board meeting on to day two. We will have an update on our uh, Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan uh, work. Uh, we have, will have participation from um, in hearing uh, tomorrow, the, the, the president will be, uh, President Biden here in California touring for some of the storm work. Director Namath, who was scheduled to be with us tomorrow, may not because of it, but she'll have a representative and we'll still have uh, Director Bonham uh, to be part of our discussion around the water quality control plan up at NBAs. With that, the day is done. It has been a long day. I really appreciate everyone's incredible work. Congratulations. We'll get up and see you all tomorrow morning again for it. We're in recess until 9.30 tomorrow morning. Have a good evening. Thanks.